Coming to turn. You said 275. No. 265. Two so you're kind of on this curve, but we're going to be heading yeah. south the, uh, southwest. When in the world was that, Scott? I believe that was a Tina 4. Still got you centered. Brilliant tight. red Tina 4. Okay. Am I moving? Yep. Okay. Looks like you got your rotator all the way back. Good. There you are at my main. I'll okay. follow you up. I'll drive by the main. I'm going to turn to port to 265. Understood. Depending on tether, that'll determine your. And so if you are just turn, joining us, we are hard, about hard 20 go. meters from okay, the bottom on the of our you want. Okay, dive in the Kristoff fracture zone. I pushed um, down just a little this bit. Was a, so this was a hard it. dive to choose okay, a location so for. There are so many geologically interesting locations around here. And we really only have one opportunity to dive in this area. So when we were looking at the, the bathymetry, uh, um, which you can see on the Kay. quad screen which in Cam 4. Um, like you can starboard okay. quicker. Right. Whatever. Yeah, Whatever. There's, a, there's a lot Could of really lots. interesting features on the seafloor. There's a lot of really these interesting seafloor uh, uh, geomorphology. And you know, there's this so you can large be deep basin to our around. east. There's all these Two, six, five. Strange cone-like features with little dimples in the top of them. I think yeah. that's what they're seeing right now. Looking at the blue view. On the Turn. quad. Good. They're oh. seeing that. They're seeing the... the kind of well, never mind here. then. Well, you could point to that. Yeah, it's not yeah. going to be the same. Yeah. Breaks, just right? just assume that what I'm showing you is <laughs> beautiful. It's very visual what you're yeah, describing. Yeah. That's good. No. It's not going to be but over, the, huh? the important point to take away is that there's a lot of really interesting targets, and we really only have one opportunity to see something down here and we could spend we could I could spend a month of dives down here the other issue is that because we're we're so deep we have a limited amount of time on the bottom because we have to spend so much time to get down here so if you were with us the other day you might have been joining us and we've been on bottom an hour earlier yeah. yep it's a lot of water column to go through we descend at the rate of 30 meters per minute right, I'm a two, and six, so five. it took okay. uh, about one hour and 50 minutes I'll five zero ahead. minutes for us bit. to get from the surface okay, like to the depth that we're working at today and one of the things i neglected to say um, in our pre-dive brief when we were discussing what are the potential things that we might see uh, there are fish, of course. Punching out out we of do depth. expect to see some fish. So and the fish community may be different right. from what we saw at 1,700 we'll meters. Easy. And depending on the level Take of sedimentation, that will drastically Don't change the view. community as well. Um, so there Try are a lot of, in the of uh, view here. sea pens, for yep. example, that live very Push deep. Down. And so given a certain Try level of sedimentation, we see, may see a more diverse uh, sea pen population, sea cucumbers, and all the other organisms that live associated with the soft sediment. I'm just looking at the bottom here. For any hazards on sonars. Stop there for a minute. I'll stop. Just watch your tether. Okay, get back on it. Understood. Coming down. As we're getting closer to the bottom here, Ash, and I see there is a pretty heavy sediment layer. Rock outcrop. Yeah, and so that's you know that was one of the the things that we was really kind of curious in terms of picking this site how heavy, heavily sedimented would this area be? Um, you know, are we going to see this for the next four hours? Right. Um, it, it's hard to tell. You know, we, we had the ability to look at that um, 
uh, the, the hardness of the acoustic return. Um, and that was that backscatter image we were showing earlier. And it was kind of modeled, so it kind of looked like some sediment okay. mixed in with Watch hard rock. Um, and as we look at um, the navigator screen, navigator's got uh, this high pack screen, has got the bathymetry in plain view. The contours are pretty widely spaced. So we're landing on a, the flattest part yeah. uh, of, that we'll see today, I believe. Yeah. We'll go up slope, so hopefully this will change some. So I'm already seeing some sea cucumbers, though. But yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, yeah, a sea cucumber and some, yeah, some bioturbation trails. And look, uh, uh, yeah, maybe also looks like some mounds. Uh, I, I can't quite check. tell, but yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. I'm not sure if those are ripple mounds or yeah. biogenic yeah. mounds. Yeah. But directly below, I did see what appeared to be a feeding trace of a spoon worm, a neck urine worm. That's kind of star-like pattern to uh, in the sediments. Mm. Yeah, hydraulic star-like feeding pattern. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no! So this no, brings us to a conversation we were having yesterday about in fauna versus epifauna, yeah. uh, and and could you could you explain the difference? Let me just uh, yeah. take a note of this jelly that's coming through here. Can take uh, a video another problem. tool that we have on board and that our scientists on shore can use okay. is um, no. uh, Sea Tube, which is in Ocean Networks Canada. The software is being hosted by Ocean Networks Canada and it allows us to make logs of all the observations we're making. Pilot, you good if I deploy yeah. Watch the, yeah. This is ROV Navigator. Go ahead, Nat. I was wondering if you'd like to take a Niskin at the bottom if Ab you were planning on it. Absolutely. Once you guys are set, that's the first thing we'd like to do. Copy that. Thank Hold you. Do. Pilots, it sounds like we are going to dig a disc and sample once we get to the bottom. Did you, uh, you want the jellyfish while we're here? Thank you, Lars. Yep. Science would. <laughs> take, take a video. Video you can see. Yeah. Just while it's here. My co-pilot's getting my lights ready here. Figured I'd get a zoom for us. And I want to say coronate jellyfish. I don't think that's quite right. Um, okay. But it reminds right. me a little bit of uh, periphyla. Your lowers all the way down. You happy with that? Three yeah. quarter? Yeah, that's good. All right. What is that? Is that a coral? Uh, that very well could be a coral or a sponge. I'm thinking it's a sponge. Oh, yeah, that God, might be a thing. chondrocladia sponge, which would be really cool. If it is a chondrocladia sponge, that's one of the carnivorous sponges. Okay, and watch it just to be clear. We just finished our setup, and we're ready to start the dive. All right, awesome. Can we get a zoom in on that uh, branching structure Great. in front of you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd like to inform you that we are on the Can bottom at this time. Yeah, I would also like to verify that the center of rotation is about the A-frame, and when you have an opportunity, if we could discuss a brief bailout plan, that'd be great. Uh, pilot, I apologize. I was distracted here. Did we trip the Neskin, or are you just prepared to trip the Neskin? Getting Please ready to take it now. I just want to make sure five. everybody was ready to go. Uh, we're staying by. We can take it right now if you'd like. Good copy. Uh, Thank you. When you're ready, I just wanted to be sure about yep. the logging. Thank you. Okay. Copy, you want to fire it? Yep. Just can Video, you want the now. jellyfish? I'll get the coral up to the jellyfish. Just can firing. Good three, call on that two, coral, Aston. One. Just can fire. Beautiful image of a jellyfish here. I love the coloration. Sure, Valpac's off. There's a lot of uh, these deep sea taxa that have red associated with them. These lines that you see, the globular thing oh, in the middle good. is it the main like part of the mouth and the stomach. And then the lines that radiate from also. that are called uh, lateral radial copy canals. Copy. And they Deep go to a ring canal meters, at the edge. Uh, Those are extensions out. of the shallow, stomach. Shallow. And by having that red pigment, uh, light won't be able to move through it. So if that jellyfish ingests any bioluminescent organs, organisms, then itself won't light up because mm. of what is ingested. So it's protected from a predator. This looks like an old bamboo coral partial? growing yeah. on these rocks. Yeah, I wonder if it, you think it grew well there or... Maybe, I mean, this looks like a talus pile, so I guess it could have also... Yeah, but if this tumbled down the slope, I wouldn't expect the skeleton to be in as good a condition yeah. as it is. So I do think it grew here. I'm not sure why it's now dead. Yep, that looks like a possibly a brachiopod over there on the left, and there's also some kind of um, burrow there. Yeah. There's a variety of crustaceans of that polyps. will create worms. Zoom in, yeah. yeah, so we're looking at the polyps here, and... These are octocoral polyps, but I don't believe in? these are the polyps no. 
of the coral that created this skeleton. I think this we'll is something that is settled on the skeleton and grows as one of those stoloniferous yeah. mats. Really just as That's my now. impression. How's your compass feel? We have a move if you're ready. Yeah, it's pretty good. Range it's five good shots meters. I, you know, I could be two, wrong, but six, I'm, five, this three, speed zero. The no, skeleton no, is so no, worn no, away. No, Actually, yeah, you can see where the tissue ends there. Mm. If you look to the left, and is, the skeleton is so worn away. Copy, it actually you. looks more like a protein-based skeleton than a calcium carbonate. Yeah. But that's it's hard to tell because I see some white bits underneath there mm. too. So it's been dead for so long. Uh, nice deposition, encrustation, other organisms. You can see there's hydroids, forams. There's all kinds of little stuff here. And you can you can see the weathering through the translucent Absolutely. membrane of the of the octocoral. Yeah, that's a really good observation. So that suggests that this octocoral has grown mm -hmm. over it after it died. Yeah. So that's I think what we'd call a stoloniferous octocoral overgrowing, Thanks, probably man. a bamboo coral. Mm -hmm. But it's a good sign that the stuff can live down here. Yeah, that thing that looks like a, a wide open mouth is either a brachiopod. Good range my center right here. Yeah. Plenty. Or I'm not sure. So I'll have to go with brachiopod. And I just have to make a note here, so I will leave it to you. Oh, I've already done that. You come in. Zoom in on that. And and ROV, just to confirm, we have a, a move with the ship that you guys already put through, I think I heard. Yeah. All right. Perfect. So, you know, I think huh. the important thing to me is kind of just to keep our, try and keep ourselves on pace for moving up and hitting the top of that slope. Should be about uh, 500 meters over ground, and I, I'd like to make sure we get that exposure. So Understood. Um, if we get too slow, let us know. So this okay. is not a brachiopod. This is a tunicate, actually. Um, you can see at the top back there, there's this little chimney-like opening, mm -hmm. and then it's got this wide opening here. And I'm trying to remember the name of this thing, but Go I ahead, believe... Rich. This is a predatory tunicate. So tunicates, we've seen several uh, throughout the dive, mostly the pelagic ones like subs. But tunicates are filter feeders. Server, they belong two, five, to the five, phylum chordata. Like I've said a few times it's an invertebrate Balance, that's closely please, related to vertebrates. They're heading filter heading feeders. Change. They have yeah, a very yeah. elaborate yeah, filter inside cilia that draw a current in. And well, this is one that has adapted at, much like the carnivorous sponge instead to be a carnivore. So that is essentially a large mouth. and. When a zooplankton swims in there, it'll close up, and then it can feed on it. I mean, quickly, like a. I, or, I don't know how know. quickly it happens. Um, I've seen a video work it out. <laughs> on yeah. one of these, um, you know, like discovery shows where they have great audio and it yeah. makes it sound like clump, you know. But I don't know if they sped it up. It, it reminds me of like a Venus flytrap of the deep exactly. ocean. Exactly, yeah. that's exactly what it is. And yet, it's retained that opening at the mm. back, that would be an X-current opening if it was a suspension yeah. feeder. So again, adaptation, evolutionary changes, you deal with what you have and you modify that. You don't just de novo create, you know. So is there a, is there a, do you expect a valve in that, in that back little port? So, I mean, um, it's not a valve, but is there an at least, hatch? Yeah, you know, the so the way in. they work for the others yeah. is that you would have to pass through the filters in order to get to okay. that other opening. Yeah. So this is a holothurian, a sea cucumber that is lifted off the bottom and is drifting a little bit. See, it's quite transparent. It's an echinoderm, and this is a deposit feeder. And if we see a lot of the sediment, oh, nice fecal pile uh, back there, highly coiled. It tells me that there's probably um, an out. acorn worm or something. I suppose a holothurian may have done that. At any rate, I'm already five, seeing a bunch tether. of things that are telling me Can't that there are several the organisms yeah, that are using the sediments moves, down yeah. here. So there's plenty of organics. I see a sponge on the rock in the upper right. <clears throat> Eyes on. Was it fired now? Was that fired now? Niskin 2? Yeah, we've, we've taken Niskin 2. Sorry, yeah. I, I need to know Go when ahead, I fire man. so I can hit the collect button. Got it. Good copy. Thank you. I can't change the time. That's, that's why I like Come to do it as close as possible. And so we've got about a, a 30 meter overground, no, 30 meter uh, vertical, maybe about 100 meter overground ascent. And then we'll get up to the top of a small little hill, uh, which will then be the beginning of our larger ascent up the main slope of this larger feature. Um, so we'll probably get to the top and then we'll have a little bit of a, maybe a short transect through some some water column um, until we hit that slope, kind of like yesterday. And so this was just kind of um, 
we could have started on that lower slope, but the, the goal of starting down here is it was really interesting to see how sedimented it is. Um, and this is our kind of one opportunity to get into this kind of deep basin area. Coming down, just so you know. Understood. Following me down. Just waiting for the tether. Yep. Yeah, what's our average speed necessary to make it to where geology wants to make it? Stand by one. I don't know if I've moved at all so far. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, the deeper the dive, the longer the ship move delays are. Yeah. So let's just get a quick view of the sea cucumber. Um, the sea cucumbers are pretty well known because they live on soft sediments. They're much more easily trawled from the deep sea. So mm -hmm. we have lots of examples of them. Doesn't necessarily mean we have the good in situ imagery, but the things that are growing on a hard substrate are harder to sample in good condition. Mm -hmm. And so getting good images of those is a bit of a key. And I did see there was some stock over there. You snap you know, I, I've seen these on, them. just from my own experience, I've seen these on flat ground. I don't yeah, think I've ever seen one kind of just heading up a yeah. steep sediment slope like this. Um, it's interesting to me. You can see that this one is yeah. very different from the one that we just yeah. imaged swimming through the water column. Mm -hmm. That one had a modified podia on the dorsal surface that was kind of like a large fin mm -hmm. that helped it swim, whereas this one's much uh, flatter. Still transparent. You can still see through the body wall that coiled um, intestine full of sediments. Uh, again, these guys are deposit feeders. Deposit feeder means that it's an organism that will ingest chunks of sediment and pass all of that sediment through the gut and digest um, whatever organics it can get out of there. And organisms like that are, they're similar to ruminants in that they have a very long intestine because you have to process that food mm -hmm. uh, or that minimal food yeah, and all that sediment over a very long period of time. Nuts. And for us lay people, again, can you, a ruminant is a, uh, like a cow and a sheep, yep. right, exactly. Yeah. And so um, the tr exactly. being able to digest all of that grass takes mm -hmm. a long time. And so there's a long residence time in the gut. And you had said it earlier um, in one of our uh, previous dives that there's a different sea cucumber, this purple yep. one up there. Um, I'm going for the vertical branch right here. Thank you. Yeah, I think it, I think it's a I think it's a worm actually. I think it's a tube worm. We'll check it out. And I'm not uh -oh. sure who's. I'm going for oh, it right cool. here. I'm going for this right here. Like oh, this. you saw a coral that I didn't. Thank you, pilot. Yeah. Let's start with the coral. Come in, video. Anyway, I was going to talk about reworking the sediment. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later. Yeah, this looks like a bamboo coral, I believe. Oh, there's one of those brittle ones back there, too. Yep, that's a bryozoan, the fan that you see in the rock behind there. And we were able to get a great collection of a bryozoan yesterday. You want to take the polyps? Yes, please. Video? Yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely. Bamboo coral. I can see a couple of the dark nodes in the skeleton there, those polyps. Um, so bamboo corals are one of the corals that I would fully expect to see at this 3,000-meter mm. depth. Um, there isn't a huge diversity that we know about, we only three or four species, uh, yeah, so there may be more, but you know, that's what we know. And what's the, what's well, the deepest that you are aware of them as being as found at? I think right. it's 4,200 meters okay. for yeah. a bamboo coral. And that was uh, in the Pacific or the Atlantic? Or that was in the Pacific. Pacific. Yep. We have a move, if you're ready. If you're clear video, we can move on to the other Range subject. Range, one zero meters, Very bearing good. two six five degrees, uh, speed no. zero decimal two come wide two and there's a uh, tube, tube worm thing. Um, I saw that worm from a distance, the fan worm, so we can oh, move on a, from uh, there. Is there a little star on the left, too? Good copy, Bridge. That's Thank a you. brittle star. Yeah. I would suspect Ophium museum. It's a we'll go for pretty the, common go for this one. brittle star That's on like the abyssal seafloor and the bathyal seafloor. And you'll notice it's a slightly different morphology and not the kind that we keep seeing oh, associated exactly. on the way. corals. Yeah, so this is a fan worm that is built a uh, tube probably of uh, mud and mucus, and it's extending uh, anterior structures in order to suspension feed. That's good for us. Thank you. Understood. Do you want the star, the brittle star? Okay. Uh, I don't think we need that brittle star. Okay. Really common down here. Understood. Thank you. I want to maximize our time here. 
Yeah, and it, and it looks like what we're just looking at is a is a slope field of, of talus that's come down kind of this larger, steeper slope that we're heading up to. And it's kind of interesting. We're, we're in this fracture zone uh, between these two segments of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The fracture zone is about 20 kilometers wide. So it's, it's on the lower end of fracture zones that we that we observe. Um, we're in this active portion of it. Soft. So where uh, yeah. volcanic and tectonic uh, activities are, are taking place. Um, and what's interesting to me is all this talus looks like it's come from kind of our, our west on this little, um, you know, several hundred meter bathymetric high that we're starting to come up and not from the northern section um, where we're on the older plate on those ridges Video that we were on from? earlier. I'm kind of waiting for Tether here. So I just want to see what's going on. Oh, great. Yeah. So if we have the time, I'm happy to have a look here. So let's see. We've got another bamboo coral. Um, one of the ones that we've known for a long time is uh, the deepest is the genus Bathygorgia. And I was noting yesterday that there are a lot of taxa that get a name Bathy appended to it, which refers to the fact that it grows very deep. Um, and Whoa. Bathygorgia also grows as an unbranched whip, very straight. So it's quite possible that this was uh, Bathygorgia, although I, I need to hear from my colleague Les. I'm not sure that it's known from the Atlantic. It was mm -hmm. originally described from the uh, South Pacific. Go ahead, nice Bridge. view. Most of the polyps Good seem copy. to be on Thank one you. side of that axis. That They're complete. not highly dense. Yesterday we were copy. seeing some where the polyps are really dense in there. And you can see the tissue is transparent, very thin central white axis made of calcium carbonate. And then you can see some of the sclerites in the tissue. That some of them look uh, really quite small. And then I noticed just off to the right on the side of a rock, there's a large anemone. You can just see its tentacles sort of peeking out. Video come out. I'm going to go for the large anemone. Got just a little, there it is. A little bit of tether. I'll try to get you a better view, Scott. Thank you. All the sort of uh, bluish circles that you see on the face of the rock, those are sponges, encrusting sponges. Sako Matsumoto is joining us from Japan, and she noticed, as I did just off to the left also, I think we saw a brachiopod. And that reminds me, I need to dig up the name of that uh, tunicate. And so, just to remind everyone who's watching, this the ROV system we're using is a two-body system. So we have the hey, ROV coming? Deep Discover, which provides the camera Come view in, yeah. that you're looking at right now that we're zooming in on. Um, but then that's connected through a tether to a separate ROV, Sirius. And Sirius hangs through a, a, a winch and a cable off of the back of the ship, more or less straight down. And so in order to move, we have to get the ship to move, which then moves Sirius, which then allows Deep Discover a new area of exploration. And the deeper we are, the longer it takes for that ship to move and for that motion to translate Hi, all the way down. So we can tend to have a lot of opportunities to kind of stop and look around while we're transiting up this fracture. Okay. Up the slope. That's clear. Thanks. Just sponge up a right I want to see, but I'm not sure if I have enough tether for it. Oh, there's a... Uh, all right, Scott, is this a bolosoma? Snap it. All right. Uh, do you put, no, what's this? Uh, Hyalonema, uh, I think. Oh, gosh. I think. Uh, but that's a nice uh, bamboo coral that's uh, growing in the foreground that's branched. That Come may on, be different from that other one. That's my favorite kind is the um, this tulip. Hyal yeah, Hyalonema, the I think, is that tulip sponge or that goblet sponge on the stick. Hyalonema. I think. I'm going to have to check that. Need to make little flashcards. Use your. Um, That's a great idea. Your deep sea. Uh, your deep sea website. You print them out. Come in, video. There's two. There's. Oh, that's nodal branching right there. Yeah. Nice. So this is uh, branching at the node. What a great view. So we've talked about this a lot. Um, 
part of the taxonomy and naming of these bamboo corals is where they branch. So here you can clearly see that branch is coming out of the protein correct. part. Not so this is a nodal brancher. And I think that uh, this is a different coral than we were looking at earlier. And the other thing that I'm looking at are the sclerites, uh, which are the calcium carbonate uh, parts. And I can see that they're relatively small. We don't have the really big needles here. And I'm not seeing them protrude Copac, in between the tentacles. The extra lights Beautiful at about view. 30%. Thank you. Understood. Coming up there. Coming up now. Did you feel Can that? Give me 50 percent. You want some more? Did you feel the? Um, I have my sonar return has never moved. Mm. Yeah, I guess we're not seeing uh, it. Science change. is done with this view. Understood. Lights Thank are you. clear. Big. Come Understood. on. Coming I'll down. note. Uh, I got the name here for that um, predatory tunicate we saw earlier in the family. Video swap out. Uh, uh, the genus is Megala. to you has been the same. Okay. Megala, Mega, Mega, Megalo, Dictopia, Megalodictopia. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, now it's actually interesting. Like among all minutes, this fractured the, uh, pieces of basaltic rubble, six, I, I assume uh, it's basalt. 18, it's almost 100 percent likely of basalt, but it's hard to tell with all the okay. the coating of the biological manganese. You also see yeah, these I mean, huge sure lobate intact pillow blocks. So the one in the bottom right. And that's one large pillow. That looks like it was probably formed in terms of a, not one of those long kind of pillow lobes that there we saw earlier, but a big inflated course. pillow that then fell video off of its main erupted we'll source. Um, come in video. So I'll be interested to see what the transition looks like as we go up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad, Brian. Pilot, you're good with another 10? Yeah. Bridge is yeah, so this sponge to me again looks like... The genus Hyalonema, or at least in the family Hyalonematidae, it's a glass sponge. Zero, you can see just extending now, down there below it is the stalk, which is formed of the silica spicules that this sponge forms. It looks like there might be copy, an bridge. amphipod living inside of this um, sponge. Look a red dot. Let's, uh, we're getting a closer look here. You see how great the uh, video and the magnification on this video is. Playing the focus game. It's deep in there. Yeah, it's deep in there, and of course the sponge itself is bobbing in the currents. But almost assuredly, Understood. that's what that is, an amphipod crustacean. Uh, sponges are often home to a lot of different Sounds associates. Uh, worms, crustaceans, shrimp, zoanthids, anemones. Um, and you can see, actually, as we look down below at the stock, you can see at the upper part, I see some exposed silica but below it, it's been colonized by something else. So it looks like its stock is wrapped up in something. Um, not sure what it is, mud tubes or a different kind of a sponge. Good stuff. You can come out and uh, we'll keep going. Thanks. I'll probably continue up this rock pile here. See Understood. what's attached. Oh, there's some well, there's already more colonies than I was expecting uh, well, down here, Ashton. Well, don't get carried away. No, I'm trying to be really yeah. good. I want to try and be in, in a pseudo one continuous move, but of course, if you do see something you want to really uh, okay. investigate or sample, please, by all means. Yep. Um, most of these colonies that I'm seeing don't look in great shape. You know, they're, they're still alive, and I'm seeing they're being clam clambered up upon by brittle stars and so on. This one looks like it has a bunch of barnacles on it. They, they look for but, back a letter, better word, ragged. Kind yeah, of, yeah, exactly. Most of the uh, tissue is dead. That last one we looked at was in pretty good condition. Um, but these partial? three or Frame four this, that I'm seeing uh, up here, uh, most certainly not. And that's very interesting. And I have no idea how long this mm -hmm. skeleton has been sitting in place. So this is a bamboo coral skeleton. I don't see any live bamboo coral tissue. I do see many hydrozoans overgrowing it. I see at least two, three brittle stars wrapped around. They're probably fishing in the water column. Looks like a couple okay. of barnacles on the uh, upper branch there towards the top. Actually, several barnacles. Uh, what else do oh, we have? There's, there's, there's Go ahead, there is some tissue. Yeah. Look at that. Something's yeah. hanging on. At least one or two branches. Yeah. Got a little bit of... Yeah. Pull up left. Yep. There. You can see where it connects on the right there. Shall we do it, Ashton? I'm not dead yet. I'm not dead you, you do yep. you, Scott. All right, thanks. Bring out to do. 
Yeah, so that, that one branch that you see there with the uh, pinkish polyps, that is the bamboo coral. And so there is still some tissue alive. And in this one, you can see very prominent needle-like sclerite. So this is different from the one that we were just imaging down the slope. Uh, all the tentacles have been withdrawn. Oh, there's also in the center there a tube-like mm -hmm. um, fan worm. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of cool. The worm has built its tube up on this colony. Oh, and yeah. then the larger polyps that we see over here on the right, that's a different coral. That is a stoloniferous coral, one of these ribbon-like ones that's mm -hmm. settled on this dead skeleton. Uh, it speaks to the importance of the habitat structure that the mm -hmm. bamboo coral created in the first place as habitat for all these that's other true. organisms, even after it's dead, or in this case, mostly dead. Yeah, we, 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 we've talked a few times about the... Um what an opportunity any type of relief above the seafloor creates. Um, and so, you know, whether that's geologic or whether that's uh, uh, dead biologics, giving the ability for other organisms to find a little bit higher um, perch. Well, actually, did you need a closer look at this one here? I'm gonna snap it. Yeah, let's do it. This one looks like it's alive and there's something different on it. Oh, no, I'm just looking at a different view of a wrapped-up arm. Okay. We'll let go of you. Yep. We'll keep going. Yeah. Can, can we actually get uh, that snap right there? Coming back in? No, no, just wide angle. Just oh, oh, zoomed out like that. You yeah. stay wide? You want to see the? Uh, yeah, I want to see those, those lobes, those pillows, especially on the left-hand side on that slope. See those large bulbous features, those large pillow basalts? Those actually look like they might actually be in place and forming kind of part of the structure that all this talus is on. Can bring it around. It's got Hawthorian. Yeah, so I think what we're looking at is actually kind of a big stack of pillow basalts. So, so a big stack of the actual active volcanics that form this area with, you know, some rubble draped on top of it and then some sediment. You know, I, 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 I'm kind of seeing like this really yeah. wide ridge that's filling most of the screen right now yep. with lots of pillows on us. So you're telling me that whole ridge is all pillows on pillows. Uh, I think that's all pillows. Down, yep, and then and there's probably more of them. Yep, and then there's fragmentation coming right, across. 10 more meters. And I actually... Yep. I'm, I'm hoping that it'll get less sedimented as we come up, just because, you know, we're not too steep in some of these areas on top of these pillows, and there's actually not too much sediment. We have a move when you're ready. Copy. Range one zero meters. I'll tell you, Ashton, I'm really surprised how many suspension feeders there are down here. Well, I want you to know, colonies. I picked this area just to surprise you. <laughs> you continue to yeah. surprise yeah. me every day. Yeah. Coming. So Thank we had this discussion yesterday, but it speaks to the productivity in an overlying water column. Mm -hmm. So we are really deep, but clearly there's so much production above that enough of it's getting down here to support uh, this fauna. The density is obviously lower than what we saw yesterday, but it's high for 3,300 meters. Yeah, and, and you know, so that, that uh, you know, loose uh, kind of generalization that you can make in the seafloor around areas that are dominated by calcareous depositions that have the depositing of marine sediments through animals that form their, their tests and uh, skeletons through calcium carbonate calcite is about 10 meters per million years. And so, you know, on a rough estimate, if we're on something that might be half a million years old, then you might expect five meters of sediment. Um, and so that's it's kind of mind boggling. Yeah. So that speaks that, you know, this is this actually might actually be pretty young. Um, it's not necessarily some of the older portions of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in this transfer zone, um, in this fracture zone. A lot of barnacles down here that I'm seeing on these uh, uh, skeletons that have been stripped of the tissue. So we have two corals in front of us. They're both bamboo corals. The one that's just off the screen on the left, that one's mostly dead and overgrown by that stolonifer. But the one that's right ahead that we're about to image, Come this in. is another live one. Start the bottom. So this one's in good condition. And to get at this idea of, you know, how old is the bottom and how much time has there been for accumulation of sediments, um, I would say the same thing about these okay. skeletons. So how long ago did this one uh, land here? Actually, this is really interesting. I'm more interested right now in the thin stock on the left of the main coral. Uh, because if that is a bamboo or some other coral, I actually think sure maybe it's a sponge. Lights but if up. it is, 50%. that's telling me something about recruitment. Mm -hmm. We want to know, okay, we see some corals here. They're all big. They're all old. But what's happening now? Are we having... 
okay. ongoing recruitment. Mm -hmm. And so when we see small corals, that's interesting. I actually think that's an Asbestopluma carnivorous sponge. So yeah, nice, uh, nice colony. Let's see. So okay, so this has got the prominent needles again. Uh, probably the same one we imaged before. That branch looks like it's coming out of a node. That's great. Thank you. And uh, Cindy Vandover, one Drop of our shore size scientists, off. is also chiming in that, you know, another complicating factor in terms oh, yeah. of the deposition is, is not oh, just yeah. how old the sea floor is or how much primary production is, but what are the ocean bottom currents like? So that can help uh, sweep away material. It can also help deposit material. It might be a, a source for, okay. for food for these organisms, and it might kind of okay. alter our, our perception of how old the exposed rock is. Yeah, Cindy's comment about how the fracture zone may channel food or currents to support what we see here, or her question about yeah. it. Um, I had the same thought, you know, when I'm looking at that map, I'm thinking, you know, we're in this sort of cross where we have two deep rifts, or mm -hmm. excuse me, I should say valleys coming mm -hmm. um, together. And so there's got to be some degree of funneling of the deep currents. And so that I'm may that. improve the rate at which all this marine snow, these dots of the white current, that you see in the, in the in the water that. column, are drifting by these polyps, and that's what's necessary uh, for all for of these 10. suspension feeders to feed. Okay, thanks. It's kind of like if you're sitting at uh, the dinner table at a conveyor animal. belt and your food comes along the conveyor belt, you know, you want that conveyor belt moving Understood. just fast enough that you've always got some thanks. food to eat, but not so fast that you can't grab it off and not so slow that it's like, I'm finished, yeah, give me the next thing. Mm. Good copy. That's Thank not you. typically the way I eat, Ashton, to anticipate your next question. I was, I was going to say, well, thanks. I just had a problem of picturing a conveyor belt full of desserts. <laughs> I don't have a problem yeah, picturing Sunday, that. Sunday, cake, yeah. Sunday. Come up and over it. Asako Matsumoto on shore says that uh, Okeanos close-ups are always amazing. That's so true. Thanks. And so ROV, just for a geological sampling uh, kind of uh, awareness, you know, what I'm kind of always looking for in areas like this are these large low bait pillows that don't look like they're mm -hmm. um, talus from upslope. They don't look like rubble. But then looking for maybe a section where it's fragmented um, so that, you know, we're grabbing a section of one of these pillows, but we can pretty much tell it came from that pillow. That's, yeah. So keep your, keep your eyes peeled for that. Okay. Um, Understood. And then, you know, also just um, based off of some of the weathering and alteration we saw, you know, the, the one we grabbed, one of the ones we grabbed yesterday, which was about softball size, you know, we picked it out of the bucket and it was either Scott's amazing grip strength um, or, or just the depressurization. Um, you know, it, it, had come, it came up in about four or five pieces. So oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty weathered. Um, and so we might be grabbing something a little bit larger, maybe cantaloupe size. Um, I hadn't dialed down my hand before I stuck it in the rock box. Sorry about that. Is this is lasers? Is that something you like? Yeah, let's see if that's uh, some stolen Ifrus octoral or small sponges. Oh, for let's a rock. It a rock. Come it's on. A, it's, it's, it's a great rock. It's it's big. Um, but we could we could give it a wiggle. Yeah, I think we can give it a wiggle. It's certainly in place. Yeah, it's in place. Um, you know, it was it's been reflected to me to a few times by Got by it. some colleagues who's been doing this for forty years. You know. You never really need anything that bigger than about a grapefruit, job, so. um, but you also take what you can get. It definitely looks like it's like freshly cracked from that, you know, that pillow. Right? Yeah, it looks like it's cracked on those two surfaces. So it's it's definitely looks like it's an in-place feature, which is like which is great. Sure, yeah. Thanks. Hydraulics coming on. One of the the hard things about uh, after collecting these rocks and we bring them ashore and then trying to, or bring them on ship and then we try and describe. Uh, write descriptions of what they might be. We can usually assume some type of basalt in where we are, but in terms of uh, mineralogical assemblages, so what type of minerals are actually making them up, or vesicularity, how, yeah, yeah, how much yep, uh, pore spaces in them, is that a lot of these rocks are, are coated in a precipitate, sometimes manganese precipitate, um, and that makes it really difficult to see that kind of fresh surface. And so we kind of have to wait till we get back on shore, and they can be sawed in half. Nope, now it's stuck. Yeah, it looks like... You see that? Yeah, it looks like it's probably still attached on the other surface. Yep. All right. Worth a shot. Yep. No, just... And, and just so you guys are, yeah, aware of what we're looking for, so... I'd always rather have, 
you know, six set of eyes looking than I one. I think that's about the right size, though. That's yeah. like I'm trying to get you a sizable one. That's definitely in place. Okay, all right, take it off. The jog's clear. So, Ashton, you don't have confidence that. I mean, for me, I wouldn't think that these had tumbled down slope. They all seem to be part of this feature, so you don't have confidence in the ones that look more separated that they're not. You can't, you, you, you can't well, you eliminate you, the possibility. You just can't be sure, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, uh, a great example of that is out in Hawaii, right? We're on the volcano Kilauea, right? It's one of the five volcanoes that form the island of Hawaii. Um, but in kind of some of the landscaping that people have done around the park areas, they've yeah, used large blocks like of basalt that are from Mauna Loa. Just um, and so yeah, you can imagine okay. you actually have these erratics from a different volcano that are scattered Second through the landscape, forming trails and things like that. But, you know, 100 years from now, who knows? Maybe those will get buried by an eruption. And a oh. 100 years from then, a, a geologist yeah. will come out to interpret it and be like, why is this large Mauna Loa basalt yeah. in the middle of Kilauea? Yes, sir. Now, if you want to get it's another like there's 10. some kind of fan on a rock Copy down that. here. That this may be an example of what you're saying about sure. tumbling down slope, just under the lasers. Oh, so that rock right has surely moved since that coral began growing. Mm -hmm. If we can get a one, zoom on that, yep. um, very, thank you. Understood. And then some other complicating factors, although these are probably less of an issue the more equatorial you get, is you have glacial erratic, so you have large boulders that have been carried through uh, icebergs and glaciers that as those glaciers melt, they drop those erratics. And then you also get uh, tree erratic, so large trees that get um, uh, blown down or collapsed or landslide driven into the ocean through fluvial systems. They might have rocks entrained in their root system, and then as those like, decay, they, they drop rocks. So. So what about if I think of like a classic volcano exploding? Would rocks be thrown that far? Uh, not here. Okay. We're, we're so far away from everything. Um, there could be submarine eruptions that might erupt pumice. Um, oh. And then, of course, sub-aerial eruptions, large eruptions on land, will erupt uh, ash and volcanic glass that There's can make itself the, uh, this way and fall through the water column. Larger section. That's good. That's good. Okay. All right. You can come out. Thank you. So uh, what you can see here is I it's sheared here. at the base. And so this is a large skeleton. I'm not 100% certain it's a bamboo coral. I don't recognize that kind of growth. Uh, but whatever it is, it's tumbled down the slope. There's no tissue on it. And you can see here all kinds of rubble. This is interesting because this is octocoral rubble, where the last several dives when we've seen this huge pile of mm -hmm. rubble, those were stony coral rubble, um, scleractinium. Um, but the bamboo corals do produce pretty hard calcium carbonate skeletons, so they persist for very long periods of time, more so than those protein-based ones would. So uh, this is kind of promising that there will be even more as we move upslope, which is going to make it even harder for me to acquiesce. I know, I know, but yep. but think about all those beautiful corals you've already seen, and all the yep. beautiful corals you will see, and yep. take a minute and stop and smell the rocks. <laughs> I will do that. Yes. Yeah, so this is another good example of sure, the um, bamboo coral that's dead and been overgrown by this other uh, thing. Um, I've been calling it a stoloniferous one, but now as I look at the upper of those three branches on the right, it looks quite thick. I'm actually wondering if this is in the family Anthothelidae. I realize that's not going to matter to most uh, lay people. Um, but the interesting thing about the Anthothelids is they can begin by growing like a mat and overgrowing stuff and then produce their own skeleton as they extend outward from there. Oh. Um, so that might Go be ahead, what's going on here. Thank you. Zoom out a little bit. Hold that. There we Close go. Complete pilots. Toe slipped a little bit. I'm back. The dots in there Close are really copy. kind of interesting. Hmm. Let's see what's going on here. So do you try to put a little forward way in when you've got yeah, the toe down? Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the hold, but yeah, typically. I, I guess those dots must be sclerites. I'm so used to looking at bamboo coral and their that. clear tissue and identifying basically ro different kinds of rods and scales and needles that I'm not used to seeing the sclerites of other families through their tissue. Um, and they have such a huge diversity of shape. That's why this looks so different. Uh, that's cool. All right. No idea what it is. I think I'm going to go on a limb and say anthothelidae. Thanks, Bill. So you got 10 meters going, right? We did. What just the bearing of that? It was 265 still, but we can make the next yeah, one. Yeah, it, it, it looks like the shore-based scientists are also okay. excited to maybe Come see on. some 
some steeper exposure of the wall. Yeah. Our depth is 3,327 meters, so we're more Thanks, than three kilometers yeah. deep. Close, getting close to two miles. It's about just over 1.8 miles. So another thing, as we move up here, there's a dead skeleton at the base of this pillow, and I can see three brittle stars climbed up on that coral. Note there's no brittle stars on the rock. Yeah. You know, and that's very common for that uh, no. kind of brittle star. Um, hmm. I'm not exactly sure. Well, I do know that to get from one coral to another, they do have we to clamber over the surface. So occasionally you see that. Uh, but it is interesting that it is the fauna, the corals and the sponges that are their habitat, not so much the basaltic seafloor, at least for that kind. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, you know, I, I'm just, uh, when I'm looking at this, I'm, of course, thinking of what we saw, I think it was the other day, where we actually had kind of those three little micro-environments on kind of one side of our ridge. We had kind of the really active side. Perfect we had kind rock. of the less inactive side with some of the less of the larger megafauna, and then we had that side that looked more or less barren to a certain extent in terms of the macroscopic organisms, just because it was in that talus field. And yep. so until we kind of get an idea of what we're looking at, uh, we don't know. Maybe we're in one of those large talus areas right now. Just had a sea cucumber go flying by, which gives you a good indication of how fast things are. Can we zoom on the fish that's just to the oh. lower left of the lasers, yeah. spotted by our geologist, Hawkeye Ashton? I don't know how I missed that. Nice job. I well, missed it too. I thought it, was a, take, take I thought it was a wiggling rock. Oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah, this one's different. Yeah, take it. Um, Ophidiidae, maybe? Cuskeel, maybe? But I don't think the same species that we've been take seeing it. earlier... Oh, well, that's really interesting. Yep. Do my best. Deep sea snake. It's full. You saw a snake? It's not quite. Really. Well, I think there's a large worm of some kind, maybe a mollusk, but it was snake shaped. Come on, turn around. I, I was getting excited. Yep. I knew I shouldn't say that out loud. Are there deep sea snakes? I mean, I know they're. No uh, ocean. Yeah, no, there snakes, are right? Um, because they're air breathers. Yeah, and so when uh, you know, it'd be too complete? hard to get back up to the surface. Like whales, right? Whales can do it. Other cetaceans um, can dive pretty deep into yeah. the deep sea. Maybe Last not this deep. 13, 13. Um, okay. But they have some amazing so capacities. Can go down right. to two thousand meters. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it looks clear. Give okay. it another minute. Yeah. Understood. Cool. I Three little sponges also tucked under the rock. Just before you go, look over to the right, please. Copy. Lower right, I think. In the sediment. Or it was, was it in the sediment or just uh, not that low? Sorry. Yep. No, let's just go right there. It is just on the edge of the rock right there. So that's what I saw. Can't tell if that's a tube or... Are you talking about on the, the right of the screen there? It just went out the yeah, top okay. right small, corner. It's small on the rock. Tube, small tube. There. That wiggly thing, not the two, but on the rock face. Oh, that's worm, it. Worm yep. shaped uh, yep. sediment colored. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think it's actually yeah. a tube made of uh, probably some parchment and sediments together, so it's almost assuredly another fan worm. Yeah, my toes slipping. Yeah. Parch parchment? Uh, so. Not, I'm not, not sure what the what the material yeah, is, but yeah. worms can secrete something that uh, is almost paper-like yeah. or leathery-like. Yeah. Maybe not leather, but it, it's harder than just mud oh, and mucus okay. together, okay. and it's softer than it's calcium than carbonate. Oh, so okay. I describe it like yeah. a parchment. Okay. Yeah. But you're right to call me on it because I think parchment is actually paper. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I was implying cellulose structure to me. Yeah. I don't believe it's a cellulose space, but I actually I don't know what the chemistry is. It's kind of a very interesting question. Something else now I'm going to have to research. Okay, so now that we, you What's know. What's on the top of this rock, this purple thing? Oh, it's just uh, another sea cucumber. Okay. So I, ne I never thought I would ask this, but what is the taxonomical difference between a snake and an eel? My goodness. Um, I'm just so impressed you're asking about taxonomy. I know. I, yeah. I, I should probably just quit now. So a snake is a reptile, Yeah. so it'll be more closely related to uh, lizards and crocodiles. It's basically snap, one of snap. those with no legs, Spiky. where an eel is a fish. Oh, so here's a really cool sea cucumber, um, which has some of its podia really elongated. I want to say something like dendrochiroda or something. Hopefully someone will correct me on that. 
but again, just another deposit feeder. The interesting thing about this one is it's sort of clambering up on the rocks. Mm. So I'm not sure if, you know, it's... Um, oh, there's a thin layer of sediment on that rock that maybe... I wouldn't say it's necessarily adapted to that, or we've just caught it in the act of moving from one sediment pool to another. There's uh, quite a high diversity of sea cucumbers. Okay, take it now that I'm closer. Let's see if I can find a name for this one. Spiky. Old Spiky. Back. What'd you say, Chris? That toe, I think so that, that snake eel you. question to oh, me, okay. that's, yeah. that's kind of one of those questions I would ask, you know, I, I can see myself asking my parents that question when I was seven. What's the difference between a snake and an eel? And you know, how do you explain it to a seven-year-old? Um, or, for lack of a better word, how do you explain it to a 40-year-old geophysicist, right. which is like a seven-year-old? Honestly, it looks like, <laughs> looks like it's dead. Well, I think, was there. that pretty good? Reptile versus fish? I think so, yeah. Right? One has gills and one's an air breather. So and, the and how, eel has gills. Which, how far long ago did those... The, re the reptile hmm. and the fish? Yeah. Uh, I would guesstimate, I should know my geological timetable is better, but I'm going to guesstimate 200 million years to 300 million years. Okay. Someone's going to call me out on that for sure. Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at an image in the animal guide that suggests this is in the family Dematidae. And uh, boy, here's a mouthful for this genus. Orphnergus. Orphnergus is a possibility. So what you're looking at are uh, tube feet, basically. The, Compare this to a sea star. If you've ever looked on the underside of the sea star, it has all those tube feet that it uses to move around to grasp its food. So these sure. are just longer, okay. modified tube feet. And uh, I think, <laughs> this is kind of funny, I think, so. I think the head is at the right, but I could be wrong. Um, and that's the problem with you know some of these sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers if you don't actively see them feeding, sometimes it's a little hard to tell. You could be right. Uh, this one you could be left. I, it could be right. Could be left, could be right, could be wrong. It doesn't have the modified podia that it uses, like uh, mm. little hands to Probably grasp move food. In. So it's, hard, it's a little hard to tell with this one. And those little modified Two, podia, those are ten. Those, those are on the head base Actually, side, no. so that's an easy way to kind of Bye. distinguish them when you see them. Two seven five. On, right. on those other ones. On those other ones, one. yeah. Two seven yeah. five at a range of ten, 10 meters. 10? Just, Com just to chime in there, Scott. Yes. Um, Going back then to the polykey tube thing, the, uh, heavy. I was at Henry's table and we were talking about it, so I couldn't yeah. chime in at the moment. But those tubes like are usually made out of some kind of mucus that they secure Range and to find meters, threads and then agglutinate it with uh, sand or mud particles. Two knots, please. Yeah, and so um, I agree. And a lot of the tubes we see are like that, and that's what that vertical tube is. But there are others that have more of a, a, a papery feel to them when they dry it. And so think of Perfect. the Riftia tube worms as a good example at the hydrothermal vent. You know, those are clearly not mud. So there's something else that's being secreted along with the mucus. ROV, do we have a, a minute? Uh, or are we moving? Nope, we're good. Okay, you see that large fragmented pillow right in front of you on your left? I sure do. And you see there's kind of um, almost like a little rectangular keystone rock in the middle of it. Yep, yep. a little tiny one. Yeah, I want to... Maybe something in there is sampleable. It might be a little small, but it, it's definitely in place. Understood. All right, let's see if we can give that a poke. Let's see what it looks like. Hydraulics up. Hydraulics are up. There you go. I'm coming on. Thank you. And if we could get the lasers on real quick, too. Got that. Lasers on. Thank you. That little tiny one. <laughs> Is that what you want, watch lead? Yeah, maybe pull it out and we'll see or you know I'm hoping maybe some of that stuff is just kind of fragmented enough so we could kind of 
dig around in there. Do you want a bigger piece? Um, or see if there's a bigger piece to come? Yeah, if you see one. I could try to touch the one next to it. What about, um, yeah, that one doesn't seem to be. See the, the larger one right in front of you? What if you take your draws on the left side of it, pull up on it, and see if it, that one's loose and it might make stuff? This guy? Yeah, that one, yeah. Bigger one, see if, you can move, see if that one wiggles. There's also the one sitting on the ground right there that looks like it fell out of that crack. See that? I'm saying? That one? Yeah, just below me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, oh, there you go. Oh, okay. So the one there is is loose. Yeah, that that one there that That's that perfect. loose would be perfect. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what we can try to get out of there. I go uh, open the box, or do you want to um, go try to get behind it? See if we can go ahead, bridge. Do you want to open the port rock box, or do you want to do starboard? Uh, Move is complete. We can pilots. do starboard. Okay. See if we can get this out of here without yeah. sliding. Uh, okay, we'll re grab that. Have a wing inboard. Uh, stand by one. And so if you're just joining us, our ROV team is, is sampling a piece of this pillow basalt. And one of the important things for geological sampling in the deep ocean is to make sure that we try and get something that's in me? place, something that we know came from the right, rock and is not a piece of rubble from somewhere else. We also want a portion of that outer that. skin of that lights. pillow basalt that, right that's up. quenched quickly and has likely a large concentration of volcanic glass in that. And that volcanic glass is used for uh, subsequent geochemical analysis. Did you want me to turn the lights on? Yeah, okay, hold on. Coming up. Just a little bit. There you go. That was really nice to be able to pluck that out of there. Yeah, that was uh, some great skill by our ROV team. Sure can't stand by. You can just bring it up, too. Beautiful, you guys. All right, video. Come back on that. Yeah, I think we can get that in the starboard. Okay. Sample box. Ready for me to bring it in? Yep. Right. All right. Understood. Thanks, Brian. There you go. And mini Zeus. All right, so sample too. into yeah, okay. Uh, okay. starboard side <laughs> rock box. Yep. And that'll just, yeah, we can just do pillow basalt one. And then if we could also just get um, a few stills of that outcrop. Uh, pillow fragment one, you said? Yep. Or a uh, pillow basalt fragment one. Although pillow implies basalt, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Might as well be thorough. All right, it's in the box. All right. Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. Clear. All right. Wing outboard. Wing outboard. And do we have some nice glamour shots of that? Shoulders up. Um, outcrop. Great. Okay. Okay. Oh. All right. There's a little jelly. All right, pan and tilt's coming back to Looks like the one out. we imaged earlier mm -hmm. with Take the uh, red canals, the yellowish bell. Oh, yeah. 
Not sure yeah. if it must be the cells that are forming yeah, the bell, but in him. between Sorry, there's a the layer line. of cells on the outside, layer of cells on the, the inside, and in between yes. it is a gelatinous matrix. Okay. Which By is the way, Pontus, we're going to start asking jellyfish. for percentages. My the editor's that saying that we've had them too high. Rock box okay. the starboard. Starboard. starboard rock box. Thank you. Th thank you, RV. That was a that was a yeah perfect perfect example of of a beautiful geological sample. All right. I turned to port a little bit, Chris. Uh, Understood. Or, excuse me, to starboard. Uh, yeah, what's our next waypoint? Like, I see waypoint one there, but where's our... Interesting here, these different sort of uh, highs, yeah, ridges that we're supposed to go. We can see all the exposed, broken up pillows and then the sediment in between. Copy. Yeah, but and so, you know, it, it, it's hard sometimes, especially when things get this area. sedimented, to, to really tell what is rubble and, and what is primary, two, especially, sure. you know, in those areas that we, we've been on those tops of those ridges where everything is just so fragmented. So it's fragmented, but it's actually okay. in place. So but there's just been so much down. shear so that, uh, that's occurred on those fault structures. Okay. So when you see those nice, beautiful, large, right. low like bait pillow uh, features, you know for sure oh, those were kind of erupted Sounds in that place or erupted from up so and then kind of dropped the as a large pillow structure. And then south. It may be obvious, but the other so thing I like in the view like that we're seeing here now is that these corals yeah, are growing you know on these rocks. Mm -hmm. They're not in the sediments. Yeah, We're seeing like something very like different on the right sediment way. compared yeah, to the mean, rock. And in like fact, you can see down in that chute uh, down below, I see a purple sea cucumber way. on the sediment. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. where you would expect to see the sea cucumber. It's a deposit yeah, feeder, so that's why that last one that was on the rock is a little bit odd. But it gets to the, I guess, obvious difference that major habitat differences are going to affect the biological communities that are living on them. They're processing food in different ways. And in most of the deep sea, it's a sedimented bottom you're going to see. We're targeting the mid-Atlantic Ridge. We often target seamounts. So we're looking at places where that rock does range. sort of stick out of the One bottom, and so meters. it may be to the average Bearing viewer of Oceanus Explorer dives that, wow, Speed most of the deep ocean bottom is rock. But that's what we're targeting. Most yeah. of the deep ocean bottom is actually sediment. And so when we do see these large, diverse, and dense communities of suspension feeders, we know that, oh, that's a special place. This is different from sort of the average deep sea. Now, in. we were uh, either the other day or the day before, we, I forget, and you don't, don't hold this against me. We were either talking about a coral or a sponge, which I still can't tell, necessarily always tell the difference right. from afar, about the one that had developed, uh, it evolved it to be on hard rock and then soft rock and kind of had an inflated peduncle. Yeah, I would right. love to be able to find that today. Jelly? So that was a coral. Yep. Um, specifically, it was a sea pen, a member of the Penatulacia type of octocoral. Sea pen, okay. Yeah, and so the sea pens uh, have been adapted. Um, the base of the colony is this inflatable, what we call a peduncle and that allows them to stabilize themselves in soft sediment. And, but and yeah, a small subgroup has now evolved to come back onto rock. Would you would you expect to possibly find those in well, a deep area like this? Oh, oh I noise. would love to. Yeah. So and I can't find which channel most coming from. of the known observations. Um, well, let's see. see oh, good. The Pashna Ganguly is in That's the uh, chat room, so she can tell me exactly where are most of the observations. I think they go down to maybe eight hundred may meters. To you but last summer listening. we observed yeah, check the three or four of them system. when we got onto the bottom got for about 15 to 20 minutes. We were doing a mid-water dive, went mm. down to the bottom right, just yeah, to see what was there, and we saw some at maybe it's pilot talking. 3,200 meters. Oh, so right right around yeah, in this exactly. range. Yeah. The deepest ever known, we weren't able to collect one, yeah. so we don't know what it was. Um, so I would love to be able to see that, and that would be a collection yeah. target. That's about to tell you got. So Which here we're it? looking at some encrusting sponges on one of your nice rocks. Partial. Not sure what the filamentous stuff is. We collected, uh, when we were at the Moitira events, we collected a rock that had a lot of these filamentous strings. And so I preserved a bunch of those to find out, are they being produced by worms, amphipods, foraminifera, something else. So hopefully somebody can And so the ones, that, the ones that you collected, what did they look like once you had them back in the lab? Uh, they maintained their integrity pretty yeah. well. I could not see that the tips of them were open, as you would expect from a worm tube. And how big? They were tiny. Yeah, they were maybe two and a half to three centimeters okay. um, in length. Like, so my Thank suspicion you. is that they're more like foraminifera. That's probably fecal traces in the no, back. No, are those little... Um, those mounds? Those yeah, little those cups. Those are uh, winch tension looking. The cups here. Those are all sponges. Those are all sponges. Yep. yep. Uh, 
Ashen's pointing to the rock in the foreground. There's several gray-white structures that are arising. Copy. They're very small sponges. It's been steady. They look like little tubes, actually. Pile of okay. poop. Yep. Pile of poop there, and then beyond it, that ball-like structure, that would be a xenophile. And is that a glass sponge? Yeah, a nice tube glass sponge just below the, uh, the coral that's on the rock. Um, has the general morphology of the one that we collected yesterday, except that this one appears to be growing in the sediments, which suggests to me it's probably a different species. And another glass sponge. Yep, same sort of morphology, Once right? Once we get to the flat far spot. Left. I'm going to take your job. Like 30, 30, That's 30, good. 30, 30. Yeah. Yeah. That means we've been training you well. I don't know what that is. Something collapsed over the rock. Maybe a sponge folded on itself. Or maybe an encrusting sponge growing up a rock. Yeah, so we're looking at this angular pyramidal, pyramidal rock on the bottom left. Um, uh, bottom left. Down right. to the left. That's uh, a bamboo coral that's on the rock. We've uh, looked at that a couple of times, this unbranching, <coughs> excuse me, whip-like form. Yeah, that thing right there. Yeah, oh, okay. okay. That's yeah. a sponge. It's an yep. encrusting sponge. Yeah. With a whole lot of other little globular sponges. And there's so that beautiful... Tube so sponge. Like dip, right? um, I'm going to say yeah. something like the family Euplectelidae. That. that is tiny and so delicate of a structure. Yep. Sure is. I think I, I predicted when we were diving that there were probably going to be a lot of sponges down here. You know, um, it's kind of a shame that the modern art movement in, in architecture didn't happen at the same time of deep sea exploration because I think they could have drawn a lot. Absolutely. And on some of these expeditions that go out, like on the Falcor, they take artists with them yeah. to interpret this because there is a lot of beauty. Uh, down here. And I, I just love the complex architecture mm -hmm. of these glass sponges. And there you can see that uh, sith plate at the top. Uh, very It almost looks diagnostic. Dome. Yes, this yeah. one does look yeah. dome, I agree. And it has, it looks like silica fibers on that mm -hmm. dome coming off the top. So that'll be yep. uh, so useful to our taxonomists. I had that too, Chris, and I think it might Thank be... Yeah, you. right. Like, so I, I can't help but look at that, that delicate doming, yeah. interarching structure, and think, so you know, think like Buckminster Fuller and geodesic doming. Sure. I did the same thing. I was at 60%, and I think... I grew up with that. Like um, I grew up in Montreal, yeah, yeah, and he had uh, XP67. Then, like, he designed... Then you're waffling, you know? Yeah. So that's the kind of huge dome was designed as a Buckminster Fuller dome that included a very large pavilion. Or it's just the Another toe just drifting kind of sea the cucumber. That we can't really help. I don't know. I wanted to come back to uh, my prediction that there would be a lot of sponges. And one of the reasons I predicted that is I thought that the amount of organics getting down here would be yeah. relatively low. And sponges have a lower energy requirement and so tend to do quite well in those environments where there's... Um, low current flow and perhaps not much food, better so than some of these larger suspension feeders. Can we zoom on the fish, please? Straight yep. ahead in the middle. Take that part Thank you. There's two. Um, yeah, there's two. One on the left we saw earlier, I think. Yep, yep. I agree with you. This one might be a very small rat tail, perhaps. Uh, but anyway, this is one of the reasons I'm surprised with all the corals. There's obviously some burrowing fauna here. I see little mounds. Yeah, I think this is a little rat tail with a very tall dorsal yeah, fin. Yeah, you want to give me 10 more. Do us. Do us. Copy that. Thanks. I'm not sure what London Bridge pickle is, but uh, that last loud sponge Another reminded ship, Cindy of it. Range 10 meters. Bearing due west, 270 degrees. At a Does she mean those little cocktail pickles? Now. I'm not sure. This is interesting to me. It, it, it's like a head with a tail, mm. <laughs> you know? Thank you. Shit move is in. Thanks. Is that There's where the rat tail yeah, comes from? Absolutely, yeah. So I think this is a grenadier, and the other common name for the grenadiers is the rat tails. And I think you can see it looks like this rat tail appended to a head with very large eyes. I take more and I believe these are bottom feeders. So they sort of move slowly above the bottom. They move slowly to conserve that energy. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Weird building it. in a like, London skyline. I, ROV right? pilot, like, DB gain was high. Like, if it was plus three, it's real, real washy. That's good for us when video's ready. Clear. Got it. 
And so if you're just joining us, we're on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We're in the Kurchatov Fracture Zone, which is a right lateral offset in the north-south running Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And what I mean by right lateral is, I mean, if you were standing on the edge of the southern segment of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, on its most northerly tip, one more and you looked at moves, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in the north of you, the whole system would move about 20 so kilometers to your right. And so we're in this deep basin between that, uh, that westward portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and that eastern yeah, portion, right where it kind of yeah, steps we'll over to the right. We'll and we're kind of right there. in the middle we'll of it, it, in this fracture zone area. Flat. And we're exploring we'll this large slope, which is uh, covered slope, in uh, calcareous sediment. So um, sediments it, derived yeah, by matter. microorganisms that live in the, the water column. Yeah. And these large pillow basalts that are draped under them. And these pillow basalts are volcanically erupted. Um, a lot of these look like they were erupted in place in here. And so we collected some a sample and we'll, we'll use that to age date to see how old these rocks are. And so just to give you some, some geographic Stand awareness, by. we're about 175 kilometers from the Azores, from the northwestern island in the Azores, the island of Corvo. Uh, we dove to about 3,130 meters um, below sea level. Right now we're at about uh, 3,310 and we're going to try and come up about uh, about yeah, 200 to meters to about 3,340. Yeah. And so, oh, those numbers are reversed. Sorry. We dove to 3,340 and we're coming up to 3,127. Um, and and uh, hopefully yeah. we'll see a little bit less sediment on the way up and a little bit more primary exposed geology. We'll get an opportunity to, to sample some of the biology and then also take some more rock samples. So uh, I asked for a zoom here to show you the brittle star that is more characteristic of the seafloor and perhaps the sediments. And also you can really see nicely how here how a brittle star moves. And it has ossicles, calcium carbonate, hard parts in the tissue that are formed into vertebra, just like the vertebra in your back. And so you can see along the arm, it looks like there's a whole series of segments. Each of those has some musculature and some connective tissue between it. And it literally is using muscle to lift the arms. And it's very different from its cousin, the asteroid sea stars, which use their tube feet to sort of glide mm -hmm. above the surface. The other thing that is just so cool about echinoderms is that the connective tissue that they have between these ossicles is under neuronal control and they can basically partially liquefy that connective tissue so that they can more easily bend um, mm -hmm. and then they can um, make it stiffer after mm -hmm. that to sort of lock themselves in place and by locking themselves in place it reduces the energy requirement this is the fascinating thing about echinoderms thank you for that zoom you can also see all the kinds of sponges really on these yeah. rocks I mean, how big is that brittle star across uh, the Maybe lasers were on before, so the Maybe. arms are more than 10 centimeters. Yeah. But the disc is maybe, what, yeah. a centimeter and a half, two centimeters? But the arms are more than 10 centimeters yeah. long. So maybe 25, 30 centimeters yeah. all the way across. Yeah. 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 And then, of course, it's it's just sitting on this uh, cleaved surface of this beautifully yeah. exposed pillow, this large pillow oh, basalt behind HD2 it. Feet. You know, I think I'm going to ask the next Image. time we see a nice little yeah. rock like that that has those nice little sponges on it mm -hmm. that we pick that rock up oh, to get those sponges because uh, that'll be a nice opportunity to look at that. Another sea cucumber here, the purple one, the upper left, and a bryzone fan on the far right. We saw a close-up of that before. Um, yesterday we made a collection of uh, part of a dead coral that had this beautiful bryzone fan on it. They're really hard to collect. They're very uh, brittle and fragile themselves, and they're usually quite small. Uh, but it was great. Came up in perfect condition. So it's it's still funny to me seeing you know these these pr you know they're they're fragmented, but they're pretty well exposed pillow basalts. And I keep comparing it to where we dove in the Axial Valley Ridge a couple days ago, which was just blanketed with 10 times more sediment, but should have How's been an order of magnitude. There's a sea spider yeah. right in the center. Can I get yeah. Call a send to sea spider. Can I have the lasers on right now? Go to center. That move. On. When did that move? Thanks. There, the lasers are just passing over the sea spider, so you can see how long its legs are. Can we sit and look at that? Yep. Just creeping in now. 
Yeah, maybe we'll wait one minute. If we're lucky, we'll we find that's one good. that's carrying eggs. Tilt your camera Different down. Different kind so of sponge. Much more frilly, I think. Yeah. Between your toes. Stand by there. These sea spiders are um, specialist predators of um, of polyps, basically. And you'll see that they have a long proboscis that they can create a muscular suction right. in. Take that. And so they aren't chewing their food. They're instead um, sucking up their food the kind of like a legs. soup. Yep. Low percentage. Be about 50%. 50, aye. This one's a little paler than I'm used to. It's probably Tilt still down. in the family Colocendidae. Um, all these really large sea spiders Slight are in light. that family. Um, you can go in shallow water and just kind of pick through some uh, algae or hydroids, and you'll probably find some uh, some sea spiders. They'll just be a lot Bridge smaller. Sorry, down. I was hesitating there because I'm seeing that streaming stuff. So I think Can this one move, has been feeding. Range 10 meters. You can see the Bearing orange part, I believe, is the proboscis. So we're looking at this from the back towards the head. So the head is away from us. And that orange part that you see hanging down now on the right, Copy. that's Thank its proboscis. And you see some stringy stuff coming out. So that has recently right. stuck its in. proboscis into okay. something and has been feeding on it. Well, that's I, a really cool view. I really hope I don't run across one this big in the yeah. shallow water. That's going to haunt my nightmares. You Actually, can also um, see the yeah, can darker the lines on the inside the of the legs. Position. Those are extensions yep. of the gut that uh, extend down. Oh, really? Yeah, Pretty because sure there isn't enough space up in the body yeah. for the digestion to like occur. To so oh, I sort of pack it all into their legs. Current. That's interesting. I assume, I assume that was just skeletal. Full but, screen? So what I'm yeah, looking at. Digestive. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Look, see the D2 sonar. Thank you. That's beautiful. Let's see if we can watch the legs. Nice little full fan full worm there. So uh, see that? What Arvind was talking about. That's this would be one of the tubes that's made of a combination of mucus and mud grains. Slight tilt down. Hold that. Laser's clear. Laser's off. Skip that for about 18 seconds. Whatever your clear video. Things of my nightmares. Okay, video's clear. All right, Pulling out. Up. So I'm looking, at, I'm looking at this, Chris. Yeah. And I'm looking at that. So we'll assess that next. Understood. Yeah, and you can see how we're just kind of on this this uh, geomorphological wide, ridge. This, extra this, lights are clear. Uh, Go ahead, bridge. This Fog high are clear. that comes off of this seamount, off this Go small fog lights are clear. Uh, volcano. Thanks. And to your right, right you see this valley that right looks to be here. much more covered in yeah, sediment. And then and some talus. Okay. Some yeah, basaltic so rubble. Head, head on the top right. Yep. And then and these then beautiful outcrops. You, so I can't see over that. Of yep. fragmented so I'm try pillows. To try to see over it, but I don't feel like yeah, it. Swimmer, much, more, top of screen. much more biological diversity than I expected. This is a well, it's a polychaete worm for sure. You can see the flashing lights on either side are the parapodia, which are the swimming paddles. Right. And it's head down, moving through the water column. I was hesitating because I was going to try to put it in a family, but I'm not oh, sure what family it is. Uh, there are some pelagic polychaetes. Oh, Most worms, when you think about them, are associated with the bottom and, you know, sort of burrowing through the sediments or building tubes. But there are a few... Um, and notably the family Tomopteridae that are adapted for swimming in the water column. And there's some that are really fascinating in their biology. Look up the Swimma bomba or bomber worms. So, yeah. 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 Coming this over. sponge that's coming into view just right of center is a new one for the day. Understood. Thank you. Now, have we seen that before? Or uh, hard to tell. Uh, we haven't seen it today unless it's the one that you pointed at way in the distance. We haven't had a close-up of it, uh, but I don't know yet if it's something that we've seen on other dives. You can look to the right and show them the wall. As we're coming in, I'm kind of thinking mm -hmm. not. Um, I remember seeing things like this up in the Aleutians. Uh, they're glass sponges. They're really quite crispy, mm -hmm. uh, not soft at all. And they have these... Um, lobes that are kind of sticking out all around the sponge that are open on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I remember describing it kind of like a condominium for amphipods because there was an amphipod inside mm -hmm. each of those uh, lobes. What gives them that, that crispy uh, consistency? Yeah, so 
the the skeleton is made of silica fibers, mm -hmm. and we saw earlier that beautiful vase, the construction, how the fibers are all kind of overlaid green, with each other, and the tissue the is really, is really thin. So there's the a lot more silica than there is tissue, whereas in the okay. demo sponges, the more regular sponges, they have another uh, compound inside them called spongin. It's a protein that makes up the bulk of the sponge. So, for Take example, you know, if you bought a true bath sponge that was a real sponge, that skeleton, mm -hmm. that would be the spongin fiber, and that's soft and it holds a lot of water. So I think that's the difference. Yeah, this looks a lot like what I saw. Um, doesn't mean I can put a name on it, <laughs> but Let's bring up the other light. As we get this close percent. view, uh, maybe two things we can do is look at what it looks like at the base, and then is it open on the top? Copy. But yeah, you can see all these lobes kind of poking out. And I think when we look on the top, there we go. Nice. So it's very narrow, constricted, and has some kind of hold face. It's tucked onto the rock. Still works Excuse me. Hold the fast. Glued onto the rock. I'm not seeing anything through the tissue that would suggest it's populated by amphipods on the inside. So the question is, is it open Could like a vase at the top or is now, it closed? Two, seven, zero. Almost assuredly, we're going to find it's going to be open. And what did you call that structure on those glass punches where it now? caps the top? Well, I was saying sieve plate. Yeah. There may be another, okay. uh, open, uh, another name for it. Yeah, so you can see this one's open at the top. So it's kind of like a, a great big cup or a bugle. Please? that has the walls range, kind of poked outward from the inside. That's speed the way I would describe it. However, the water flow in terms of feeding would be from the outside to the inside, and the outflow would be out the top there. Now let's look at the top opening. These, these lobes Tickle are in. X current. Understood, thanks. Uh, no, I think, no, I, d I don't believe so. Um, I believe each of those lobes is closed, so they only open to the center. And so I believe only the top is the X current, the inside. Um, you can really see there nicely this sort of meshwork, and that's this complex of silica fibers that is uh, overlapping one another to create the, uh, the main hole. body and wall of the sponge. Back soon. Holding for near ground. Yep. When video's good. happy, we're happy. Thank you. Video's clear. All right, come whoa, on. Whoa. You grand lift off. Down with the lights. Hang on a second till we move off the shot. Okay. Got no thruster. Joy lock. Thank you. Okay, lights are clear. I thought I had it on for the set shot. Go ahead, bridge. Copy. Thank so you. I hit it and re-engaged it. Mm -hmm. Move is complete. So I'd probably yeah, settle to that yep. wall and kind of just face it and look at that big white sponge and kind of... We'll come up uh, the top of the screen there, that thing bit. you see that's kind of lying down, that may so be the sponge you're just looking at right dead, on though. Yeah. So so I, I it's brown, but it has all those lobes around the cylindrical body. That's almost assuredly what it is. Here's another one, this brown thing. This is another dead sponge. Once the, the cells die, um, Thank you. they're less able to remove sediment from the body. And so the sediment yeah, begins to accumulate now, on the silicon skeleton yeah, that remains until so you get that color. Okay. Right. The brow is pretty close. Yep. So, can use this. Yep. so Ashley, as I'm looking on the left side here, is there anything different about the pattern that you see on the inside of this pillow? I see some sort of radiating spokes here, or is that? Yeah, so, terminal? you know. Uh, the, the, the mic coming in? Mic check, mic check. No, I don't no. hear you. Only. I don't hear you either. Yeah. So um, as as those erupt, right, and we we and as as lava oozes out or is erupted out of this kind of uh, vent of this pillow volcano, it forms these large kind of lobes. Those lobes travel down the slope. Um, they're fed by the magmatic pressure, but then also gravi gravitationally driven. And as they as they cool. Um, as they as they cool, 
they also uh, like degas. So you might get some like uh, little, little vesicles, some little oh, air bubbles trapped in the lava yeah, that tend to uh, decrease in size as you move through the mound. Took parts of their video. The outer surface uh, tends to be very glassy because it's cooled very quickly. It's chilled rapidly. You want a tighter shot of that? I was just going to have you get a partial, but that's okay. okay. I didn't hear you. I was uh, Understood. communicating with Survey 1. Every once in a while, you know, I'm trying to get some of the names for some of the stuff by going to the animal guide, but it's hard to do and pay wish. attention to what's going on, on the Did screen. I'd rather pay attention to what's going on, on the screen, so... For some of the stuff, you're not getting the best names. Um, when we have the scientists, the appropriate scientists in the chat room, then that's much easier because they will provide some names for us. But it uh, doesn't look like we have any sponge biologists right now. But we also have your army of students, if you wanted to give them a shout out. I don't think. My uh, army of students doesn't seem to be uh, annotating right now. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Well, I'm the only one making Mike, the annotations, so. Mike check and all. Okay, EX. Mike check. Now I can hear you. If we can, let's try to get a snap zoom of the swimmer. Yep. Top of the screen, we have a little hydro medusa here. Take that roll. Oh, it looks like this is that same one that we've been seeing repeatedly. Oh, beautiful view. See a very slow pulse to the bell. The underside of that bell is hollow, so when it contracts the muscles around the margin of the bell, that forces water out from the underside. And that tube-like structure that you see hanging down, that's called the manubrium. And the mouth is on the bottom of that, and it leads into the gastrovascular cavity, which is basically the stomach space, digestive space. I love the color of those. Yeah, that, that those purple are awesome. and amber. You know. And that's, you know, I think that's a color that we get as we get deeper like yeah. this. You don't see that up in the shallower regions. So that's kind of interesting. And so you, you were talking about kind of the shape of some of these pillows. And, and one of the things I, I'm kind of constantly looking for is, you Come know, up, about please. 20 to 25% of the volcanic activity that forms a pillow volcano like this will actually be these more voluminous flows of sheet lava. So the same consistency, same problem with temperature, but maybe just uh, more voluminous, so, so more activity. And those won't form these low, uh, these stacks of uh, lobate pillows. They'll actually form these large horizontal sheets. And we saw just a hint of them the other day where you'll actually see this horizontal transition in these pillows. So instead of seeing all these rubbles and mounds, you might just see a line that goes right through the middle of the screen. And that's important because it might indicate oh, the yeah. beginning yeah, of one of these uh, individual eruptive events. So they're kind of these individual eruptive events. I'll stop. And what is, what is that on the right? Sorry. So these are the hyalinema or hyalinematid sponges. So okay. two or three of them we've just passed. Um, they're, you know, the sponge body, the main filtering part is on the top of this long silica stock, or maybe, I'm not sure if that's multiple silica fibers or one. Mm -hmm. There is this one interesting genus, I don't think it's these ones, called monorhaphus, where it does have one silica fiber, and it's, you know, it's like a centimeter more in diameter, and its optical pure properties are so pure Have that uh, engineers are studying it yeah, because it can transmit it. Uh, light mm. better than the ones that we can artificially make. So they're I trying to understand well, how does the sponge gonna hit the break put down these, yep. uh, I guess, essentially what, I don't know if they're called crystals, okay. but these Our molecules cult, yeah. of silica to form this... Uh, really pure structure that can transmit light so well. Well, that, that, that's you know that's interesting corollary because uh, in in igneous uh, petrology and igneous mineralogy. So by igneous, I mean uh, rocks it's that are formed same, through eruptions right or right? intrusions. Yep, they're really they're in. not formed through Just sedimentary good. processes, and they're not formed through kind of post-depositional uh, alteration or or shearing like um, uh, like metamorphic. Um, but but that's interesting because in terms of silicate structure of those of those sponges, we classify uh, silicate minerals depending on their structure. So are they single chains of silicates? Are they double chains? Are they sheet silicates? Um, and so I, I've always been curious whether so the biological side has a has a corollary. Yeah. And I'd love Scott to answer yeah. me, but he just went to lunch, so.
We're gonna Speed we're gonna look at some welling. more it's beautiful outcrops, the yard. pillow of assaults. Oh really? Yeah. Um, and you I mean, can see you can see these individual still. lobes, and oh. then oh. Really? actually huh. on the right hand side, there's a pillow about uh, halfway down in the screen, and the lasers are just getting to it, and stop right there, and that's actually really interesting because that pillow down there, you actually Pilled see this this curved arch the of the rim. Of the um, and then beneath yeah, that rim, there actually looks to be a screen. hollow space right at the top of it, and there's some sediment that's that's moved in. If we could zoom in on that for a second. Yeah, you can take partial video. And so that that's that's really cool because that's like one down. of these large low bait pillows that had magma and lava flowing through it, and then all of that lava was actually tapped out and moved. All that lava was tapped from another uh, exit and removed from that, that pillow basalt, and that pillow basalt basically like became that empty opening. on the inside, and it, so it just formed this Slide this rind right of that outer outer uh, basaltic crust. Hanging out uh, yep. That's that's really cool. That we we see that th that is the same we'll process the that cave. we see on land that forms lava tubes. So these really big lava tubes that you can actually go and, and walk through. Um, in places like the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park in Volcano, Hawaii, on the Big Island. Shout out. Um, yeah, that's that, that's really cool. And th those are also excellent things to, to try and sample when we get the opportunity. That outer rind, um, we know it's in place. It tends to be a little bit weaker than some of the denser material, and it usually has a, a large um, yeah, concentration video. of volcanic glass that we use for, for downstream analyses. And there's a there's another one for comparison, but you can actually Full see it's a it's a lot wide. more dense, and it's actually got multiple yeah, levels within that here. table, um, and so that means that kind of there was probably a, a variety of of removal events of magma through there over a short period of time. And just for some some geological jargon, uh, you know, we we tend to use two words, lava and magma, um, and they're they're both. Uh, Chemically Big identical. Um, your, uh, the only HG2 difference is, is we, we use the word lava when things have actually been erupted uh, on the surface, whether it's subaerially or you know in the air or submarine in the ocean. And then we use the magma up, uh, to describe anything background. that's never really erupted uh, onto the surface and is only in the crust or, or in uh, kind of the, the sediment in this case, depending on when it was erupted. Creeping out on it, really. yep. And so we're just we're just going through a an ROV watch change. The ROV pilots sit Take set shifts more. of okay. between two to three hours. Can um, you anchor up in that position? The entire yeah, ROV team gets swapped out, yeah, get um, and so they do a kind of an exchange of information um, for situational awareness. Um, and below, that's our our three uh, ROV operators. That's the ROV pilot who operates the ROV Deep Discover, our ROV co-pilot who operates the ROV Sirius, and then our navigator. And we're all from uh, the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. Yeah, and as, and as Roland said, they're, they're all part of this partnership with NOAA Ocean Exploration and the Global Foundation for Ocean for Exploration, all right. who brings out a, an amazing uh, ROV team and video team. So way up in my brow. Wow, that's sort of cool to see, though. <laughs> All right, Ron, let me leave this, and I'll get uh, Sean in here. Okay. You're still full wide.
Hey, Nav, Copat. Welcome aboard, pilots. Video. Yeah. Classic. Hey, watch it. Uh, we just did a quick pilot change. I think I heard uh, there might be interest in a sample around here. You betcha. I just came running back from my room. Um, if we could get a close-up of that uh, multi-branching thing, it's a coral, and I couldn't tell from where I was. What's that line? Behind it? Yeah. Is that just a, like a really tall sponge or something? Coral, I think. Okay. I'm going to snap real quick video. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's a carnivorous sponge. Oh, my goodness. Look how tall really it is. Big. Yeah, it's too bad I plated it already, but it's going to sit there. Huh. Well, I don't know how tall that is, but I don't know that I've ever seen one that tall. Uh, but, yeah, in the foreground here, <coughs> excuse me, this large branching thing. Let's get a look at that, see if I can determine what it is. I mean, it's a coral, but I don't know if it's a primnoid coral or bamboo coral. At first, I assumed it was bamboo coral, but down slope, we saw there was that dead skeleton kind of on a lying on a rock, and I suspect it was kind of like this one. The Can way this is branching, to the scene? I would kind of expect it to be a Should primnoid, uh, but it's not one that I recognize. Let's see. Like Fortunately. Yeah. I've been disconnected, so I have to reconnect. Looks like we're stopped, right? Copy. All right, video. Uh, tell me what you need. Okay. Lasers yeah. off. So bright on top compared to the bottom. Okay, so indeed, this is a from the family Primnoidae. And I've actually been really surprised that we haven't seen more from this family uh, during the expedition. This is one of the most diverse families in the deep sea in terms of the number of genera and species that Could have been described. And it has, it belongs to this subgroup uh, of octocorals called the Calcaxonia. The those bit? are octocorals yeah. whose skeleton we'll out, so is largely protein-based but has uh, quite a little Maybe high amount of calcium carbonate percent. deposited Let's in it. So the, the bamboo coral, the chrysogorgias, the primnoids all belong to that group. So they have pretty stiff skeleton. You can kind of see that yeah, here. It's okay. not waving very much. Oh, uh, Primnoids are the ones right that have the um, scale-like body. So, yeah, if we could take one of the branches of this. Um, the branch point itself isn't hugely critical. It's not like this has nodes. Yeah. Uh, but it would be nice just to be able to get a piece of it if possible. Can I get a small piece and put it in the suction jar? So we don't it's take a box not very we... flexible. Okay, understood. We'll put it in a box. Yeah. Do we have um, all the boxes open? We go full screen. <coughs> yeah, we have no bio yet. Copy. Put your lasers on one more time. Get with the base there. Yeah, we can see the hold fast probably about five centimeters across. Um, I'm looking at the white part. Um, it might be yeah, even bigger. That's slightly there. browner. Maybe even eight Full centimeters white. apart. Okay. The two laser dots are ten centimeters. See how to set up here. Pilot, are you? I'm kind of anticipating you grab something from the top there that's uh, sticking up, or are you? Is it easier for you to go down low? You said uh, lights off. Probably top. Yeah. It okay. might take me a second to uh, sit down though. But yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start you up get set sample. up and then, yeah, we'll confer. Sounds good. Yeah, the last move ended 17 or 18 minutes ago, so should be stationary, co-pilot. Copy.
These are just clear. Okay, that leaves coming off, so I think I can grab it and then I might just hop up to the flatter part to open boxes. Sound good, Kapat? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. I can watch it down here. You look like you're clear on kind of all directions except forward, obviously. Yeah, copy that. All right, our hydraulics up. We're ready. All right. Arms come live, three, two, one. Arm is live. So while the pilot's getting setting up here, I'll just uh, reiterate. So this isn't a family primnoidae. Um, I'm not certain what genus, I can try to look that up, but what's so remarkable is the size of it for this depth. Yeah, watch it. If I just go for this top piece, is that? Yeah, the top. I prefer the the top piece that has a branch point in it. You see, it's the one one down from the topmost one. I don't know if you can slip in there or if that's on the back one side. One down. Yeah, so I'm looking at that yeah, top so like curvature. Top one goes yeah. like just below it, I see there's right one that's it. got a bifurcation in it that's not too deep. But just go ahead and take. Okay. Uh, let me get closer and let me know what you think. Sure. I can't tell from the 3D nature if you would have to go in behind or... I also don't have a good sense of the size. Yeah, I'm looking at this. Right there, you see. Yeah, all three are, yeah. Yeah, that's perfect, Pilot, right there. Kind of like that? Yep, and that should cut pretty easily. It'll come up in two pieces, but that's okay. So we so, yep, exactly. So what you see is it's coming in two pieces. We got two different branches, but the lower one or the one on the left, you've got the branch point as well. So that's great. Okay. Thank you. Looks like there might be, I don't know if that's a brittle star in the end or one of those uh, radialarians. I think it's one of the radialarians that floats by. Do you want to get a quick zoom of this video and then we'll kind of reposition for a box? Another thing about Primnoidae, uh, you can see here nicely in this uh, in this close-up, one of the characteristics that you use is whether the polyps are oriented up or down. These are all pointed down, and that's a great view. You can see that there are lines going from the end of the polyp down towards the base, and what you're seeing are the edges of the scales that make up the base. They almost look like a series of rings. And even the tentacles have their own little scales on top of them. It's very much like a suit of armor in this group. Great view. Look at that, the one, those polyps at the end. You can see that really clearly. I wonder if this is a Norella. I'm seeing three rows of scales. Um, we could almost identify this from this in situ video. It's so good. Three rows of scales and then there's some upright ones that are associated with the tentacles themselves that are called opercula. Thank you. That's great. Okay, so yeah, at this point, I'm just gonna uh, move a little bit so we can open the drawer. Understood, I did have a, a request from Shore to look at something else that's in the area, so let's not go too far, but I understand the Copy that. operation. Thanks. Understood. So, Kopai, can you put up Sirius Cam again? So I'm just going to hop over here real quick. Sorry for the dust.
Gotta push forward a little more, see if I can get altitude lock. Otherwise, I'll just kind of set down. Sounds good. Right there, you're getting bottom lock. Copy that. Let me see if that holds. Good. I think this will fit in the starboard inner. It's, it's kind of long. Starboard inner. Or starboard outer. Um, I'd have to like. Yeah, it might be kind of tricky to like. Versus. I guess you could rotate jaws, but uh, I don't know. Probably just put it in a port. Yeah. Okay. I'll go port side. Go port. Copy. And then you can uh, put your, when you're ready, your... Uh, let this back up. Okay, so pushing for out. Are we ready for that? Yes, sir. Okay, out all the way. Nice. Give it a second. Okay, you can go ahead and close. All right, great. So you can see one of the things that's uh, kind of challenging about that coral we just looked at, Excellent. one of the things that was interesting was the branching point. And what I just saw there is the, uh, after it branches, then it grows for a very long time before it branches again. And so that actually created a bit of a challenge for the ROV pilot because it was so long that it gets a little bit difficult to maneuver into the bio box, but did that very nicely. So we have that collection in port outer. Thank you, pilot. Yeah, of course. Okay, arm is off. Okay, changing the monitor. Uh, are we keeping any suits up or down? Um, I'll put it up. Add it down for the sample. Just put it back there. And then you want me to backtrack a little, Watchley? There was well, something of interest. Yeah. So I unfortunately was keeping my records here, so I didn't notice. I saw when you were stowing that there's a bamboo coral on the left, but I'm not sure. I've just asked Shore for clarification on what else they wanted to see. But okay. Do you want me to just kind of move back? And sure. In general. Yep. Thank you. I yep. would pilot. Port outer, right? Copy. Yes, yeah. Outer. O2B. There's a really good indication here of how fine the sediments are. This is basically uh, from the thruster action. We have some of the sediments being moved up into the water column, and they're really, really small particles, and so they create these uh, clouds. Yeah, not much current down here, as you can see. I kicked some up a little bit ago, and it's just kind of... Uh, Hanging, hanging around. Yeah, that's really another good observation. So pilot is noting that there's not very much current. If the current was really strong, then you know this would essentially be quote unquote blown away or moved um, out of our field of view. But the fact that it's hanging here 
is telling us that the currents are not very strong. Um, so on shore, they're saying it was to the right of the fan that we just collected. Copy that. Just back up a little bit. We're getting kind of a different view of these uh, pillow features that uh, Ashton has been discussing so much. You can see them from the top, um, arranged in these linear fashions, and now we're getting to the front side where they're cut. It must be this one that's just come into view. It almost looks purple. I wonder if, is this what you mean, Asako? Yeah, it must be, because there's the large one we just collected off to the left. So just below the lasers now. Copy that, getting closer. This one's going to be a tough one to image because it's growing out of the rock towards us. Yeah, I can try to get low and kind of look up. Okay. It's another thing I'm noticing, you know, as we're changing our position in the water column, for me, the distance to the coral and the amount of light that we had on it, the lighting changes a lot. And so, you know, your initial instinct is to call it something based on what you think it is because oh it's got this color and this shape and now as i see it better you know it's clearly white and not blue or purple okay video you want to come in i'll bet this is another uh primnoid octocoral again the primnoidae are really common in the deep sea and when we get really deep they start to take over this is it right yep this okay. is absolutely it and so again notice all the polyps are kind of droopy and they're drooping downwards and um, if you look at the bases of the polyps where they're attached to the skeleton, they're coming off it's, uh, three or four blacks. together. That's called a whorl. A dust in the so this is uh, yeah. another primnoid. Is I don't burn. know that it's the same as the one we just collected, but there you go. And so Ashton is back. Perfect timing. We just finished with that collection. We got it stowed, and you are ready to resume your journey. All right. Let's make waves. Thank you, pilot. Copy that. Video all set. Yep. Probably nothing too good with all the dust. All right, we'll keep moving forward. Yeah, and uh, let's uh, let's lay some tracks and move at. Um, I would say almost move Should at the speed you moving? feel comfortable with. Pilot. Copy that. We'll uh, we'll do that. Yeah, let's get ahead. So nav with general directions. Just kind of. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be good to characterize kind of this um, step uh, before we know exactly, but I think for now, like southwest is good, so two, four, zero or something like that. Um, waypoint two is pretty much, yeah, two, two, three, five, two, four, zero. Copy. Yeah, I mean, it looks, looks clear, yeah. Yeah, do we do? 30 meters, 240. Sure. And then yeah. recalibrate. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. And, and so if you're, if you're just yep. joining us, we're, uh, we're coming up to on this right flatter portion of the first little hill before the large rise of the slope that we're going to be ascending. Um, okay. I'm and so I expect it to be much more sedimented um, for the next 20 or 30 meters while we're on this flat portion until we get to that hill. And we'll probably try and... Um, make up some ground and try and get over some of this quickly. You can see in the bottom left some of this uh, uh, crust yeah, of those pillow basalts I was talking about, how when the pillow basalts are formed, off. there's an eruption underwater this one? on the surface, yeah. yep. and and that pillow uh, forms by lava flowing through a tube-like structure, almost a big lobe. And we saw some of those elongate pillows. You see one of these elongate it's pillows good lighting on in the Sirius's foreground. View. And then sometimes that lava, it breaks out into a new little toe of a pillow, and that evacuates kind of the, that the lava that was in that currently yep. formed one. And so what you do is you actually get an to, evacuation of material. Gone, but, but that, that okay. uh, harder outer surface has always been, had already been cooled and quenched yeah, by seawater, so it forms this, this beautiful up. crust. Um, and so you get these features that almost look like they're, they're little hollow eggshells other guys. Of, of lava. And then an, another one of these sponges on the lower left. I think we saw one of these earlier. Can we uh, maybe tilt up on Sirius and 
sort of zoom in since we've got a nice side shot. We and so one of the, the really interesting questions is, is we're, we're definitely on some type of, of pillow volcano. And it doesn't look to me that it's that what we're looking at Tilt down has so formed that, uh, or has been exposed through I'm a sorry, faulting serious? process. So we're, we're not seeing the same Good. type of uh, highly fragmented pillow basalt outcrops that we saw on some of these uh, previous dives where everything looked you know, more fractured and broken out, um, from just that, yeah, that shearing out. force of the faulting Three surface. Um, it Three looks much nice. more uh, in place. And it and looks much C1. more like a, a nice stack okay. Uh, of lavas. Now, of course, the, the entire again. upper so portion of the oceanic clear. crust is, is pillow basalt. So you can imagine the first uh, one to two kilometers of the first mile of, of oceanic okay. crust are actually we, erupted pillows terrible? that have just been erupted on top of each other and I mean, on top of each when, other. When did, uh, but in those previous started. areas, we were looking at places where that uh, uh, crust has been yeah. fragmented all right, all and moved you. in a in a faulting mechanism. Um, so you can imagine the same type of faults that form large earthquakes. Um, here, zoom at that I don't yeah, think I see that. What I, what I see is actually just that primary there. exposure of pillow basalts. And so that looks like a, that one of those little crusts of, of that outer pillow basalt surface that's been, been tilted over. It's a jelly to the left. Lots Box of little, little brittle, brittle stars on it, and yeah, then the jelly. Yeah, you can see how light the current is. He's moving pretty slow. He's not moving at all. A little bit. Nice. No, totally still. Yeah, the the current. You're also listening to our to our ROV crew. The, the, the current looks pretty still. The this jelly you? doesn't seem to be getting That's moved around laterally in any opposition. Light on the thrust, kind of just kick up, uh, beautifully floating. Dust. That might be a little slow. Yeah, so I'm definitely moving now. So maybe like oh, you four are? minutes. Mm. Okay, good. Having to both iris and focused. Beautiful float. Good job, pilot. That was all truck. All right. I was. I saw some dolly. Whenever you're set, video. Let me know, and I'll uh, kind of move away. Video's clear. Okay, we'll keep moving. Lasers coming back on. All right, co-pilot's moving. Yeah, it's quicker than I thought it would be. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to tell because we're still heaving. So I, I was looking at that rock right there, and it's yeah, almost out of view. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think we moved a little bit, although I'm seeing it again. So not sure. <laughs> And it's amazing to me just how quickly the exposed <coughs> seafloor changes from when we're on those slopes where we saw all those beautifully exposed pillow basalts to this flatter portion, which is just much more blanketed with these marine sediments. Pilot. Hey, Nav. Cool go. Hey, Nav. Sorry about that handoff earlier, Sean. It was didn't put you in the greatest spot. <laughs> no, this is great. Uh, yeah, we have a 30 meter move in. Understood. I think Sirius just started. Go ahead, Rich. Understood. Yeah, we're definitely moving now, for sure. The ship is all stopped, pilots. Copy. So maybe I would say maybe five, four, four to five minutes. Copy that. You just start moving? Yeah. It's not bad. Gonna rotate down. I'm gonna come back up a little bit. Oh, right, you got this nice big flat flat step here, huh? Yeah, we're just kind of pushing forward. Traversing um, it? Yeah. We're just going to go like 240 and hopefully we find uh, the next slope too soon. So the offset was about 30 meters from when we acquired bottom. Is that or, offset is in depth? No, 
um, to boil that. It was about 15 meters in depth. Yeah, from what we were seeing on hatback to what we we're actually seeing. Okay, it's not bad. So right now, turns. You're almost. So serious has a full turn. One turn, yeah. Oh, so I would have to like go to, to starboard, do. full turn, and you then to go port, full turn. You need to put negative in right now to zero out. Yes, that. you're right. Yeah. Port, full turn, and then you have to do. So I go like this. It's like if you were going like this. So you do that. So you have to do... And so again, we're just on this... I guess just half? Lower to that port put, hill feature. That would put me at a positive, so then I would on do... Half, yeah. half to port. Yeah, you got it. Lower okay. slopes of this much larger, uh, likely pillow volcano. And this this entire pillow volcano that, that we're looking at... Um, I was right the first time. It's right. about... 30 meters. It's about 200 meters high. Um, and it's you know, maybe. Um, to the right. Yeah, come up to that. I think it's just at my reach. Maybe a quarter uh, of that is, is over there, new construction, and then a lot of that is probably partially exposed that old way, pillow basalt volcanism. It, it's hard to tell just based off of the bathymetry and our limited visual observation that we're able to acquire when we're diving. So part of that will also um, can be told when we get geological samples and we, we hopefully age date them. Um, and right now, since we're on this flatter portion, we're just in an area where much more marine sediment has an opportunity to accumulate. And so that's that's that white background that you see. That's all likely primary uh, calcareous sediment. So sediment that's, that's derived from uh, uh, marine organisms in the upper water column in the photic zone uh, producing uh, calcite, that's calcium carbonate, structures as part of their exoskeleton, so their, their, their tests and their shells. Just watch it, can we snap on this real quick just while we're waiting for Sirius? Is that a question for Watchley? Yeah, Watchley, did you copy that? Yep, go for it. Okay, go snap real quick video. Uh, Full screen. Got that. Sounds good. And when did that move end now? That move ended four minutes ago. Copy that. So let's see. Uh, do you see anything in sonar? I don't see anything on blue view, sonar, nowhere. There's okay. Nothing. Do we do another 30 meters? I would be fine with it. 240. Sure. Understood. Bridge RV now. on that uh, coral. Hey, Bridge, I'd like to request a ship move, please. Range three pass. zero meters, bearing two over. zero four yep. degrees, bearing zero decimal two knots. So I'm going to explore this edge to the left real quick, see if there's anything. And so if you're, two, if you're also listening to our degrees. ROV channel, um, or the, uh, the audio, <coughs> the way the ROV moves oh, good copy. is it... Um, it's a two-body ROV system, so there's an ROV that's driven by our ROV pilot, and that's the ROV Deep Discover, where you're seeing the video from right now. And then there's a second ROV driven by our ROV co-pilot, Sirios. And the ship moves, and by moving the ship, we move Sirios, which is attached to the trip through a uh, near vertically downward cable. Oh, nav, or sorry, video, I'd be latched. You want to unlatch And it. then from Sirios 
to Deep Discover, there's yeah, a tether. Yeah, by default, you guys shouldn't and be listening to me because I could be talking to a bunch of people. Within a radius I'll of that tether around Sirius. I'll always interrupt you guys when I want to talk to you. And so okay. I had right you now, latched we're kind of on this forcing the NDO. flat area, yeah, latch, yeah. heavily sedimented. Uh, yes, I'm we're always listening, our so ROV you don't have to have forward-looking sonar to look for hard returns. Bathymetric structures that might indicate the beginning of that slope. But you can imagine, in order to move to that slope, we have to know where it is because we can't move the ship too far or too quickly because that will move Sirius too far or too quickly. And that can potentially move Deep Discover into a place where, you know, it, it goes somewhere it doesn't want to do, it goes right into the slope. So what we do is we, we slowly move. I think the it's ship a good idea what you did and slowly when you were move sampling, Sirius. Um, to put up um, the. Until we can stage. see the so return of that slope to, obvious, yeah. Yeah. in the forward like this sonar. Right. And then once we know where yeah. that slope is and, and how far away from there it, at that camera we can kind of had my view, uh, so I pick a place right my next view to it and move safely to it. At the same time, so yeah. Working That's in areas where there's really hard, uh, really large vertical relief is, is especially always a little, a little daunting. And it, it takes some excellent ROV pilots. There's another one of those little small black fish on the bottom left that we saw earlier. I think we've seen three or four of those now. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think we're just on the top of this little uh, hill that sits at the foot of this larger slope that we are going to try and zip up. Yeah, well, I want to get to the top. You got to think about where all this, all these volcanic pillows come from. Well, um, can you zoom out a little bit, Nav? How far are the waypoints or where we're heading to? I uh, believe you are 200. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what. Uh, I mean, let me see what waypoint is being selected. Yeah, yeah standby. 463, but where's that at? Okay. And then is there like a waypoint 3 and 4 and 5? Okay. It's a 3. 3 is at the top. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. So 463, quite a ways off. You want me to just roll another 30 as soon as that move is complete? Uh, we Let's can. Let's leave a couple minutes in between. Understood. Just so we don't stack too many. So if we can trust the bathy, it's about 150 meters of flat on this step here. Copy that.
Go ahead, Rich. Good copy. Thank you, Rich. All right. That move is complete. Give it a few more minutes. Yeah, sounds good. Do you want to put a uh, serious sonar to 80 meters out? See if we can pick anything up. So he put it yesterday at 385 kilohertz. How far actually can we trust um, like those readings? So I think that's just th I think those are occurring because it's a lack uh, it's a lack of returns. Okay, so but you think if we see something at 60, like we can trust that it's there? I guess yeah, if we got like a bright return, I would trust it. Okay. Based on what we've been seeing with screws. All right. This, though, is just all this is yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of does that. But it just can't find anything. Okay. It kind of colors it in that way. So I'm looking, let's see, that's straight west. So this, this little, thin little valley-like feature that, that's just below us is kind of interesting. There was kind of this long um, trench that we've kind of been going over for a little while, and they're kind of almost like little pillows, fragments that have fallen into that. And that looks like, it, it almost looks like it might be a little, a little fault plane, a little fracture surface. Um, and so, you know, if... If the deeper, if one of the deeper falls off is, are you guys actively our, using our the blue left view? side? Then, then yeah. maybe this this okay. feature is, is straight out trying to find uh, some type of slope. Yeah, maybe this feature is part of this this failure surface. Um, All right, so I should be stopping, like within thirty seconds or so. Yeah, we gotta um, figure out what to do next. So, let's see. It's actually dropping. Yeah. Okay. So this is to. I'll line up with you. So if, if we range out the blue view, it's already 60. Like 70. See if it picks anything up. So, so for situational awareness, at least in the 3D scene, it looks like we're near the top of a hill, and it's going to drop off everywhere around us until we get to that next larger slope. So we're 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 not necessarily on a flat. We're on a we're on a little hill. Yeah, it goes back down until it hits that slope and goes back up. And so what the ROV is doing right now is it's, it's kind of just looking around and both uh, visually but also with its forward looking sonar, it's trying to find where that slope is ahead of us because it, um, we want to know where it is, but we also want to know how far away it is um, so that we can move the ship appropriately. Hey, watch leads. So, yeah, we're just kind of discussing what we want to do next. Um, yep. We're kind of 
that you see it's kind of dropping off here. Yep. This is the direction based on uh, bathymetry, the way we want to go. Uh, but it looks to just drop off. And we're not picking up anything in our sonars yet. And based on high pack, it's uh, the next slope, it would be too far for our sonars to pick up. Um, so the only thing we can think of is just uh, keep pushing forward in blue water. And it might just be blue water for a little bit till we get to the next slope. Yeah, that 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 that's perfect. That's that's kind of what I was expecting. Looking at the flader mouse scene, you know, looking at the 3D, it looks like it's um, you know it might be a hundred meters from the top of this hill to the foot of the slope. Yeah. Um, and you know maybe even a depending on where we are, you know maybe a hundred meters of, of of lateral blue water. But yeah, that's that's kind of what we were expecting. Okay, sounds good. Just want to give you a heads up yep. before we enter into some blue water for a while. Um, all right, so, yeah, let me line up, center with you, co-pilot. Um, I'll put auto depth in. And I'll come up just a little bit. And then, do you want to put your camera at 45? Or you're roughly there. And so if, if you're just joining us, um, you might see us staring off into this murky blue abyss of the deep ocean. And that's because we're at the top of this little hill that's at the foot of this larger slope that we want to explore. And so we are going to jump uh, basically through the water nav, horizontally from this hill until we see the slope and we'll just kind of ahead of us. So we're kind of just, um, those as we you can imagine across. us just kind of yep. hovering so across from this hill Go to, that to the next slope instead of staying on the bottom. So right, I'll just try to stay center with you. We're going to see kind of just what we call blue water. Uh, at just this kind point, of do the you water put, column um, um, for a little bit right. while we do this transit. Head changes. Bridge, are we now? Keep lights as is. Hey, Bridge, I'd like to request the ship move, please. Range three zero meters, bearing two four zero degrees, speed zero decimal two knots. Now, the, the ship is moving right now in about 30 meter increments um, in the direction copy, of the slope. Bridge. And we're probably maybe 100 to 120 meters um, away from the slope horizontally. So it might take three or four ship moves um, until we get to that slope. I now, can't hear you. Now, hopefully, within where you got, uh, where you gonna say two ship to moves, something on two, um, we should hopefully see it within the, the, in. In the blue view. But... Um, it's not going to be a mid-water thing. And so, so that, that blue view sonar that we I have, plan it, on rotating. It, it looks out to okay. to about 80 it meters right light, now. light, so um, I think we're fine. And so right. for 120 we'll meters away, and then just kind of translate like that. And we'll do a 30-meter ship move. Very much then, doubt it. You know, it might be on the fringes huh? of our next I doubt it. Our next move. Well, oh, have some optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, before the cliff, you, uh, um, well, it dropped pretty steeply, right? Yeah. Like the one before it? So depends on, yeah, it depends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it goes past... Well, this would be a good test. Right? Yeah. Although with sandy bottom, I, I don't expect, like, good return when it's farther than maybe 20 meters. But we'll see. So that was a 30-meter move? 3-0. Copy. How fast, Sean? At yeah, decimal one meters per second, step down. Decimal two? You want to try decimal two? Decimal two. Engaged. Yeah, watch it for reference. That's uh, referencing the ship's actually moving. Um, ship's moving what? Decimal two? It is decimal okay, two. Yeah. So what we were just talking there was the uh, autopilots. We can. Um, engage with the vehicles. Uh, they can be good with uh, in situations of blue water like this where we can still maintain um, an altitude lock. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can kind of uh, set in a step size, which is a distance and like a step rate, which would be like a rate of travel. Um, and then kind of use that to maneuver as opposed to uh, manually, which is what we traditionally do. Yeah. Autopilot engaged. I like it. Let me try yeah. that. The secret is we've been an autopilot this whole cruise. <laughs> we don't advertise that. Science autopilot engaged. That's right. 
that's when you're supposed to just start talking, Scott. Well, but I'm not sure what the auto mode is. No. It could be that I'm in deep thought and relaxing. I thought it was you pick your favorite uh, sponge, yep. and then you tell us it's a taxonomical breakdown starting at the very top. Uh, that yep. is definitely not it, but I As can tell you this. Here's something that Ken Sulak uh, chimed in about earlier. So Ken Sulak, uh, formerly of the USGS, now retired um, expert on deep sea fishes. And at about, let's see, 10, oh, a couple hours ago, just before lunch, we saw that rat tail looked mm -hmm. like a big head and a long yep. tail. And he said so that move, that looked a little bit like Coryphenoides rupestris, autos, but it's too deep move, for right? that species, and the coloration does not match. So another for possibility is the genus Ventrafossa. It's the first time I've ever autos, heard of that genus. Um, that also has autos, a rounded head and a long tail. Instantly. But there are no species in that genus Should, known yeah, from yeah. deeper than 1,200 meters. So he said... That if is a species that he does not know. I don't hear Ken say that very often. No, I was going to say, that's the first time I've seen it on this cruise. On. Right, well. but he gets back finally to the theme that we said many yeah. times. That's not surprising for him at this depth because there's so few observations auto. so deep here. And we've been saying autos. that about yep. the sponges and the corals. And so while command, you said this well command. before, yep. actually, at the start of the dive, the average depth into the Atlantic is about 3,800 meters. The average depth for the ocean overall is something like 3,682 meters. And we're at 33, which we're considering very deep, but yeah. we're not even at the average. Yeah. <laughs> the ocean is a really deep place, and the number of dives that have been able to take cameras like what we have to get a really good view of uh, the in-situ fauna is relatively low. So we're all and still learning. And in fact, Cindy Van Dover five, said five, something five. really interesting Copy. earlier. <laughs> I had made this comment that you can stack those as well, right? perhaps we yeah. don't need so to spend do as long on the zooms of the holotherians because like historically do. we have collected a number of them by using starboard. benthic trawls, the trawls but over the soft sediment that bring there, these up. It'll kill that. But uh, oh, okay. she was very correct in saying, yeah, but they come That's up with these question. squishy blobs mm -hmm. that have been put in formalin and ethanol, and we look in the museum, they've lost all their color and so on. So, and she's absolutely right. So translating what we know from, you know, Challenger Expedition trawls that were done in 1872 to this fantastic well. imagery that we have now stops. is difficult mm -hmm. at best. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't appreciated that point about color either, because you were saying that a lot of these things that you bring up um, and and Did preserve in, those, in ethanol uh, or formalin will lose their color. The so you don't you don't get an appreciation for just how no, beautiful and colorful the bottom of the ocean is. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed, uh, like if you saw the letter I sent out last really night, but I put current. in a photo really of one of the plexorids that we okay. uh, collected. Now that ethanol is this beautiful blue color, mm -hmm. and that has been leached out well, of the uh, like polyps. The best, yeah. Yeah. Some of these pigments are... Uh, uh, what's the word I want? Soluble? Ship's Thank you. Pilots. That is exactly the word I want. And others are insoluble. Mm. They're bound up in the hard parts. Mm. Lost autos. Darn. It's fun while it lasted. <laughs> How far off the bottom you actually get bottom block? You've been getting bottom block. I've been picking it up intermittently, but uh, Solid, yeah. strong signal, like 99 meters, which is great. Okay. So maybe try to engage them again. Maybe th they will they will hold. When did that move in? Or did Thirty seconds ago. Copy. So yeah, we'll put another one in. Like three minutes. Understood. So I think that should space this out pretty good. I'll still move forward at a quick rate. Hey, Blue, don't be afraid. We'll see sea floor eventually. You needed one more word in there. Um, yeah. Apparently, I missed Dupashna Ganguly's just pointed out I missed a comment that she made. You had asked me before about the rock pins, and I was telling you about mm -hmm. where we saw them. So she says most rock pins have been observed between 1,000 and 2,000 meters, and unfortunately, auto refresh just took that away from me. I have to scroll back up and find it now. Okay. 
1,000, 2,000 meters. The deepest one ever seen was at 3,800 meters, and there goes the auto refresh again. And yeah, watch it's for reference. D2 is about 23 meters above the seafloor right now. Thank you. And I've been maintaining uh, the same depth, so it's significant drop off. If that's of interest. So that uh, was 3,800 meters that we saw in the Atlantic yeah. last year, and she says that. Uh, the deeper observations of rock pens are all from the Atlantic rather than the Pacific. Hmm. Thank you for that. Fifty two sonar out to eighty two. See how it does. I believe like one of those we just didn't trust it past like fifty or something. They've been pretty good this cruise. Okay. I think this one on the higher frequency did better at uh, closer up items. With yeah. the lower frequency. Yesterday, at least, it seemed to pick up. I don't remember how, pretty well. how far were those, though, yesterday. We had it at 80 yesterday, and we were picking stuff up. You oh, saw really? It? Okay. Yeah, you saw uh, yeah it I, I remember it. seeing it, but I just don't remember the range. Yeah. All right, pilots, you want another? Yeah, yep. let's do it. Yep. Bridge, are we now? Hey, Bridge. I'd like to request a ship move, please. Range three zero meters, bearing two four zero degrees, speed zero decimal two knots. And so the ROV team just put in another ship move for Thank another you, thirty meters towards the slope. So it's been and I'm gonna guess that by 25. near the end of the slope, or maybe the middle of this move, um, maybe near the end of it, we might see something on the outer range of the sonar. Got it. So there's a might and a maybe and a probably in there. <laughs> Which means so you're my, predicting there's two best. more moves maybe to that slope. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to move the mini Seuss a little bit down. And, yeah. and so if you're up. just joining us, we that. are on the... Okay. Kirchhoff fracture zone in the mid Atlantic oh, Ridge. Right and this fracture zone is a right Tilt lateral 45. step over Ooh. in the oh, north south running right. trend of the yeah, mid Atlantic Ridge. So, and yeah, so know, how, how far is that? On the though? southern segment 40 meters down of the mid Atlantic at Ridge, that angle, looking northward, makes sense, right? We're you would see up. the entire length of the mid Atlantic Ridge step over, move over about 20 kilometers to the east. Right, so by right lateral so step, right I mean you see that middle bridge move to your right relative yeah. to your and position. And we don't see anything? No. Nope. Now this okay. fracture zone is about 20 kilometers right. wide or long in the east-west direction, separating these two segments. It's called a ridge transform intersection. And we're right in the middle of this fracture zone. And what's interesting about this fracture zone is when we think about fracture zones in general, we think about transform faults. We think about faults that, that move between two surfaces in a direction uh, parallel to the strike of that plane. So you can think about like the San Andreas fault. Um, now what's interesting about this is there might not actually be much transform motion along this fracture zone. And it's been it's referred well. to that it actually might be a source know, of new blocked, volcanism uh, itself. It might be leaky. Nice. It might band. have volcanism that's coming so up in the middle of it. We lost it. And so we're exploring one of the we started on one of the deeper mind, portions um, of it at a depth like of about 3,340 really 3, meters below sea level. Bottom and we're going to try and get to the top yeah, I don't know how sand of this down there. A large yeah. slope that looks to That's be nice, a though. large you could fly pillow volcano. 50 meters off the bottom That's and at, still uh, at a shallowest about 3,130 3, meters below sea level. So about 210 meters of, of rise. Um, it gets quite steep in some places. It's almost up to to 40-ish, 45 degrees in some places, and we just got onto the top of a small little Pretty hill pole, huh? on the like, base of I it. I wonder, because with the ADCP, you can have 
from the top like of this hill bottom block, to the so steep section where of the, the bottom slope. is. Um, but you can so also see flying through like the water like column. Like in the water, there. how fast they're moving. So we're currently at a latitude of I don't 40 know if you could like dot look at a certain degrees north bin of water and, and have that as the, as the reference and see how you're west. moving against it. So pretty much have like auto X, Y when you're not looking at the bottom. I don't know if that would be possible. Oh, so essentially you're tracking the particles in the water? I think the, the at least that workhorse, like there's a mode you can put it so it looks at the water column and it sees. Oh, like, that'd be cool. So I don't know if... Yeah, if there's enough, I mean... Yeah, I don't know how accurate it is, um, but... So you would put like out of depth and then track a layer maybe yeah five meters down or something and well if there's current then yeah there you go so if there's current then it's gonna do who knows what yeah the the, the water column itself looks you can see incredibly uh, still right now distance from you don't see transit. any pervasive currents in any one direction stand by one curious what kind of Layback. Layback right again. About 30 meters. Copy. So yeah, that's great. Just, yeah, move of layback. So we can expect that as we approach slope. What did you collect earlier, Sean? Coral. Starboard, or sorry, port outer. It's kind of long, this is a little awkward. Went in nice though. Go ahead, Bridge. Correct. Depends. Good copy. Uh, Thank you, Bridge. Ships all stop pilots. Depends how much time we have, too. Right? If we have, for aware, and we're in a situation like this with just blue water with no hazards, we could take time and, like, set up correctly. If we're in a rush, you could, yeah, uh, you could ignore the 6 8, turns into 6 8 um, in an emergency, and then just focus on uh, turns in the tether. Or not even turns into tether, just purely focus on streaming. Right, where you could just turn and leave it like that, and then we're in tow. Because also, if you turned right now, let's see, we have a negative. So yeah. It's not ideal, but... Uh, I mean, it's something the tether, like, can do. It's not going to be super happy, but it wouldn't like. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily like risk the health of the tether. If we did that every time, yeah, we'd probably see a, a quicker uh, degradation of the fiber values, and have to swap out or sooner, but. Good. Higher RPM. Those also don't have a. <laughs> like a blade. They're bladeless. High RPM fans.
All right, uh, sonar still look pretty clear. We're looking 80 meters out. So I just got an email Sirs, from closer to the transit, uh, but David USB Clay was at all the over Monterey Bay Aquarium. I don't know that I would uh, too much. And he said he, he snipped yeah, a frame so of the, the weird track. Yeah. I had sent him a Three video clip of yeah, the weird track that we saw on the other dive. And he sent it to uh, their two Ambari benthic biologists. Please. Range three zero meters. You mean the holes? Two, yeah, the holes. Zero zero zero. <laughs> and zero and he said uh, himself, who's been all around the world, and their two benthic biologists at Ambari have also never seen anything like it. Yeah. So the mystery, mystery deepens. Yeah. Yeah. Good copy. Take a picture. I understand the mystery is spreading around the internet. Yeah. With uh, lots of interesting comments being made, and thoughtful comments being made. Yeah, I, it's um, it's amazing how. There are still things that we can observe that completely stump us and are sure. and baffle. Are yeah. yeah, I mean that's that's fantastic. It's, it is. It's a it's a joy to me because it means there's still so much remaining to be discovered, questions to be asked, and it says how little of the planet we've still not seen. And no, I, how much? How little we have seen? How much we have not seen? And and to me, it's it's also amazing just because of. Um, how visible it is, right? It's not like, it's not an unknown question in terms of some strange mineralogical assemblage or some thermal state of a right. rock or some strange... Some biochemical reaction. Yeah, you have to imagine you, what's going yeah, on. Yeah, you, you need a bunch of analyses to ask the question. It's, right. it's you know, 40 feet of holes on the <laughs> seafloor, right? Yep. Mike Vecchion, who's in the chat room right now, he's at the Smithsonian Institution, and he's the one, he and a co-author had published a paper on observations of those so marks Sean, from what's the, uh, ROVs that what's were done in, in 2004 now? from the same general yeah. area. He says that there are that similar sorts like? of marks um, in the fossil record. I was asking record. if you knew what the timing looks like for and the shift now. In the uh, fossil record, you have the sure. ability to look at the rock. You can see the hole from one angle, but then you can also look somewhat deeper. Change and he mid. says that the holes so are connected though, right? by a subsurface tube. Yeah. So that I think it was adds a little bit of information way, to interpreting what the holes yet? are, that something is moving no. under the surface Understood. and Probably. periodically poking up likely through the surface. It sounded like it was likely. Likely. Understood. That's my professional opinion. Uh, let's see. Well, actually, we might have something maybe 80 meters out. We're still pretty far away, though. Just a heads up as far as sonar goes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just I'm just smirking at my my co-scientist because I called it. I the said near, <laughs> near the end of this, at the very fringes of the blue view, we might see something. You're misinterpreting the look on my face because no. what I really want to say is something about those holes. Oh. But I know that it shouldn't. So. Yeah. Yeah, then as far as altitude relative to D2, it looks like we peaked at about 30 meters, and now it looks like it's uh, down to 27 now. So looks like it's trending back down. So it could also indicate we're past the, the deepest section of this little hole we're going over right now. Thank you, thank you. And, and I didn't know if it would be a question or not, but, yeah, just if you could just fly constant altitude to it, no need to you know, get further down on the slope. Oh, we're, yeah, we're staying, uh, yeah, we're just yeah. staying steady. Yeah, perfect. Yep. And we're flying at constant depth. Constant depth. It's also interesting to me that we actually haven't, you know, on this short little transect of 120 meters or so across to the next slope, we haven't really seen much in the water column. Um, yeah, right, so and I'm certainly watching. Yeah. That, is, that is true. We saw, you know, when we were down on the bottom, we saw a couple of uh, jellyfish, and I've been doing some uh, corresponding with folks in the chat room. 
Uh, but Alan Collins, who's also at the NOAA National Systematics Lab at the Smithsonian Institution, and he is an expert in uh, midwater jellies and hydrozoans and various uh, cnidarians. Um, he believes that that is the genus Benthicodon. I may have mentioned that very early on in one of our, our earlier dives, that that is a genus of jellyfish that I believe spends more time settled on the bottom. Mm -hmm. It seems to like vertical faces of rocks and then seems to swim off and land on another rock. And that would explain why we were seeing it. We were mm -hmm. very close to the bottom. Um, so I'm not sure why we don't see more up here. You know, we have done, um, we did a day of midwater tra uh, transects. Oh, just click And we were starting okay. our first set of transects in the benthic boundary right, layer at about 15 meters above the bottom. And we're not that Except much higher. No. At 375. Um, yeah, so reference, really we're, we're probably about yeah, 26 above or 27 it. meters above bottom right, right now. Above this yeah. There's so something right. white coming okay, up, though. Yeah, right. yeah, uh, this might be, oh. this is a solmissus. This looks like some kind of jelly with its tentacles all extended. You can see, it looks to me like what's happening is it's creating a great big field. Good Actually, it may be a foraminifera. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. Ship's all step pilots. Copy. It, are those radiating out spherically? There we go. Yeah. Beautiful. 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 Jellyfish. You can see all the tentacles. This looks like the one Alan described the other day. Maybe not. They had like the sort of stiff tips to the tentacles. You can right see the lines emanating from the center, the darker one part of it is they're basically tubes or canals leading from the central stomach to the margin of the bell to distribute food. And then the brighter orange uh, parts that you see just along part of those lines, those are the gonads that are essentially points. hanging Sorry, down from going, the upper part. Me. Oh, that's yeah, a great that's video. So. Red tape. so yeah, the gonads are kept inside in the gastrovascular cavity for producing the sperm of the eggs. And so Alan says that is that benthicodon that we were just talking mm -hmm. about. So that's, I think, maybe the fifth good view we've had of a benthicodon today. I'm glad that they make cameos right on time. Yeah. <laughs> Cue the benthicodon. Mike will no doubt start asking questions now there. about cephalopods and squid. Yeah, perfect. Kind of matches at 60, that's 50. Maybe so. That's pretty close. Hmm. Down here, you think? Yeah, should we ask? Yeah, why not? Let's be aspirational. And I think we might be, yeah, seeing something in that blue view now. Yeah, you can kind of see, if you yeah. look at blue view and D2 sonar, yeah. you can kind of see some soft items coming into view. Yep. Yeah, those two are definitely the same. But it might be like a very shallow slope because I don't get anything here. Yeah. Which it does, it looks like it's still pretty far out before we get anything like steep. Yeah. When did that move in now? I Two know. minutes ago. Two minutes ago. Understood. You want to do one more 30? See if it gets us there? Yeah. Ready for that? Yeah, you're still getting returns, what, 50 meters? 50 meters out. Yeah. yeah. Bridge, are we now? Hey, Bridge, I'd like to request another ship. Uh, please. Pilot, Bridge, may I ask a Bridge, question? Zero meters sure. Bearing two As we are degrees, moving slowly through the water column else. here, if another one of those jellyfish is coming slowly towards us, are you in a position you could slurp it, or is that not uh, operationally possible? We are not. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. So that's a different configuration. Essentially, we put all our lights up, and uh, different configuration than we are in now as okay. far as uh, mid-water samples go. Okay. Um, okay. And not while we're moving to slope either. Understood. If you Great. really that's wanted to, we'd have to. We could stop the ship and do something like that but no we don't want to do that because that's not the priority thank yep. you that's exactly why i asked yeah of course
I got some information from onshore that uh, Benthicoda, excuse me, Benthicoda hyalinus was described from the Antarctic. And so we're quite far away from uh, the home range of where that species was described, which is why I asked that question about sampling. So perhaps later when we're on the bottom, if we see some again, we may be in a better position. Something else kind of slowly drifting here into the frame. Oh, this is sea cucumber. Well, we're not that far from the bottom then, if we see a sea cucumber drifting by. Six years is just starting to pick something up. Yeah, so at a lower frequency, I can see it at seven, whatever, I cannot. Oh, so the higher frequency. Yeah, like right there. Oh, so yeah, lower frequency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you went higher, you didn't yeah, see like, it. Yeah, like, yeah, you cannot see it anymore. Look, right there, you have like a hint of it. Chris explained to the, at the higher frequency, I think the angles. And then right there. Directed it goes more away. downward. Mm. So I think the angle slightly downward looking essentially for where this one slightly, or the three eight yeah. five is up a little more. Okay, so let's go back to the 300, 385. Okay, so I think I'm pretty safe even with those 30 meters, uh, and even if we have <coughs> accumulated a little bit more from the move, so yeah, copy that. I think I'll be good 20 meters away. Still, yeah, about 40, 40, 40. I'm seeing the bottom now, I think. Yeah. About 22 meters above bottom right now, so it's getting closer. Hey, look, it's the seafloor. It is the seafloor. <clears throat> you know, I was thinking, I wish I'd thought of this yesterday when you asked the question, but you asked me about um, partly why it's important to have all the names of all this stuff that we see. Yeah. And one of the things, 
of course, you know, part of it is we want to be able to record keep, if you want a very prosaic way of looking ahead, at it. Bridge. But I was thinking about uh, diversity a little bit more. Copy, thank you, Bridge. And we've been talking about some of the things different Shit, species do. And the Copy. Part of the interesting right, point is that like every like species that, it, or yeah, every taxon that, like that has been shown meters. to be a different species and has this formal name, a has bit. a different biology, has a different physiology, so has a different way of moving. making its life, perhaps eating, Four interacting minutes. with other organisms. And Four so the understanding two. of that diversity tells us something about how the world works. And if That's you want to like be real meters. practical so I, I about it, gonna um, shows like other here. things we okay. may discover so right that a species 50. has that so might be of I would feel some okay use in calling whatever 10 more, endeavor. but maybe not more than that. So I think that's yeah, part of the importance of it as well. Okay. All right, so now I got another strange question for you. Yep. Um, okay, L let's say we went to another planet and we discovered life. Do you think the first attempt would be to try and class, and let's say it's similar to ours in terms of, you know, it needs some type of photosynthesis, it builds a, you know, maybe a carbon-based structure. Water, um, do you think we would try <laughs> and classify it within our current taxonomical system, or would we develop a whole new That's one, or have people even thought about there? Are there exobiologists who sit at home wondering these questions day to night? Sure. What, one of the, th so there's two points to classification and systematics. And one is just organizing things. Mm -hmm. So give it a name. And it would be easy for us to put a name on yep. something that's foreign. And you know, you're sort of more or less done with it. Yep. The more interesting part of that is the systematics part is understanding where did that thing come from and how does it relate to everything else we see. So what I would see is somebody would want to answer the question, does that life have any relationship to the life on Earth? Mm -hmm. Can we trace back far I mean, enough in history know to know if we had a common origin this on hole, Earth, on the planet went we went to, or like on some third planet? Meters, so yeah. so we should I think see that's like where we would go. And, and, point and we could potentially do that through uh, DNA sequencing? or Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, assuming it was a DNA sequence-based yeah. 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 organism or even a carbon-based organism. And if it wasn't, then we would have to develop a whole new classification scheme um, based yeah. on whatever hierarchical nature of how that set of species evolved. Mm -hmm. I mean, they should follow the same okay, rules, so you know. If you survive, more meters, so the I mean, characteristics more, that I you had that we, allow we you that to survive like should be passed on. That's one of the definitions of life is that ago. there's a set of instructions that gets passed on to replicate that All life. Right, so. Mm -hmm. so I think whatever yeah. basis that life oh, took, it should meters. follow that model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, I, now, I, I, I don't zero. really know anything about genetics. My, Me neither. My, my, little, oh, genetics, oh, okay. my, my little brother's a, a Ph.D biochemist, microbiologist, yeah. Um, and so he You're studies... you have to listen to him more I know. it sounds like. He studies a lot of genetics and, and epigenetics. So, you know, oh, yeah. not necessarily what the genetic structure of something is, but what genes are turned on and expressed. So do you have yeah. similar things in the in the deep ocean in terms of how there might be differences? I don't... Uh, well, there are certainly um, epigenetic markers in mm. deep sea organisms, for sure. Um, I don't think we understand a lot about yet... S simply because these are hard organisms yeah. to collect, yeah. right? And so yeah. it's, let's work with uh, what's a little bit easier as yeah. we, uh, we fully understand. Today. Epigenetics as a field isn't oh. all that new, a couple yeah. of decades. We're, We're making a lot of advances now schedule. in how we can understand it. But uh, for those of you who aren't, this is a new field. Basically, if you think about DNA, which is a ribonucleic, uh, excuse me, deoxyribonucleic acid, it's a series of nucleotides that are put together that can be read kind of like uh, words in a sentence that provide instructions. And there's a biochemical basis for translating those instructions into proteins. Epigenetics refers nice. to other uh, small like. chemicals that are attached to the DNA that affect how the DNA is read, or if it's read, if it's expressed. And it's, uh, oh, cool. I still don't know you enough, I don't understand enough about the do. way that they are passed on. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about it is I know that you could have epigenetic markers added to your DNA during your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And if that's passed on, that means a change that you acquired is actually passed on, which is kind of antithetical to the way we yeah. thought about evolution for yeah. a long period of time. Um, so absolutely, that's going to be going on in these organisms. They have the same kind of DNA, uh, but I don't know the extent to which they're well, used. Maybe, maybe some 
young kid watching will get excited and become a deep sea epigenetic biologist. Absolutely. There you go. That's one to convince your parents to become. I just yeah. I just had a student, Lauren Walling, who graduated with her master's um, last summer, I believe, and she was really interested in epigenetics. And I said, well, that's just not something I study. But mm -hmm. if you're interested and you can think of a way to ask a question and answer it in this lab, let's do it. And she did. She came up with a great question. Nobody had ever looked at it in mm -hmm. octocorals or deep sea octocorals before. And so she did her thesis um, establishing that, indeed, these octocorals do have these epigenetic moieties, and we could quantify them mm. to some degree. Nice. Yeah. Very interesting. Great. She's now in a PhD program in Florida uh, doing more work on epigenetics. We have sound velocity up. Good for her. Well, and there's the, there's the slope we've been looking for. Okay, yep. Let's yeah, see so more rocks, a little bit more sediment, yeah. another sponge. So more, more of these, so. uh, what I think are actually uh, in place stacks of pillow basalts. Um, I don't think, I think there's some fragments in there, but you can see that a lot of these bulbous and lobe-like structures don't look heavily fragmented. They don't look like they've fallen down as a rubble pile. They just look like they've been built there as a stack and then, yeah. and then draped over with sediment. Um, another way we can tell that they're likely in places, we can actually just look at our, our 3D uh, bath bathymetry scene and we can look at the slope what do you have for winds of these areas, and these slopes tend it's to be, been you know, about 15 right to, to 25 degrees. And that's the typical slope that we expect for lava that's I mean, erupted uh, underwater. So On land, like in Hawaii or in the Azores, yeah, well, like this nine. type of lava, uh, basaltic lava with this composition and this silica content ahead, um, is erupted sub aerially it's fairly much. fluid and so it tends to spread out much more it tends to spread more like uh, like hot runny more, pancake syrup right spread over a pancake it'll, here, it'll flow over think. the entire pancake or the entire finished. background environment uh, and that tends to have slopes of, of you know 2 to 6 out. degrees you know 3 degrees is a close. is a good ballpark Coffee. for the angle um, of the lava that it'll build a feature of sub aerially underwater that syrup is a lot thicker, I think I should um, it's a lot colder, and so it tends to like stack up and get a little higher so. angle. If we're looking oh. at features that are built Copy off that. of talus, then we kind Can of look at something called the angle of repose, and that's the kind of the natural angle that a slope will build up if you're just piling on loose, unconsolidated material, and that's, that's significantly higher. That might be 35 degrees in some areas, 40 degrees. So, you All know, right. looking at those Roger, three kind of ranges of yep. slopes we can tell is this is this a primary surface that was underwater is this nah, a primary surface that was sub-aerial and uh and within the okay. air or is it just a talus slope field oh Two that's zero. really interesting uh, yeah. it gives me some insight I mean, better insight into how you can look at these uh, yeah. maps and know, you know something like, or predict something about the geology it's not or the origin at least yeah, yeah so that was that was actually my my yeah, first master's when i was at the university of hawaii about 15 years ago was was mapping geophysically where the locations of the old volcanoes, these yeah, five million year old we're volcanoes already, were looking at variations in the gravitational fire, field, but then also looking at the seafloor topography, the bathymetry, and yeah, looking at profiles across the seafloor to try and find out where the paleo shoreline was. So the old shoreline uh, that uh, represented the separation between the ocean and the subaerial eruption. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, Scott. Scott's pointing at Wisp, and I got <laughs> sidetracked for a second. Uh, that that indicated that slope change between subaerial erupted lava and submarine erupted lava. That's now you know, 20, 30, 150 meters below sea level, um, currently. What I'm seeing here look to be the remnants of uh, Poseidon squeezing his toothpaste uh, tube. Oh, there you go. All over the place here. Um, I was pointing at the screen because I'm really pleased to see that right in front of me there are at least four large uh, coral colonies. Um, and a fish over the side. So we've jumped over to this slope, and it's nice to see that we're essentially going to be continuing what we've been observing um, earlier. It's good stuff. Yeah, we're almost there, watch it. Yep. Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> that was Scott, not me. I, I mean, that was Scott, me, I, not Ashton. <laughs> Another sea cucumber. All right. I'd call this pretty good. Yeah, we're only four meters off bottom watch lead, so I think uh, we can start again. Yeah. Let's uh, grip it and rip it. Sounds Fun good. it and gun it. Ship's still moving, Unless too, so we'll keep... Uh, no, no, yeah, okay. we can go. Yeah, this is all stuff I think we were seeing down below. I was uh, just looking closely water. there because I was noting that there's a lot of stuff in the water column, right? We got a lot of marine snow. Mm -hmm. 
but we've heard from the pilots and we can kind of see it ourselves that the current isn't all that strong. But I guess that's why there's so much sediment on the mm -hmm. seafloor. It's sinking down instead of being scoured away. But, but yeah, but then again, you know, it goes back to that question of, you know, what's kind of maybe the primary influence? Not necessarily that there has to be one, but you can look at these pillows, which look like they were, you know, more or less erupted in place here, and they're not covered with five, six, seven sure. centimeters of sediment. It's just yeah, kind of a point. light draping. Yep. Um, but, de but definitely around them, so it, you know, some of it's definitely getting scoured off kind of the, the little local uh, bathymetricized, the, the rugosity of the surface, how rough it is. So, of course, we don't know what the depth of the sediment is, like on this part yeah. here. This could be a really deep, quote-unquote, ditch you yeah. know, channel. The sea poke. We need a long sea poke. Can you guys try to uh, disperse the lighting a little more? It's really hot, sort of in the center, but not in the distance. Uh, let's see. All arms are out, so we could try to dim them, the swing arms, uh, or dim the, like dimming, the mains. Uh, maybe dim the mains. Yeah, if we Don't dim them all, that won't give me any more distance. Okay. Um. That's like six, fifteen percent less. That's better. I can see further out now. I can iris up more, and the front isn't blown out. Copy. Copy that. Seeing the shadow cast by Sirius. Sirius is light. Awful lot of colonies here. Do you want to turn them off? One with a little benthicodon no. swimming by? Or floating in the Or floating by, drifting by. It's not actually pulsing. The RV's casting a shadow. With sea cucumber down there on the sediment chute. You know, I thought when we first got down, I thought I saw feeding Grab traces it. of an echiurn worm, and I'm kind of disappointed Roger not that. to see any. Here's one of the flat with sea cucumbers kind of drifting. Yeah, so I'm seeing the long lines. Ashton's yeah. just pointed to the monitor, noting that if you look on the sediment surface, you can see some areas that are um, lighter, and it's like somebody has drawn a line in the sand, and those would be the tracks of the sea cucumbers that are sort of moving back and forth and ingesting the organics, and as they ingest it, they take off the upper layer of sediment um, and so reveal the underlying sediment, which is slightly lighter in color. And it's another good representation, actually, of what is the rate of deposition mm -hmm. that those trails haven't been covered up very quickly. Um, you can see they're pretty extensive over here, and the sea cucumbers aren't moving around that fast. Uh, but what I had seen earlier was more like uh, from a single radi a single point radiating lines from it. And it's a very characteristic trace of an echiurn spoonworm, which burrows vertically down into the substrate, but then sticks out a long sort of tongue or proboscis and sort of scrapes off the upper layer of uh, food and brings it back to the head. Well, if we look right in the center there that's coming into view, if you could put the lasers on, I think this is another one of these really tall asbestos plume of sponges. It's a really narrow stick standing up. We saw one earlier. I've never seen one quite so tall. There center? you can see the lasers. Yep, you've got your lasers just you about on it. Come in a little bit? So we're not going to be able to get the lasers on the sponge itself, but just to get some sense. Um, aim at the base there. Yeah. So, you Which know, we'd sort of have to turn those sideways and go up the stem. Uh, actually, but let me just move in. Some tether. Don't look at the tip as you do that. Yeah, I but I tip. think it's certainly more than a meter tall. That's what they're going to be interested in, those there. Very cool. So this is a sponge that feeds not by generating a water current through its body, but instead has silica spicules that are shaped in various kinds of hooks. And it's been described as kind of like a little Velcro. And for the unfortunate crustacean or worm that's swimming by, are you ready for gets an antenna or a, a leg sort of caught yeah, up in one of those hooks, and it struggles, it gets hooked even more. And then the, the uh, sponge's cells will migrate, they'll literally move the and move over it mm -hmm. and encase it in cells. And then the question was for a long time, well, then how does it do the digestion? Because sponges don't have a stomach, so they wouldn't normally you know, have the capacity to externally digest something. 
but it turns out that there are bacteria that are associated with the sponge, and it's the bacteria that begin the digestion of whatever it's trapped, and then the sponge just takes advantage of the bacteria doing that work. It's amazing, a little symbiosis there. That's a great view. Thank you. Well, at the end of the day, people are also just big bags of bacteria. For sure, yeah. yeah. Our guts are full of bacteria. Yeah. They're also helping us digest our mm -hmm. food. We hear all about probiotics. And gut biome. Yep. Kombucha. Kombucha. The understanding of the biomes that are associated with all these animals is a really hot field right mm -hmm. now. And some of the things are learning, not with these sponges, but with the more typical Let's suspension feeding sponges, is if you take a water up, sample next up. to the sponge and then take a sample well, in the know, sponge, yeah, you find like a completely different up. suite of bacteria, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is telling you that's it's it. not just that the I'm sponge is filtering forward. in these bacteria from the surrounding yeah, water, but instead is, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say they're farming their own bacteria, but they have this community associated with them. It's just fascinating. The same with corals. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's maybe the the angle where we're looking at it because it looks like 90 degrees up straight up yeah it does yeah oh like it might be closer than yeah yeah i'm really hoping we find the uh, chondrocladia um, carnivorous sponge down here because I found out some in interesting the recent studies on them. That would be really fun to no, I'm pass at on. Two four zero. Where should we go next? Huh? They're looking on the surface of that rock. Um, it looked like a, an encrusting sponge, much, maybe. So. And so it looks like this should be starting to slope up, Target maybe about bearing. 20 oh, degrees, and then I think the we thing. get pretty oh. steep. You know, up almost maybe 40 degrees. Um, which I imagine is maybe some talus yeah. that's fallen off, but also like some 80. of that shear face. You, you yep. got to imagine we we did start this dive with seeing a, a decent amount of angular talus at the bottom of the slope. There was some some talus with some uh, pockets of, of more in place basalt, but a lot of that talus had to be derived so from somewhere. Be, I mean, yeah. Why can't do and we haven't seen too many fragmented in place pillows. We've seen ahead they've been fragmented here and there, there but there's been there. a lot of nice sure. round in Some place structures. So. Sounds good. All right. Still had a good heading. I think so, yeah. So that's telling you, you got it's a pretty good sense summer. that this wall that we're yeah, seeing is a stuff. wall of pillows. That's and kind not, of the, the uh, bearing you know, towards some talus pile right? covered in the sand. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, a wall of probably fragmented there. pillows yeah. um, that have fallen off a little bit, but. Okay. I, I've been wrong before, two and I'll be wrong zero, again. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 30 meters, 240. Yep. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, watch it. It's reacquired bottom. Still pretty flat. So we're just going to keep pushing forward, but it uh, looks pretty flat for the next little bit. Sounds good. Just a heads up. Sometimes it's tricky looking into the distance about whether I'm seeing rocks on the sediment or whether I'm seeing fish sitting on the sediment. But for the most part, there are rocks. There's a sponge, one of those vase sponges, that, or excuse me, tubular sponges that we saw earlier. Now, there is a chance that it could be a rock fish, but there's no chance it could be a fish rock. So Correct. And I think most of the rock fish would be shallower. Yeah. No chance. Let's see. So, for the most part, the dive track is kind of south-southwest, right? Uh, that is not north oriented. Yeah, so that's correct. Yeah, south, south, southwest. Yeah, thank you. So right now we're kind of looking west. So that means we are looking kind of along the slope there. Actually, here with that cucumber, I think you can see the trail behind it. Mm -hmm. So that's good. You can see. I think that rock's moved. Where it's been. Yeah, I agree. Some skid marks behind there. Pushed out of the way by an industrious sea cucumber. Yeah. There's a couple of mounds over here. I'm not sure if that's a buried rock or if that's evidence that there's some kind of uh, crustacean that's building that mound or a worm that's building that mound. I haven't seen anything like that, but... 
Uh, Pilot, can we get the lasers back on? Look at this. Uh, uh, doesn't yes. this rock over here look like it's come out of that chunk right there? Yeah, possibly. Thank you, Pilot. I'll give you that one. Thanks. I still wouldn't want to sample it. No. Yeah. It could be a slice of the pie. Can we get a snap zoom on as you're going over by the rock, a uh, small rock lower right? There's a stick just in front of it mm -hmm. as you're passing over. Yep, that's the one. Do you want to come in partial? Thank you. And probably a sea pen. It's extending right down into the sediment. Take more. There we go. Yep, for sure. It's a sea pen with an associated ophiroid, and you can see that it disappears right into the sediment. It would have this inflated peduncle down there. Um, the peduncle just being the swollen base of the colony. Thank you. Now, if you tried to sample that, could yep. that would that peduncle come right out with a stick, or is it pretty yeah. in there? You would just you could just pull pluck it out. Yeah, yeah kind of like a, a plant growing yep. shallowly in the garden. Mm -hmm. However, there are some. I don't think this one, but there are some sea pens that create a burrow and screen. they can very rapidly disappear into that burrow. So mm. I've seen many an ROV pilot go to grab a sea pen mm. that they could swear was there a moment ago, but there's nothing there. Mm. Sounds like a Which would really surprise that brittle star if it did that. Yeah. Video yeah, is clear. Copy that. This is back on. And we'll the Pashnik Anguli, a PhD student at University of Louisiana Lafayette who's working on the sea pen, says this looks like a prototylum, the genus prototylum. Thank you. So that's the sort of thing I would expect to see in the lower bathyl, which describes the depth zone that we're in on soft sediments. Lots of sea pens, and so like now I'm seeing a stick down here. A lot of them are pretty small. I'm going to imagine now every stick I see is another sea pen. There are some that can get to a pretty big size. And some of these sea pens also change the local community. They can change what's going on in the sediment underneath them um, because they interrupt the flow. They create some kind of baffling. You can get settling um, of organics around them, and so uh, worms, uh, harpactacoid copepods, you know, things like that may associate with them, sometimes fish. So they're not quite as um, attractive as a secondary habitat or an organism that is creating habitat as uh, some of the corals on the hard substrate but they do create a surface, and they do influence subsurface. I think we just passed over a, a brown holotherian as well. Seeing lots of what look like little pock marks in the sediment here. I wonder if there are subsurface hard urchins in this area. There's one of those sea cucumbers with all the podia along the body. We saw one close up early on. Yeah, again, lots of mounds up here. I'll bet there's all kinds of things going on below the sediments that we can't see. Go ahead, Bridge. Roger that. Move complete. Copy. You know, I, I made that comment to you when we were looking at that, that sea spider earlier, how it looked like it was straight out of my nightmares. And it was funny, I went I went to lunch and our, our ship's medical officer, uh, Michael Reed, came up to me and he said the exact same thing to me. And I was it's like, I, I feel you. Okay. We, we were both having nightmares that you were going to sample it. 
Um, Oh, slightly terrified up, make him work on it yeah that we see it running around our ship um, yeah doc reed has been uh, helping us in the wet lab at night I, I to process so. all these samples so maybe we should be so excited this, this is the one of? this is the one copy that this is bent the code on and uh, uh earlier alan collins told us that uh so far as i can tell at least this one species we're describing i don't know if it's the only one was uh, sampled in and described section, from Antarctica. So I'm gonna try its load. So I was saying, you know, if copy. if we pass it, uh, do we have any? If, uh, we, are closer if we were in a position and we're just passing copy. it, it was drifting by. Could we just turn on the slurp and? Yeah, we're gonna try. Just it. Yeah, but uh, let's not spend too much time on it, or else my partner here may punch me in the arm. Copy that. Let's see. Slurp it if you can. Yep. Can you put a, uh, all right, do an extent drawer? Yeah. Extending drawer. Oh. Let me just make sure that. You want me to zoom up? I think I got it there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, starboard on port. Thing, but you're retracted. Okay. Turn on the jar lights. Pushing for out. And so, so talking about Doc Reed, I'll you know, it, it reminds us that you know the, this huge exploration effort is okay. possible not just by our ship-based scientists or our members oh, of the oh, ROV so they can swim. and video team from the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, but also our wonderful NOAA officer corps that. members, um, Doc Reed, who I believe is a member of the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service, um, and then. Of course, everyone who makes this ship work and run and Let's takes care of the code so on sample our, our stewards, our engineers, our ABs. Yeah. Nice work, Oh, that was terrific. Pilot, nice job. So we were just able to sample that uh, benthicodon jellyfish. We've seen several it's today, and that's a... It's moving around the jar. That's cool. Okay. As far as I know... Pulling drawer in. We'll get some more confirmation from Alan. Yeah. Yep. Doing like the jelly kicked up some dust. Well, it was trying to evade, but yeah, we'll pass through it. <laughs> Jill kicked up all that dust. The genus yeah, was originally described in the genus. Antarctic, and I'm not all certain right. how many Powerful species really are known, him. but um, yeah, I think what Alan could tell, at least Section. quickly, is that we don't know of any species that have been documented nice work, uh, from the, the area, or at least collected and sampled from the area, so that'll be yeah, valuable. Thank goodness. Uh, is it in the... No, it's in it's one. one. Yeah, Fernando, you might want to. It might be a cool video if you switched around to have your one. stingers. Do you want to yeah. come up? A that was a fast slurp. Yep. Yeah. That's great. Nicely done. Yeah. Met all the requirements. It's a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Uh, and what did you say, navigator? I was just rolling. Roland, do you think it would be good video to rotate around so one was the closest jar, so you could see it like swimming around? Yeah, it would be good. Yes. Put on two. Yeah, you'd have to, uh, yeah. But uh, one of the things I was also commenting is uh, when it sucked up, the tentacles came off. So I was wondering if you wanted to blow out the hose before next sample. Uh, we could go back to six and flush it out a little bit. Um, Alan Collins says just two species have so been described in that genus so far worldwide. Now, right? Wow. Oh, oh I'm sorry, one more. Yeah, one more. Point. I can just do it like that. Should stop in one. Yeah, that's the one. It's just on the other side of the... Uh, We've seen a number of them. That's the Today one. we've yeah. seen yeah. at least the, six, the yeah, and we've got really good video like of at least filter. three of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I concur. So, uh, okay. it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Uh, and the there are only two species the that have been right described, but that doesn't say oh, okay. anything about what the density cool. or distribution of those species is. And so this is work. another reason why we take occasional samples is so we can better understand that. So Do is the species that we know yeah, from the Antarctic the same one as the one we see, see here? Something are these sea cucumbers 30, or are these fish? They must be sea cucumbers, right. right? I think I see a mixture. Is that right? Another yeah, I, that, oh, I wonder if there's a tripod fish down here, because uh, this oh. would be the sort of habitat yeah. that they would use. A tripod fish is one of my favorite fishes. It's yeah. one of the first deep sea later, fishes yeah. I ever saw on a cruise out in Hawaii. Yeah, you would do yeah. That, that or a lizard fish, because these look like they're sitting down on the bottom, don't they? Saddle or 250, and I'll center this up. Copy. 250. Uh, let me move there, and we'll get back to you. Okay, so right there, that's 250, exactly. Yeah. In line. 
Does that still put us on track? Is that okay? Yeah. Five. It's more, yeah. Yeah, it's minus. 250. 250. What kind of well, range that's a you guys cool want? Sponge. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to do 30 meters? That one that you were yeah. looking at while sure. I went. Good with that? Yep. Either the first or second time to lunch. Uh, it was also really cool with the okay. truly a vase and that really nice, smooth opening with the rim. And so now that we've we've come off of that little hill that was at the foot of this larger slope, um, and we've we've jumped through the water column, we've flown through the water column to that slope, and we've landed, we've kind of assessed the background, we've we've landed in this area that's probably at, you know at a little foothill or a little almost valley between that larger slope that we're going to be going up and that small hill that we came off of, pretty pervasively sedimented. But we're going to start transiting. Jars? Up yep. that slope. It's going yeah, to probably get six, fairly six, steep. Six, um, you know, it might start out around yep. 20 degrees, but it, it should probably get up to 30, 40 degrees. So uh, opportunity for uh, lots of potential exposure of these pillow basalts, and then also the less sediment, and then probably opportunities for some of these larger macrofauna. Rising. Okay, Delta fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Not a minute more, but <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Pilot, can we get a zoom to see if these are fish or sea cucumbers, please? Actually, the yeah, one on the lower part is definitely a fish. Thank you. So the the two on the bottom are fish, and the one so on the top is a holothurian. The one on the right, I guess. I think they're both the same, the two, the Video lower snap. part of the screen, not upper part. Below the that's a edge, just there. went off screen. Yep, oh. just between right. your toes. After. Sorry, I didn't get to you fast enough. I uh, pushed the wrong button. All right, video, come on in. Lasers off. Looks like it might be next to an urchin. Well, it's definitely not a lizard fish or a tripod fish. Mm -mm. You can see it's using its uh, sensory fins there to sort of probe around the bottom. This looks like maybe a cusk eel. Yep, Mike Vecchione says it's a cusk eel. Okay, we saw this one earlier today. Thank you. Okay. So we have two cuscules here, and then just a little further into the systems was a purple holothurian. So I think we're okay with those. Maybe just a quick view on the holothurian, because I don't think we imaged the one that had that extension from the dorsal surface, which is I the back. Yeah, this is not the same one we imaged earlier. This is off. It's a little bit of a a sail there, so this one is probably one that could uh, swim fairly effectively. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, got a couple of notes. We must have uh, zoomed over a xenophyophore as we were uh, zooming in. Those are, you'll see a ball-like concretion right, on the sediments. They're being constructed by single-celled organisms that I believe now are classified. You were talking about classification of systematics before as foraminifera. Mm -hmm. It used to be thought that they were their own um, offshoot, evolutionary offshoot, but the genetic analysis now suggests they're a specialized kind of foraminifera. There is a sea cucumber that's almost completely covered in sediments on the lower left.
Is that of interest, or you just? Yeah, if if you if it doesn't slow us down, yes. Video snap. Yeah, there you go. So I forget the name of them, but they coat themselves in sponge spicules and sediments and so on. Max, zoom. Copy. Yeah, I'm pretty far. So just be a passer. I can still see some of the tube feet sticking out. That's good. Thank you. You got it. And xenophyophore, xeno means strange or foreign. Um, and the test that they make is made up of mud grains and uh, pteropod shells and old smaller foram shells, basically anything they can grab in the environment they mm -hmm. will incorporate. And so I think that's what the xenophyre for is referring to, the fact that it's got all these foreign bodies incorporated in the shell, including its own fecal matter. Good to know. Good to know. Yep. <laughs> Our house. Yeah, Bridge. Sounds good. Thank you, Bridge. Do you think there's any children out there whose favorite animal is a purple holothurian? Sure. Or a xenophile four? Sure. They're very yeah. popular. Yeah. Um, Big toys kid up here in the shading oh, chair. Oh, are they really? Yeah. Oh. I mean, not the actual holothurian. No, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, video say that. <laughs> I said the big kid in up in the shading chair loves holothurians, especially when they're swimming. That's a pretty impressive uh, bamboo coral here, and looks like a couple of stock sponges. You know, there's been a limited number of aging studies done on coral. We often get this question of, you know, how old are these corals? How long is it taking to grow? But one of the things I don't think, essentially, that we've had enough time to do yet, I'm sure these studies are being planned or are desired if we can get the samples, is to know what's the rate, the difference in the rate of growth between a coral that's down here at 3,260 right meters versus one that's at 1,700 meters interest, versus one that's at 800 meters. Rocks. And ideally, to allow for a, the best comparison, here. you'd want to do that on the same can, species. So you need to find a species that has a very similar. wide depth distribution and then see how the depth may be impacting its rate of growth. It's like uh, what they call a Venus flytrap anemone. Uh, possibly the family Hormatheidae, tucked on the rock back there, just above yeah, that. More of an octopus view coral. from back there. Uh, almost. So to me, when I look at this pile of pillows, it all looks like it's being extruded from one point. Am I misinterpreting that? Or no, I... Over-interpreting that? I, you might be over-interpreting it, but I think that's a good place to start your interpretation from, right? So, you know, that, that hypothesis of where did it all come out from an event in that location is a good place to start. And then, you know, if we were able to kind of fly around that in 3D and see are all those lobes, those pillow lobes forming one kind of central spire that they're coming out from, do we want another move? Um, yeah. Another benthicodon. And so as we continue uh, upslope here, meter you know, move. hopefully we'll, we'll see more of those pillars and be able to tell. Four minutes ago? Three, four minutes. Yeah. Uh, Chris Ma is in the chat room, uh, and he said this. that the so that purple, center that. purple sure. sea cucumber that had that uh, fin-like podium on the back is Cyclopodes, and the one that was brown and uh, right sort of there, covered in sediment particulates, look kind of camouflaged, if you will, yeah, that. is Olaf Linus, or at least two similar to a genus called uh, Olaf Linus. Yeah, that's correct. Um, that's about 35 meters away, so you want to do 20? I'm wondering if 25? that's named after someone yeah, yeah. Irish. Olaf Linus. No. I mean, that's Irish. the way it's spelled. Yeah, let's do. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. Even Sounds attempt good. to pronounce that one. Yep. yep. 2260. Thanks. Copy. Yeah, I wasn't actually trying to make a joke there. I was serious. Just the weird spelling suggests to me it's somebody's name who's been turned into a genus name. Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, Chris Ma has just released a paper. Uh, this I shouldn't say he's released. Chris Ma has just had a, one of his uh, studies published 
in the last month where he has described many of the sea stars that were collected as part of the capstone expedition in the Pacific. Um, so nice job, Chris. And, oh, there we go. Yeah, he's saying it's named for Mark O'Loughlin. There you go, a sea cucumber expert from Australia. But yes, the name is Irish. So yeah, I had a, I had a feeling with that uh, odd spelling. So one of the things um, that's the, uh, I guess, the honor of the taxonomist who dis scientifically describes something Just and has their here. paper accepted for publication is that they get to choose the name. The side, yeah. And so there's various ways that people like to name things, and part of it is to honor other people. So in this case, it would be honoring Mark O'Loughlin. The still on. Well, Chris named yes. several species after different elements of the so Okeanos like, yes, Explorer program. So and good. one of the sea stars, and I apologize, Chris, you'll have to want. tell me the uh, the name of the genus. I forget what genus it was in, but for the species, he's honoring the GFOE pilots, the ROV pilots, and the video engineers and videographers, this whole team that is giving you these fantastic visuals. And he called it, and I'm, he's going to have to tell me how to pronounce it, but we referred to GFOE, so I would imagine the species name he intends is GFOEI. Yeah, However, you're, you're correct. Yeah. But, uh, so there it is, Litanaster GFOEI, and he also named as a genus Okeanaster, for the Okeanos, Okeanaster Hohonuii. So it's easy for me to say, haha, no pun intended, GFOEI. G-F-O-E-E-I. <laughs> but somebody who doesn't know what G-F-O-E is, I can't wait to hear them try to pronounce that species name. There you go. Gafui, yeah. There you go. Gafui-I, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris Ma just said the same thing. This is what uh, Caitlin said next to me was Gafui-I. And Chris is laughing and saying, yep. But that's the challenge. Nice job, Chris. It definitely looks like we got the steepness part correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, so some of those pillows that we flew over, those look like they were uh, primary in place. You can see those those nice lobe structures and some of that evacuated interior with kind of that exterior shell still intact. Um, and so I, I think, as I said, we're probably going to be getting up to at least initially much more uh, rubbly areas and then maybe seeing some more primary lobate enclosures. We just passed over a pretty tall vase type sponge. And there's a kind of a, uh, how come I forget the name already? I just looked this up. That <laughs> sponge down there that we were looking at that had all those tubercles extending from it. Let's see if I've still got that open. Nope, I've moved on. There we go. So it's a euplectelid, hey, and it's Rich. similar to the genus Sacrocalyx. Um, what I'm looking at is uh, identifications of taxa from the Pacific, so I'm not certain that it's the same, but it's certainly the same general morphology with those protruding knobby structures that are hollow on the inside and sealed on the outside.
kind of falls off on your sonar, huh? Off to the right. Yep. I'm going to tilt up, roll in just to kind of look up in there in the distance. Copy. Like there's some stocked biology up there. Bamboo corals is as near as I can tell based on what we've seen below. It looks like maybe one of these uh, Venus flytrap anemones is perched on another stock. I think the couple that we saw so far have been on rocks. So if I picture how this anemone got onto here, I would guess that the larva settled here. However, anemones can kind of uh, scooch over a surface, if you will, and some of them can even swim. I don't know that these ones can swim, but they basically arc the column uh, back and forth. Do you want to go in on that, Ron? Get a really awkward sort of uh, uh, they've swimming. They've been making this go pretty folding quick. themselves so in half in order I've to been swim. following their lead. This, this one, I imagine, settled here as a larva and grew in place. Here. Yep. Okay. And so it looks like the skeleton was bare, settled on it, and then some other stuff settled above and below. And that stuff, I think, is hydrozoan. See the anemone's a uh, pretty good size. More than 10 centimeters across the oral disc, which would be Let that flat go upper go surface where Copy. the uh, tentacles are arising. And so the mouth here is pointed oh. downwards. And My you can see why we refer to it as being similar to a Venus flytrap. It's kind of there. folded yeah, that whole disc. Starboard side, but I think you're good. ROV, can you zoom out for a second? Video, Video is clear. Sure. I think he's... Uh, are, can you zoom or pan to your lower left? Lower left. Yeah. Are we in a position where we could uh, try and grab something with a manipulator? Rock. I or we had a move ended a few minutes ago. Okay. Um, Sirius is probably gonna. You're gonna drift off to the side, probably. Yeah. So we'd have to move the ship back. Yeah, we'd yeah. have to reposition a little bit. It, it, it's okay. Okay. Yep. So what I was what I was looking at just for your own situational awareness is that that vertically uh, thin piece, kind of center frame right now, that's segmented um, horizontally. And so you know that might be a that's another type of piece that you can think about grabbing some of that. On? Uh, below that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So and, and a long kind of you know, the laser section. Okay. Right. You know, so if you're thinking about last time we kind of picked a piece out of a puzzle, um, that's also another good piece if we can get the manipulators all the way around it, um, because it's probably pretty narrow on the back end. Um, so it might easily break off. Copy that, yeah we'll keep an eye out for it. Um, yeah we would have had to move Oh yeah, no worries. The ship back we're trying to Keep some moves going here. I'm going to jump up actually here. Get out in front. And so, yeah, so here we go. We, we have some nice, big, large, intact pillows now, these big, low bait structures. I, I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't seen um, any sheet flows yet. I, I was hoping to see one or two by now. Um, but they might. Uh, so I'm sorry. Why would the sheet flows be higher on the slope than the pillows? Oh, uh, not necessarily higher, but they 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 tend to segment the individual eruptions that have constructed this entire edifice, and so you can imagine this entire uh, kind of volcanic edifice. This volcano is not built by run eruption. It's built by right, you know, a series. Yeah, yeah, 10, 20, 30, 40 eruptions, okay. and each one of those might be marked so by a more voluminous down. sheet yeah, flow. Yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. It could also just be marked by a series oh, of pillows, but... I should have had a look at that. That's my bad. Yeah, look, I think Chris may have heard me. You see the thing that looks like a crinoid on that sponge stuck? It just had such thick arms. That's what I was looking at. The other thing I'm looking at is the sponge, how tall it is with its uh, little it's tip at to the top. I don't have a ton of time here. There you go. It's all uh, okay, it's not as unusual as I thought. Thank you for looking back at that. Sure. I thought the arms were a lot thicker. 
Um, and that would have been significant. But yeah, really thin and tall stock to this sponge. And I still think this is a uh, Highland, uh, what is it? Copying. Highland of Matadé. Yeah. And it gets back to the question you, like I think you rose it yesterday. What from, grows uh, first, the, first the stock turn. or the sponge body? So it should be and I'm still not certain of the answer there. Okay, sounds good. That was my, my turn back. And so we're just yeah, continuing our ascent. Basic. Yeah, something was over there. Of this underwater mound of pillow basalt under this likely constructional volcano. You can see on just to the right of the center screen right now a cross section of a pillow. And you see what I talked about earlier where the lava inside has been evacuated out and has left the pillow hollow. And, and inside of that hollow pillow you'll see a series of almost, they look like plates that are kind of going um, across that pillow. And that's yeah, where like the lava that that's now. been evacuated yeah. has Looking stood for long enough where it's cooled and it's skimmed over a surface. And then it's been evacuated a little bit more and skimmed over another surface and evacuated a little more. And so that's likely related to uh, individual breakouts of more lava that's been connected to that pillow on kind of a, a pattern. And, and here's a great cross section you can see uh, in the in the background that slope of kind of these constructional pillows. It's a pretty cool view. Yeah, I would I would love to get a nice pillow sample from somewhere in this general vicinity, kind of middle slope. So just yeah, keep your eyes peeled for that that classic jigsaw pattern that we saw, where something might be extractable yeah, or good spot. yeah or or similar you know one of those um be tricky to grab, but. one of those pillows that's been hollowed out and you just see the rind you know that rind tends to be uh, much more easily fractured and broken off okay sounds good ashton we're uh we yeah. should be at a good spot if you see anything Ship-wise, I mean. Yep. Sort of looks like a chunk left of lasers on the two. Yeah, that just looks like kind of, probably kind of thick. Yeah. 10 centimeter thick rinds, pretty. Actually, that um, dead center, you see that brittle star? just to the bottom left of the lasers. Yep. And, okay, and there's that rind, there's that kind of plate right below the lasers. Yes. Yeah, right there. If that is breakable, that that exterior crust. Yes, yeah. there should be all stops. Okay. So that, to me, looks like you're talking about the outside layer of the pillow that's uh, cooled first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can imagine almost if you're squeezing toothpaste out of a tube, yep. and then that that big long string of toothpaste that's coming out of the tube, if it if it if that exterior hardened and crusted over, but then you kept squeezing that toothpaste, and another portion of that toothpaste broke out of that crust and went somewhere else, right? And so it would evacuate that that hardened skin you've already formed, right? And you basically drain all the lava out of that hardened skin, but that hardened skin remains. Right. And and you um, right before you stopped in, we saw one of these with a clear cross section right down the middle and it was hollow okay, on the inside on? and sure then actually had a series of plates do that. Oh. that were kind of connecting that inside of that tube and each one of those plates represents a place where the lava has been evacuated and then stood for a little bit and allowed to skim over and then evacuated a little bit more and then skimmed over again so kind of, sort of you, can, you can kind of build up this history of, of multiple yeah, breakouts from the same flow right. get, so watch lead uh we're talking about this sort of horizontal. Oh no, the one uh, the one above the brittle star. Oh, above, copy. Yeah. So. Yeah, that upper plate. It's like the top curve part of this yeah, pillow. Yeah. Uh, above the shadow. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I can edge it. it. Almost looks like a split right yeah. there. Yeah. So the, the, both sides. the sure. top of that bridge. I, bring some depth out. I almost need a giant pointing stick. Is that good? Yep. 
This almost looks to me yeah, like it's perfectly get, fractured for you. It's They're just on. waiting for you right. to come Yeah, out. nice little keystone. Pull that out. Yeah, exactly. Position HD2. I think you got to go take HD2 further down or over so he can see his arm. Okay, arm is coming live. Roland, does it look like there's a droplet in the mini Zeus lens, bottom left, all the way? You want to call this pillow again? Uh, yeah, let's call it. Uh, okay. Pillow rind one. Oh, yes, and now I see it. Or it might be a might be a grab and wiggle. <laughs> a wiggle waggle. Okay. We'll give it a little wiggle, but yeah. uh, whatever whatever you're like confident waggling it too. Um, What's that? Try to like tap it like front and underneath. See if it just like pries up at all. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. If it's loose, we'll move pretty quick. If it's yeah, like, just get under there. It's a classic game of ROV versus rock. Yeah. yeah. Look at that. Excuse me. It was a keystone. And then, now this uh, outer exterior yeah, surface, since it's cooled really yeah. quickly, uh, it doesn't really have a chance to crystallize, right? And so it gets quenched fast, and that outer uh, rind tends to be much more think? glass rich. So it's starboard. better for uh, subsequent geochemical analyses, for some analyses, because we're really interested in targeting the glass um, for things like microprobe but analysis, where we're port. looking at that like, individual do, structure. Small, yeah. um, do you think but it makes in? it a little bit more friable, it makes it a little more weak. Uh, yeah. um, so, you know, it, it tends to be a little bit easier to break for better or worse, right? Better for sampling. Yeah, um, yeah that's all the way in. So th the crystallization process then allows what? Get packed tighter together and cemented tighter together? Yeah, exactly. That's harder? Exactly. Right, so this, this glassy structure, you know, tends to be um, more amorphous, right? And it doesn't necessarily have the, the rigidity or the strength of the dense cr or the density of, of the crystalline material. I did not know that. Okay, video. Come in. How's that, watch lead? Beautiful. Your mic's not open, watch lead. Ooh, oh, there's an isopod on it. Never mind. My headset died. A nice Anunia pod. Oh, and two sponges. Okay. I'll put it away. Yeah, and then just uh, get some nice shots of where it came from post. Okay. Post removal. Post removal. Right, and so just like when you take a 
biologic sample and you're interested in seeing what habitat it came from, we want to know what was the geomorphology of the structure that we extracted this from. You know, for the talus, it's a little less important, but when we're taking a primary flow like this, it's, it's very helpful. So I'm seeing both on the surface of what we just pulled out and what I can see from what's left behind that the crack must have been good enough that sediment had gotten into it. Sediment the has gotten in there and then it's also allowed for weathering. So, you know, some of that, that glassy material has weathered and altered and that, that glassy material is, is uh, iron magnesium rich. So you get a red oxidation from, from the weathering of that. And so that's one of the things that we hope is that we, we get yeah, a yeah. good I enough sample that when we clear. break it open oh. or we cut it in half, that there is still some Thanks unweathered enough. glass in there. And I think I was seeing one of your flat sheet flows, or maybe yeah. that's the wrong term, but what you were saying before, Give it hell, inside of that uh, yeah, outer so, rind. Yeah, so not a sheet flow. The sheet flow would be a larger structure, but that's, right. yeah, the same process that forms that outer that? rind is forming that inner rind. So part of the lava has been evacuated out of that tube, but it sat there long enough to just cool and skim over, put, uh, probably intruded in the seawater, and, um, and then... The uh, okay. Trained out again, well. and that's very typical. We also see that on a larger scale structure in lava tubes subaerially, and so sometimes if you're hiking through uh, a fresher lava tube, you'll actually have kind of almost a false roof. And so if you're hiking through a, a big lava tube um, in a place like Iceland, where there's a lot of them, and you can kind of just go exploring, you'll see with inside of a large lava tube a whole bunch of rubble on the floor. But the roof will still be perfectly smooth or actually kind of stalactite-ish from the yeah. lava that's stripped down. And all that rubble a lot of times is from these kind of uh, interior plates that were formed okay. and then collapsed Thanks. downwards. And they form good. almost, you're inside of this giant circular tube. You're like, where is this Thanks pile so of on. rubble coming from? Right. It's coming from these plates that have fallen downward. I believe I was inside one of these okay. lava My tubes in Craters of the Moon National Park, I think. Yeah. yeah. And of course, Hawaii Volcanoes okay. National Park. Thank you very much, You're ROV. Welcome. No problem. Okay, I'm just going to come straight up, I think, Copilot. Copy. Before I push out at all. Or, I mean, uh, before it goes side to side at all. Yeah, and then after this, it looks like it slope rotates to port based on what Cirrus is seeing. Okay. Yeah, that that's strange. It's like way over there. Oh, okay. Makes sense. Maybe I'll, I'll start that way then. Um, and what was the um, the depth of the upper part of the slope that we're climbing? The depth of the upper part of the slope. Oh, where's our shallowest point? Y yeah, this the top of this uh, barnacle feature. Um, about 3160. 3160, 30 yeah. so about 80, uh, 65 meters up still. Yeah, okay. and so that's where we come up to the top, and then, you know, I, I put in a little dog leg in there yep. if there was time. Yep. Um, but but it's, it, it, I'll be interested to get to the top. It's, um, you know, HD2 superficially to me, just looking at the bathymetry, it looks like Maybe it's a just large the underwater volcano with three Shadows. or four possible Copy. pit craters at the summit. So little eruptive vents. That's and, right. and, right. and unfortunately, the scale just makes it impossible to fly around across the entire thing. But sure. And so if you're, if you're listening at home, uh, and you have a student or you are a student who's interested in working on these rock samples, please, please do. We're, we're, we're taking these samples so that people can study them. Well, that's yeah, bamboo so that's coral up here. Like two, ten. Do you want me to nice rotate? little patch, clearly. Those are those are interesting striations in the rock too. I feel like some of the old you photos I've seen. What's that? Uh, there's that classic book on the Mid Ocean Ridge. I think. Is it a Heezen book? Maybe, very possibly. The, it's a thick book that has lots of photos of yeah. you know this sort of thing, mm. and that's what I remember: these pillows with these striations yeah. in it. 
some of these bamboos that I'm seeing here look to me like uh, what we would have called the bramble bamboo. They grow as a sort of tangled bramble of branches when they're small. And then I guess a few of the branches become the dominant growth axis and then grow into more regular sort of colony. And possibly uh, the primnoid in the center there. We uh, took a snipping of a primnoid from deeper today. Family primnoidae, another kind of octocoral. And actually, uh, more often, what, I, get a move what I see here are. Sure, do you want me to rotate? Colonies yeah, that are in um, a state of decay or the tissue has all died right, and so you know they're all overgrown with something else. I feel like I'm seeing more of those than I am seeing live fresh colonies. Like yeah, this meters. looks like a pretty healthy uh, prim node that we're passing over. Okay, so I believe I'm right there centered with that tiny little. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, and that's two one zero. Um, do we wanna like a? How far do we wanna go? Twenty, thirty. So let's see. D two sees something like twenty five meters more port, but Sirius isn't picking it up. So maybe it's two out. Sirius is already above it. So yeah, just wanna do twenty. Sure. Ahead and see what terrain does. Copy. So two zero two ten. Two, yeah, 210. Okay, I'll put it in. Okay. Uh, pilot, while we're sitting here, how about uh, we trip our third Niskin? Does that seem reasonable? It certainly is, yep. Thank you. And we, we just got a ship move in, so while we're waiting on uh, Video, are Sirius, we uh, okay. we'll take this Niskin sample, and then uh, Fernando and I are going to swap. Sounds good. Thank you. Sure. But we are, uh, ship is moving, so. Understood. We can do a zoom here, too. Uh, um, I'm just... Yeah. If you want, we're, I'm going to keep the vehicle here until Fernando gets in. Okay, watch Regardless. lead. This is co-pilot. Uh, we're going to, everything, everybody's ready for the Niskin, so I'm going to reset. Okay. And then I'm um, going to fire. Nothing happened. Navigator. So this is how we do it, right? We re reset and then just go up and fire. Yeah, reset and then fire. Yeah, that's what I did. So let me see. Let me try it again. Resetting. Okay. And then. Ooh. Oh, two of them, three and four. What? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so number three might have got caught. Yeah. And then firing number four, loosen them both up. Okay. Yeah, watch it. So it looks like we just uh, got two Niskins there. Yep. Um, I'll just make a note of that. That's fine. Copy. Thank you. Double the DNA. Yep. That's what okay. we call Hydraulic replication secure. in science. <laughs> I actually might be seeing that move a little bit. Okay, watch lead. Uh, is there anything we're gonna wanna 
take a look at right um, here. Yeah, I mean, if we're sitting waiting, we can zoom, but if uh, we're ready to move, we can move. Uh, yeah, the ship's already moving. So. Okay, we can go. Okay. Thank you. If, uh, I think I may have just seen a snail or something just as we were lifting above the rock. Uh, where Where is it? I, I I don't know if you can back down. I'm just telling this to the people on shore, but it's on the pillow right in center. You just have to back up just a little bit more, a little bit more, if you can. Yeah, go ahead. Let me and know because be I just didn't right see it. Th yeah, all when I was there. And I just came on the lower part of the screen. It's just slightly right in center. It's on the top of this pillow feature. Your lasers are going to touch it in just a moment, Copy. and now it's above the lasers. Copy. It's like golden color. Yep. Not sure if it was a gastropod or an urchin. Okay, let's do partial zoom video. It's a sea urchin. There we go. We may have seen one of these uh, the day before Copy. yesterday when we were also doing a dive Get down at about 2,700 meters. So that's great. This would be an even deeper spot for it. And these sponges are really interesting just to its left. They have a Sorry for that. collar of uh, sediments around them. That's good. I'm satisfied with that. Thank you. Okay. Let's come wide. Yeah, I wondered. So Chris Ma is saying another irregular urchin, so I wondered if that would be the case. We did see one two days ago. We did a dive on an axial volcano Still, uh, about 2,700 on, meters, FYI. and Chris had identified something that looked kind of similar as off? an irregular video? urchin, and these are urchins. I did not uh, know they like were a hard, hard urchin that uh, it's just like kind of burrow through so the, uh, oh, through the sand. Oh, that's by the way. We can leave them there. But yeah, I know the the... The editors want minimal fog lights, um, so I guess we can turn them down. Yeah, you can turn it off. So uh, sure, Caitlin. Yeah. Okay, coming down. The uh, when we bring them on, we want to start giving you guys so percentages. We're coming off this uh, little local high point, and then there's a, a little okay. sedimented saddle over there. We're at 3,217 meters as we work our way up this slope. I'm not sure that I wrote down. Coming up a little bit. Just starting depth. Looking at you, 60 degrees. Copy. I think. How long ago was that uh, ship move finished? Ship move ended, uh, let's see, three minutes ago. Okay. This is 20 meters, so you're probably about finishing up. Uh, Looks like it kind of flattens out. Yeah, that's pretty Dead flat. Huh? Kind of looks like the way to go still. Copy. It's a cool shadow. D2. Yeah. Great eye of it ranged at a little over 40 meters away on Sirius. Looks like you have a little bit of a harder return port on D2. Um, the return looks a little harder, but... Yeah, I see him right there in the manip. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. It's because we got the uh, 
upper mains a little bit down because it was making the near field too hot. A marriage of geology and biology. What do you think of? Serious right behind. That what sounds good, yeah. 210, so happy with that? Sure. Copy that. 210, yep. I'll just keep it here. Let me know if I get too far out, co pilot. Will do. I mean, but I feel. I feel like the slope's still going that way, right? Like from the camera? Did, like I feel did like you yeah. adjust this when we got on bottom? or? Agreed. Th yeah, I forgot to write it down too. So excited. Sorry, watch lead, were you talking to me? No, I apologize, I was talking to co-lead here. Oh, copy. Still seeing plenty of uh, tracks in the sediment here. So you can see where the the lines of lighter color run across the sediment surface. And this is these sea cucumbers that you see here as they eat their way through the sediments. They ingest the sediments. They digest whatever organics they do. They can get out of it. Uh, but they change the nature of the surface. And in some cases, you see there's little it's uh, a partial pock video. marks up. Those might be some of the irregular urchins that are buried underneath there or something else. So this is kind of an interesting one. I'm not certain if this is the same that we've seen earlier. Uh, it looks like it has this interesting sort of skirt to it, the margins. And you can see it's kind of uh, wiggling and dancing a bit there. I think that's responding to the ROV's thrusters. Uh, these things are pretty um, lightweight, diaphanous. There's a lot of water to them. But you can clearly see that beige colored tube in the center that's the intestine that's highly coiled in there giving it lots of surface area Sorry, in which to digest the just organics going up and down in this case i think the head end is facing us the darker purple is probably where the feeding tentacles are um, modified oral podia the tube feet uh, the question I'm getting next to me, Caitlin, uh, on video is asking if they have a brain. And so they do have a nerve ring, and they do have longitudinal nerve cords that extend from there. Uh, video is clear. Not much of a brain, Copy. really. That's good for science. Let's come out then. So just as a reminder for those of you who are... Uh, just turning on the live internet stream here. This is the Voyage to the Ridge exploration team on board the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. We are surveying the sea floor at 3,220 meters depth. We came down this morning several hours ago at about 3,338 meters. We're in the, um, uh, let me just uh, make sure I look at this to get the pronunciation right, Kirchatov Fracture Zone. And we're exploring uh, the ge mostly the geology is our primary interest today, but also, of course, the biology and what lives on the seafloor. Uh, my name is Scott France. I'm a deep sea biologist from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and I'm your biology lead. And I'm here with Ashton Flinders. Uh, thank you, Scott. Yeah, my name is Ashton Flinders. I'm a research geophysicist with the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory in Hilo, Hawaii, which is uh, part of the U.S. Geological Survey. Would the front row like to introduce themselves? Is it appropriate? Do you have the bandwidth to do that? Sure. I see some nodding. Got the GFOE team to say hello. People are really running the show up here. Sitting in the navigator position, Sean Kennison. Sitting currently as pilot, uh, my name is Fernando Aragon. Sitting co-pilot currently is Chris Ritter, and in the far right off, and in the far right off camera is uh, Roland at video, and in the back the uh, the video clipper is 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 Caitlin Bailey, and, and then heads up, we also have Arvind Shantram, our data manager. Come you, please come say hello, Arvind. Go back to center and come up a little bit. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Arvind Shantram. Sounds Chantram. good. I come down a little bit. Uh, I'm the sample data manager uh, coming in. I'm coming from, over uh, uh, that NGI, that Northern Gulf rock Institute. face. And I didn't want to come down uh, too much. Noah's, uh, I think what you saw. The Center for Environmental Information. In sonar was 
So that's the team that's currently uh, in the control room, but we have a whole host of other folks on the rocks. ship who are uh, coming in and out Sorry, of the control that? room doing work. Um, I think you just saw managing, the from the rocks. of course, our mapping this team. This is like less because uh, of sand. Yeah, some I folks think so. in the mapping team work overnight, so they may not be um, awake yet. A little more. They're the ones who provide us the great maps and the guidance for where we do these dives. And they just call down, and right? And then there's the, the uh, entire oh, crew of the Okeanos Explorer who are operating the vessel on which this ROV is being deployed, or from which uh, this ROV is being deployed. Now, Chris Ma gave us an ID or potential ID of a cyclopoded um, or a lacipoded yeah. for the last sea should, cucumber we were looking at. Those would be family level names. Yep. And when I say a family level name, what I mean is that's a taxonomic category or hierarchy. It's a larger group that includes various genera. Genus is a singular. And within any one genus, you can have many different species. Yeah. So we have these different hierarchies. Wall, right? And the the less Start certain we are of the organism that we're looking at, the higher up that hierarchy we will go to identify it. So we say it's a member of a certain family. It means it could be one of several different genera. Mm, the thing or if is we like just this give a genus name, it could be one 60, of several different why. species in that genus. Okay. Yeah, but one you, of the reasons you can we make see, like, the collections there. that we do yeah. is so can that we, we can uh, better understand what sure. we're looking at less, and be able to connect what we there. see in imagery with a specimen that's been identified by a scientist a using certain characteristics that may only be seen under a microscope, for example. There's another sea pen. And this sea pen, again, like the last one, um, has a brittle okay. star uh, oriented on the main axis. Um, the Pashna Ganguly described that earlier, or identified that earlier as likely prototylum. Yesterday we were talking about the black corals, and many of the genera names have the word pathies in it, referring to the antipathies being against the disease. And the sea pens, many of them have part of the name with tylum, P-T-I-L-U-M, and I believe it's referring to have the, the feather-like structure of a sea pen. The cameras it's like a feather start? stuck in the ocean bottom. Now, when I remember back to my, my, my paleo-oceanography paleo course, uh, you know, a lot of times when we think about sediment and we think about the, the biogenic take, oozes that form the sediment in the seafloor, we, right. we tend to think of oh, those that are that calcareous, yeah. those that have a calcite-based structure, and those are those that have a silica-based structure, so siliceous ooze. And so most of the organisms we're seeing here fall into which camp? Are, are the calcium carbonate structures or the, the silica? Base structures. Uh, yeah, we're seeing both, actually. The, um, I think, you know, what you're referring to would be the shells of mm -hmm. the planktonic yep. organisms yep. sinking through the water columns. is a Great. bit of a different Thank context, you. but it is interesting to me that, for example, all these bamboo corals we're seeing very common today. They have a calcium carbonate skeleton, so clearly, they also have to be concerned about the CCD and mm. how. What's the potential for the dissolution of the skeleton versus Coming the up. deposition of the skeleton? Copy. Now. When they're living, that skeleton is below the tissue, and so the microenvironment may be favorable so to the deposition. But I would, oh, this is nice. Another acorn worm. Sorry, we'll get back to that yeah. in just a second. But Hold we right were looking there. at the, the Yoda worm the other day, which was purple and had the big sort of side flaps to its head. This is the same um, phylum, Entropneusta. So it is an acorn worm. This is a deposit feeding worm. And you see that white um, tube, broken up tube next to it? that is almost assuredly fecal string from the same worm. So they, these will be deposited all over and give you some sense of how Sorry, much of the sediment it's processing. And you notice behind uh, the head, <laughs> there is a head there, at the top part of the screen, it looks like it's folded on itself. Those are referred to as uh, genital flaps or genital wings, so the gonads are in there. Uh, but Can otherwise, the length of the body is mostly just intestine. And, uh, um, let's see, almost five minutes ago. Run yeah. Like a little, like five it's facing so. downwards and uh, just chewing like on that sediment. A little bit as you go, but. Great, thank you. That's a. I'm glad you spotted that. That's yeah. the first time we've seen. Certainly, this I color morph. I would suspect that's a different species than what we were seeing before. Yeah, looking at like acorn the, worms yeah, are mini right. zoos. It looks um, like you sure. Keep back, but. I, maybe I shouldn't say common, but they're characteristic we'll deep out, sea soft like sediment organisms. Okay. I don't know Sounds enough good. about their density to say whether they're common or not.
Yeah, you can see how high up that uh, fecal string goes. So it's been working that little spot in the uh, sediments in the rock. Tilting up. Sako Matsumoto says that this is the first color that she's seen on this dive. Everything seems to be white. Still feel good when I put that in. Except for that one uh, benthicodon, a sock of uh, the swimming uh, yeah. jellyfish. Okay. But otherwise, yeah, looking, uh, I agree. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Copy. I'll keep coming up with you. Copy. And so, you know, what I'm looking at right now are these really bulbous pillow flows. They they look intact, and you can see, like on the one on the left-hand side of the screen, it's got this, this rind where all of the lava inside of that pillow has flowed out. It's flowed out and formed another pillow. And that, that exterior rind or the exterior surface of all of these pillow basalts are really one of the crucial things that we try and sample when we're taking our geological sample. They're really rich in volcanic glass. That's kind of that here. lava that's been erupted on the seafloor has quenched and cooled really quickly, and that's preserved this glassy this, state of that lava that we use for subsequent geochemical analysis. We can look at it with, with a range of sophisticated techniques, look at trace elements, look at trapped, ga ga trapped gases within that lava. And when we start thinking about volcanic glass that, that form the exterior surfaces of these pillow basalts, we can really think about glass and silicate minerals in general and kind of their, their range of varieties within the minerals that form the Earth's crust. So we tend to classify things from the geological perspective depending on how those silicate minerals are arranged. So by silicate, I'm talking about silica attached to four oxygen in kind of a tetrahedra. And the way that those tetrahedra are arranged, whether they're in chains or whether they're in sheets or rings or individuals, forms the basis of our mineralogical taxonomy that we do geologically. And so what's always interesting to me is these biologic organisms that also have silica-based skeletons, what the arrangement of them are, and kind of how they depend on the silica that's in the water column that might be derives ultimately from volcanic products to build their skeletons. Yeah, it's interesting to say that we just passed over two glass sponges, the hexactinellida and the glass sponges. Uh, the glass in the name refers to all the silica that they've incorporated into their skeleton. And one of the cool things about the way you just described it is to think about how all of these elements of the earth are interconnected. Because to get the silica to deposit in the skeleton, they have to take it out of the water. And where is it coming from the water? It's probably dissolved or has been released from the interior of the earth or uh, the weathering of the rocks that you were just talking about. It's uh, one big cycle. Yeah, so the, you know, the, the earth on whole is about, I think, 25% silicon. And then the crust itself is about over 90% silicate minerals, so, so minerals that are derived from, from the element silicon. And, and those then are erupted onto the seafloor and provide a, an input source for organisms that need that to build their exoskeletons and internal skeletons. One of the things I find amazing is that I look at the rocks, and you're just describing how this you know, glassy rind is uh, silica-based. But the, when I look at the um, hexactinella, that glass sponge, and I get it up on the deck, to me it looks much more like what I believe is not, what I understand is glass, something that's transparent, something yeah. through which light can move. And so it's interesting, right, silica apparently has these different it. properties, Cap or am I seeing Copy. the other the minerals that are associated yeah. with it in the rock? So the, the optical clarity of that glass is, is dependent on a few things. The, these basalts are really rich in iron and magnesium, right? So that ends, that lends to their opaqueness. Um, also, depending on glass, the, the amount of amorphous structure or how those silica, uh, chains are arranged also affects the optical clarity. You can imagine if they're, if they're all kind of bunched up like a bowl of spaghetti, it's difficult for light to pass through it. I'm going to come up and try to get some I'm trying to look here. up here uh, a paper that I have that talks about this deep sea genus Monorephus and um, studies on the silica fibers uh, that it has, and I'll come back to you once I find it, but it's uh, it's fascinating. It gets to this point exactly how Might the well. minerals are put together um, and how that affects the optical clarity. Yeah, do you just want to keep keep heading? Same thing? That works for me. Um, sure. It's hard to tell 
Yeah. Kind of in this bowl. You guys just want another 10 meters? Yeah, so going back to those Instead silicate minerals, it's it's also interesting step. in terms of how they're arranged and, works, and whether yep. they're kind of isolated like silica tetrahedra that. or whether they form good. sheets. Also lends to the bulk material property, so you can think of, of quartz, which is kind of just an individual silica tetrahedra. Uh, that crystallizes it in a three-dimensional framework that makes it very hard, whereas other minerals, such as mica, form sheet silicates. And so those tend to be very flaky in terms of their bulk material properties, and it's just because of how those individual silicate minerals are arranged internally. And there's I a, don't, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and there's a beautiful example of kind of one of those pillows that's, that's formed kind of its lobate structure, and then the interior lava is drained away, and it's formed that rind, and then that rind has now broken through and filled with sediment. Yeah, you know, I'm, well, I guess it's going to be filled with water, so what I said doesn't make sense. What, what I'm about to say, I understand already, it doesn't make sense. But I was going to say, if it's hollowed out, why doesn't it collapse under the weight of all this uh, water? But that's, of course, because it's filled with water. It's being replaced with water yeah. as the lava yeah. drains. Yeah. The hydrostatic pressure is, is equal all around it. Correct. Yes, until I it gets, answered my own question. Until it gets bumped by an ROV or a, a rock falls on it um, or it just, you know, is weakened. Okay, so actually what you see right in front of you. Yeah, this yeah, thing. That is really kind of cool. Okay, so what yeah. that looks like to me, that, that big long tube, is you had this long pillow lava that erupted out. Right, and it formed that exterior structure. And all of that lava was, there was, so uh, when we talk about water pressure, we talk about hydrostatic pressure. When we talk about lava or magma, we talk about magma static pressure. So the amount of magma pushing that. So that tube was full of lava. It got to that point where that, there's that break at the bottom of it. That entire skin cooled and chilled so much that it couldn't keep moving. But the magma static pressure was still pushing on it. And it pushed on it so hard until it broke the end of it, and then a new little lobe of pillow lava erupted out of it. And so what you actually see is one snake of lava, then a break, and then another snake of lava coming out of it. And you can still see the broken piece stuck to that second little pillow flow. That's, right. that's really cool. And so, yeah, now I understand. If I was to take a cross section through that, I would see these different layers of each of these separate flows yeah. inside the other. Very cool. That, that, that was really exciting for someone like me who, who loves to study eruptions, whether it's subaerially or, or underwater, um, because it's something we don't get to see very often. And so that was also a perfect example of, of that all of this lava that we're seeing now, you know, this is all in place. This was all erupted here. There's no question that it was necessarily something that's been moved through faulting or a pile of talus. Um, you know, that was a very clear feature. Video? Uh, partial zoom. Copy. Oh, this looks like one of the uh, slime stars, uh, the Terranaster. And, um, oh, Caitlin, do you remember the name? What's the other one? Chris was, oh, Hymenaster. So Chris, uh, Chris Ma was saying yesterday that more regularly we see the purpley one with the transparent uh, false upper skin, Hymenaster. And I'm pretty sure um, that's what you this have the ability is. To center and let's the see, center. Chris is still, yeah, thank you, Chris. So Chris is still in the chat room and he's agreeing that this is uh, Hymenaster. And um, he can describe it much, Next much soon. better than I can, so Probably. perhaps he'll call in in just a moment. Um, but the one thing I do recall is that, you know, it has this orifice to keep in the top center. Centered. And I love that we're seeing Copy. these, you know, when we're in these volcanic areas, because to me it looks like this little volcano from which uh, mucus can be uh, released. <laughs> Otherwise, you see those really long tube feet that are extending from... Um, each of the five points, those are the arms. You can kind of see through the transparent upper part of this body that there's a more typical sea star underneath there uh, with its five radiating arms. I'll, I'll take my volcanoes with lava, not mucus. I yeah. don't want to go near a mucus volcano.
All right, one we'll count. So well. Good stuff. There you are. Greetings, Scott. Hi, Chris. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we're going to have to move, but please yeah. do tell us about that hymen, Esther. Oh, no, that's fine. I thought you did a fine job encapsulating the basics. Um, the name is actually not related to um, I'll keep coming people up often you. make the mistake. You said that, you turned a little uh, bit to port right hymen side. Aster, yeah. Okay, yeah, which hymen means was your membrane, original? refers to the sort of very uh, uh, sort of gelatinous surface we see. And it's actually uh, uh, more of a comment on the spination on the underside. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, one of these odd taxonomic things mm. is they're all in Latin. And so they allude to taxonomic, the names often allude to taxonomic details. But as you said, the tube feet uh, at the ends are often very pronounced. Uh, probably finding its way around. We don't know what they do down here. Um, probably eating detritus. But the surface is uh, the second umbrella-like surface over the actual surface of the animal. And um, in this case, in, in all of the terrestrials, but especially in the deep sea hymenaster, um, the animal is typically a big kind of surface gel uh, jellyfish. I mean. The entire thing is just uh, yeah, I mean, I gelatinous, and this, the surface varies with different species because the ones that we see here, if we collected that, that would probably just literally be poured out of the collection <laughs> container. Um, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty that picture. Seen are, are almost, yeah, yeah, well, I, mean, right, I think that's because the really slime it produces yeah. would be yeah. just about as much fun. Um, well, I mean, I but, but in contrast, there are others that I've seen that are actually more fleshy, you know, I mean, if you imagine pulling one of these I would have. I mean, and, and I've seen okay. some of these that are almost like a foot and a half across, and they're just these, they're like a big, they literally a big pillow, you know, like a big soft uh, pillow. It's, whatever's it's, on the right. It's just a bizarre right. animal to, to work off. with. Um, I've tried to, to try to sort of pin down swing arms. what what species are which, bad. but a God, lot of them are damaged badly by trawls. The and I think Go that, ahead. you know, for if if and when someone ever decides to actually try to master the taxonomy or the, the, the number of species of hymenaster, um, you know, molecular data will probably be necessary because so much of the general morphology is so uh, poorly understood. Um, and especially because a lot of it's based on, you know, you can imagine dragging yeah. a, a fine sort of pillow through a trawl net, um, that's the kind of thing that you're going to get. Yeah, um, but it's not going to yeah, come out in good there's condition. There's all these mysteries with regards to the Sorry, slime and, and other things. Um, My, does it come out at the base of the tree? You're full oh, Copy. hope yeah. you're right. Okay, yeah, no, I get it, Coral. Um, no, 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 we've, we've we sampled this. I have a question for you, Chris. Um, what, what the depth range, oh, we're, sure. at, we're at 3190 meters. Um, is that deep for Hymenaster or is Could that typical? Or? across it. That's typical, uh, right? Well, Hymenast, so Hymenast is probably uh, a bunch of different things okay. that, uh, Hymenaster is a garbage can. Okay. Because it's, you know, the genus was described by Walter Percy Slade in back in 1882. So there's a bunch of them, and they're not all the same, but they occur as shallow, uh, like in the Arctic. Pretty stable. They can occur so in a shallow water of 100 meters. Page. That's the first one. Um, know. Not, you know, you're not going to see them scuba diving, but you could definitely so see them in... Um, relatively, you know, close to shore, but but they definitely, from what I remember, some of the things that are called hymenaster can occur in water as uh, in depths as deep as 4,000 meters, and these really kind of squishy ones tend to be sort of in the you know 2,000 to 4,000 meter depths. Um, I mean, it's actually more typical to see like hymenaster at this depth than you know probably any of the other things. I'm kind of surprised, for example, that we haven't seen any Brasingids yet. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, I agree. I realize that there have been a limit. There's been limits to dive. To up or down, or? I've noticed that we haven't seen a single Brasingid since nope. we hit the Mid-Atlantic. That is true. Right. I didn't have my mic on. I've been sort of letting science yep. drive. We usually see at least one. Because they've been yeah, such so a really strange. Uh, Agreed. But um, anyway, um, headed forward. there are lots of mysteries here, and it could just be that the... Uh, the sedimentation or some other aspect interferes with their feeding um, or, you know, any number of other potential reasons. But uh, we'll find my the, the, you know, one of these days, I think I'm actually going to collect one of those hymen after and woe be the <laughs> biology PI who has to, to, to deal with that. So we'll see. But uh, 
We've anyway, been, we've been uh, dealing with pro plenty of mucus right, out here. We can handle it. <laughs> All right. Thank I'm you, sorry, Chris. What was that? I said we've been dealing with plenty of mucus out here. Thank we you. can handle it. <laughs> well, maybe the next one I see then. Thanks. Bye bye. Take care. I think Chris is on a very delayed phone line there, so it's uh, hard not to talk over. So what we were looking at while um, Chris was describing that last slime star that we saw was uh, Primnoid octocoral. Got some really nice close-ups of it there. And we had seen one earlier on our dive, and we took a sample of it. And so that's why I wasn't too concerned about describing it at the time. Um, we're doing a pilot change, and so this is why we'll be hovering in the water for a couple of minutes here as the pilots update each other in a situation. So let me finish off on the silica thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at a paper here on glass sponges, a nice review of glass sponges, and it does say that uh, the, the skeleton is a delicate scaffold of siliceous spicules, some of which may be fused together by secondary silica deposition to form a rigid framework, and that silica is deposited in the form of amorphous silicon tetraoxide, I think, but it just went to sleep. Well, let's try that again. The silica is deposited yeah, in the form of amorphous opal. Yeah, about Would you show me real quick? Uh, yeah, so, you know, plan um, is heading opal towards is, a, two? is a waypoint silica two. based, okay. uh, naturally three. occurring like we, uh, uh, not tracks, so mineral. We call it a mineral the, the And that's because uh, uh, right. in order we'll to be a mineral, it has and to have uh, what, like uh, eight minutes or preset so delay? Uh, characteristics. It's got to have a For defined chemical yeah. structure. So. I think that's it's got to be naturally sport. occurring, okay. and it's got to be crystal. And right. so though. the it, it fits the first two, um, but that third one, it actually has a non-crystalline structure. It's got an amorphous structure. So all of those silicate chains are kind of, as I said, kind of a bowl of spaghetti. Um, and so it doesn't have that defined crystallographic lattice. Um, and I, I think I remembered that correctly, because it's been a while since I've thought about the three things that define a mineral from geologic terms, so, yeah. I think I'm looking at a diagram of the spaghetti yeah. that you're uh, yeah, referring exactly. to um, in the formation of this, uh, what they call the giant basal spicule in Monorephus chunai, and um, I have to still dig out this paper, but this is one going, fantastic Good, image How are you? of a scientist Good. holding and one of these spicules, and it uh, looks to be six or more Last feet move in was 10 wow. meters at, at a 195. That is huge. 195. Would you like me to line up with that heading? Uh, yes, please, co-pilot. Roger that. Uh, target bearing to waypoint two, however, is a two, two, three. So, so I, I think you should uh, find local high. Uh, Mike uh, Beckione in the chat that. room has um, provided a What's, potential uh, identification of that acorn worm that we were looking at earlier. Once you're comfortable uh, with uh, kind of that. golden color. Turgivillum. Before that, Cinnabarnum. it looks like they were moving Cin at like a 2 1 Cinnabarnum. 0. So that might be a good place right. to start. Okay. Turgivillum. Yeah, I can't get too much more on blue view than that. All right. That kind of suggests that we're. Oh, maybe not. Cinnabar. I wonder Let's if that's see. for a place. Uh, well, you know, uh, when I see that, I think of the, the mineral cinnabar, which is mercury sulfide. Oh, so yeah. maybe the color. Yeah. Okay. So that's the chief okay, ore yeah, of the mineral kinda, mercury. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense with the uh, MGS. Yeah, I could buy that. What's serious? Based on the color at, of that yeah. one. Yeah, pretty steep. Yeah, it's wall looking here. that steep. Coming but here it, around 210 or so. Mm -hmm. Similarly, cinnabar, the name of the mineral, is, is derived from ancient Greek, which I think is All for right. that color. I'll start heading so. that way. Roger that. Oh, it looks like I'm already kind of out in front. Mm -hmm. Yep, good positioning right now. I'm looking 190 at the moment. Okay. Have you on the left side of my screen? So one of the things that, that we right, mentioned briefly when you, to said when you think about pillow basalts that are kind of mid-ocean ridges, you think of that kind of those striations on those pillows. And so that striations, those now, are, those are interesting. Can, uh, um, you can think of it as that pillow is forming yeah, and that internal magmatic that magma static zero. pressure is Sounds increasing. Good. When it breaks out, it. sometimes it breaks the outer crust Bridge. and then this just keeps ROV expanding. Now. and that. That interior rind that's expanding is I'd almost like move. taffy. Ready. Right, it's the consistency of a taffy. So you can think about pulling taffy in one direction and kind of the striations you get that line up with that pull. Yep. Two knots, please. Good copy. Thank you. Thanks, Nath. 
I see these, uh, you know, these frozen in time pillows, and I'm thinking about the classic, I don't know, it's National Geographic from when I was a kid in the 70s of the uh, pillows oh, being extruded underwater. In, and what uh, I assume let's was keep Hawaii. a close eye on zero, just trying to get a good like estimation of how long it takes for you to feel that. Copy I feel that. like I'm seeing but, way uh, into the I past. I believe it was roughly seven to eight into the minutes 1970s. this morning. Okay. <laughs> You just put that in. Like I said, way in the past. Go by the very in. beginning. Okay. Copy that. Yeah, Mike Vecchione is saying um, Cinnabarnum is the Latin the, adjective the for Cinnabar. Or zero. Two, zero. Two, two, one, zero. Zero. Copy. Yes, yeah, so you can swing around to 210, Copilot. Okay, that's going to keep you on the far left of my screen here. Yeah, that's okay. I'll start working my way starboard. Roger that. Here's 210, Pilot. Okay, thank you. Your uh, main camera's pointed up pretty high. Okay, video. Uh, Copilot noticed a dot in the lower left-hand side, something on the lens of HD2. Copy that. Coming up a little bit here. A couple more colonies of these uh, primnoids uh, up on that pillow just coming into center. Very pretty. And so, you know, I, I, it's, it's interesting and it's always nice to be a little validated in my assumptions of the way I hope things work. And so when we were on those lower slopes of this portion, I think we saw things that were much more fragmented and a little bit more of a talus mixture. And that's when we were on those slopes that were, you know, kind of 40 degrees-ish. And when we saw that nice elongate pillow, that, that breakout pillow, ahead, that bitch. was kind of the transition of when we got into Good these copy. lower Thank slopes you. of kind of 20 degrees, 25 degrees, which I think are much more reflective of kind of primary placed piles of pillows. Primary placed piles of pillows. <laughs> That move yeah, is good. That's four. Pilots. Oh, almost there. Yep. Copy. Pretty. Pretty. Copy that. Thank you. Pretty primary piles of pillows. There you go. So you should be able to do that, that trick that uh, Dive Soup was talking about and track your forward movement by watching. If you don't haul in any, mm -hmm. which I will. Okay. I'm out. I'm way out front, so we don't have to worry about the delta so much. Roger that. Yep. Yeah, I'm done hauling in for now, and we shouldn't be feeling the move for another few minutes still. I'll keep an eye on it. Watch leads pilot. Uh, just so you're aware, I'm just slowly centering back up. And uh, I'm very far out in front of Sirius right now, so we're waiting for Sirius to catch up before continuing on. Copy that, pilot. Does that mean if we see something uh, right in front of us, we can zoom on it? Absolutely. Great, thanks. So let's see. Just uh, at about I want to what's that? Almost seven o'clock now. I can't tell if I'm looking at a brown color on the front of a rock or something on right the up. rock. So the lower part of the screen. Okay. Just yeah, it's about center right now. Maybe laser's the on it yeah. right now. Yep. The, okay. the right laser is on it now. Okay. Video when I'm you're ready. Like you can a go in. Brown curl. What am I seeing there? Must be the rock is, uh, it's just the incrustation maybe has come off and you can see a little bit underneath it and there's various sponges. and That looks like a little toe of a pillow. So sometimes we get a little breakout and we just get a little uh, extrusion. Yeah. Um, okay. So probably if you look down to the left there, you see there's a wiggly little white line. I'll bet that's a carnivorous sponge back in there. We don't need to zoom on it. Okay. It's okay. Thank you. Um, that's fine. 
Okay. Satisfied. Oh, what's walk, walking up here? Hey, buddy. So let's see. I think I saw one of these earlier. We weren't able to image it, so this is good. I think that is a hermit crab, a pagurid crab, that is carrying either an anemone or a, a zoanthid yeah, on its back. Man. And I think it's a zoanthid. And I think what you'll see is oh, wow. some finger-like structures that are sticking out. There's probably five of them. I can only see two right now. One is kind of facing towards me on the right side, and that's the tentacles that have been withdrawn. Um, I wonder. I wonder if this is a zoanthid or just an anemone. But this is very characteristic for this group of crabs. They carry uh, either an anemone or a zoanthid on the back instead of a snail. And is it carrying something in its left leg, or am I... Yeah, it looks like there's a... Is there a black coral down there? Is it carrying it? I can't tell what's going on. It looks like it's carrying it. Or is it growing on its leg? Well, are its front legs encrusted? Yeah. Yeah, I always see that. I'm not sure what they're encrusted with. I think that's an encrustation, but yeah. they're always just, like that. You I know? think he just bumped in and stopped on that coral. He might be holding it in the claw. Yeah, the far left oh, I see what you're saying, Ron. Gotcha. He's knocking it over. He's tilting it forward. Very good. So if we could focus a bit on the coral, let's see if that's a hydroid or a sea pen or a black coral. I think it's actually a black coral. We turn on the extra lights that? at about 50%. Fogs you can see 50. now on the crab in the back right, you can see the individual tentacles in that brown ring. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of retracted right now. So you can see it's an old snail shell and whatever this is, zoanthid or anemone is growing on top of it. So that's cool. Oh, that's nice view. Yeah. And you can see more tentacles hanging down underneath it. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to turn to face the pilot? And the fact that there's two Video's sets of clear. tentacles tells me that's okay. a zoanthid. Cool if light. it was an anemone, there would just be one. Sirius is on the move. Very good. I'd say uh, probably I was lucky. six and a half, seven minutes. But So it's not yeah, an empty shell. All right. Are clear. Oh, well, the, the shell is empty except for Extra the abdomen of the crab, yeah. which is stuck in there. Okay. But there's no snail alive there's no, yeah, there's, yeah, there's nothing else Correct. in there. Okay. Okay, so I'm go up snail shell, no snail, but living on the snail shell is a zoanthid. So the zoanthid gets to sort of travel around, and as the crab's making a mess and eating mm -hmm. food, the zoanthid is just picking stuff out of the yeah. water. And I did turn to left a little to keep you in view. So And possibly, I'll right. I don't know if it's uh, some benefit to the crab by um, deterring predators. You know, if it sucks into the shell, then it's just, ew, what's on this shell? I don't want that. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see this, this pillow that's broken and come down, and there's a beautiful example of those striations running vertically. So that's kind of like where the pillow is stretched out after the exterior crust is broken. It's almost forming this kind of striations to a viscosity similar to like taffy. Okay, so you said you were moving. You felt like you were moving. Yeah, it was hard to tell since I, I had to turn to face you a little bit, so it kind of... But I think it was probably yeah, six and a half or seven minutes at least. Okay. And how long ago was that? Do you have any feel? We started moving at what? 17.05. So, yes. 17.05. So I think around 17.12 I was definitely moving. Okay. So then we, how, I, how long did the move take? I imagine a 10 meter move was just a few minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, it was complete well before I felt it. All right, so then we might be stationary right now with Sirios. And so we see more of these these lava tube structures in front of us, these these large pillows, and as we they're didn't evacuated a few of ago, lava so. inside of them, either well, to feed a breakout or yeah, another two minutes start moving yeah. down slope. Yeah, we get I'd these uh, empty tubes, but we see something near. interesting. All right, well then I no, think I was I was saying case, we also see this we can get skim coming across, like you're. I'm at the very edge mm -hmm. of the tether. Yep. I'm okay with the move. Okay. Copy that. Let's see. How steep is it? Don't want that to go in the lens. Oh, no worries. 
You can also like string together a couple of tens if you'd like, rather than trying to. Yeah, I think I think we, I just want to make sure we keep them coming. Copy. I'll call in an, another ten if you guys are ready. Sounds good. Yeah. That two ten works for you. Yeah. Two one zero for sure. Bridge. This is ROV Nav. We have another move if you're ready. Range one zero meters, Mike bearing two zero by. degrees, uh, speed we zero decimal so two knots. Concentrating on it. I saw a green wispy pile of gunk, huh. greenish brown. I don't know what it was. That'd be kind of sad. This some plastic sure down here. Pretty sure it was uh, squid ink. Good copy, bridge. Squid ink. Okay. Is that something that you wanted to take a look at, Watchley? Nope. Okay. Thank you. I was I was telling I'm somebody this anecdote of one of my first cruises I was on, which is uh, kind of northwestern Maine, the Hawaiian Islands, around the island Niiau. Sorry, just and, uh, like footsteps. Yeah, footsteps. And uh, and we were kind of in the abyssal plane. We were far enough away from the island, so we were kind of Pilots, in the abyssal plane. It was a night the, shift, uh, and all we saw was we were logging this, of course. It's an extensive oh. abyssal plane, Got extensive sure. abyssal plane. Nothing interesting. Got to go and back and nothing interesting, at least for the igneous uh, geologists aboard. Right. Um, would and you, then um, in the middle of the abyssal plane, the we found sitting there all alone, perfectly, the like angle. basically standing upright, uh, was an empty Pepsi bottle from like the 1970s. Sure so. yeah. 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 Yeah, it was a little, uh, a little unnerving. Uh, pilot, if you want, um, zoom just below this big round rock just in the foreground. I think there's a brown sea anemone, so it's to the, yep, keep going down, and to the right of the lasers, right at the edge of the rock right now. Right at the right. Oh, to the right edge yep. of the rock? Yep. Okay. It's on the sand. Okay, I think I see what you're talking yep. about. So that sort of lump, I okay. believe, is the second uh, viewing we'll have of this uh, sea cucumber. That is uh, okay, I'll sit down. covered itself in shell hash and uh, other sedimentary material here, so it's hard to tell and see the body, it's but like lots of it time. is a sea cucumber deposit feeder. Okay, and this is the video. one that earlier Chris Ma said clear. had been, looked similar to one that had been named um, so after a, been a famous sea, sea uh, you, cucumber pilot. biologist. Oh, there, you can very nicely see this, the shell hash there and is moving for us to prove to you that it is alive under there. And it's wearing this very attractive suit of armor made of, uh, I guess, pteropod shells mostly, I think is what I'm seeing. Indeed, the lower it, it, It's interesting because it reminds me actually one of my favorite rocks, which is a, a coquina, which is kind of a oh, that video? partially Can mineralized and lower concreted left? conglomeration a of bit shells left. And, and forearms. Um, uh, go down yeah, to the so lower left section. Olaf oh, okay. Linus is uh, also what Cindy Van Dover is suggesting here. Oh, good. You can see the feeding tentacles, feeding podia at the ahead, left end there. So, Copy. again, Thank hidden you. underneath all that shell hash. Right, so these are complete. the same sort of tube feet that you see in sea stars, but these ones are modified. You have the frilly end, and you'll see it extend down to the sediment surface so, and grasp yeah, it just like a hand, four making a fist, and grabbing stops. some sediment, and then I'll curve that into the mouth and ingest it. Great stuff. Video's clear. Now yeah. it's a little shy. It's just frozen in place. Definitely looks like it was rolled in cornflake. Yep. Is there anything else on this nope. in particular? Okay. This is good. All right. And so I, right, I, well, co I might have missed it. Uh, is there a reason why? Let's just try and do our best to, you know, keep Why does it coming. cover itself? I think this, this terrain, and so far well, at least, at is... Yeah. Uh, why? I don't know. Yeah. You know we can make some just so yeah, stories. No, I, I, mean, I always it, wonder about things that are camouflaged in the deep sea where uh, there's yeah, no light. I mean, I'm still... Like I mean, is there, is there anything that, that, that yeah, preys on those? We have not moved yeah, good yet question. from the oh, previous move. Oh, hold on. Is there a Tina oh, no. for? Oh, no. There's a, this is an isopod, I'm sure, that just uh, swam up. up off screen, top center, really small. You'll see two long trailing with our legs, actually. There they go. That's <laughs> just off the top of the screen again. There he is. It's going to be flapping. Those rear legs. I'm pretty sure that's uh, what we call a water walker. Isopod with some extremely long legs. You can go in, video. I'll, uh, I'll try and do a move roughly eight minutes. Okay. So that will give us two minutes to do the move and then six minutes to swing. Yeah, it's really small. Two minutes to it's do pretty the far move, away. It Sounds looks good, like yeah. um, gelatinous it. zooplankton, we'll but it's actually needed. a crustacean. Yep. And then I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing it obviously but just for a rule of thumb that that sounds great Copy that. Yeah, thank you 
Here, I'll get a little bit higher. So yeah, what you see pull. beating there are actually the, the back sets of legs, the legs that are under the abdomen. We call those the pleopods. And the long trailing things are the thoracic legs. And this is essentially uh, a roly-poly, uh, you know, a deep bathyl roly-poly with extraordinarily long legs. Video's clear. Anopsid isopod, okay, thing, like Becky Owen says. Thank you. So they call them, uh, on, I think that's the ones they call the water walkers, but I may be wrong. The water walkers may use those other long legs to sort of paddle. What was I going to search? Oh, yeah. Terrain looks pretty consistent in blue view. Yeah, do you see anything? How far away is it for you? What, like, uh, I came up a little bit the there when you did, uh, but right now about 25 the, meters mm -hmm. out. Okay. At my current altitude. I think we're moving finally from that first ship move. Second ship move, rather. And so if you're just joining us, we're on the Kirchhoff Fracture Zone on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We're All right, 175 so maybe we'll try it again. We'll try and uh, north when we're certain Azores, that Syrios is north the stationary. Of the northwestern island. We'll kind of we'll set Syrios up so that, the island you know, Corvo. no rotations or uh, we're diving on or hauling in or paying right out. We'll lateral offset we'll just try and verify. in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. You By know, right lateral, light. I mean, I mean if it, you it were seems on right to me. A segment mm -hmm. I just think of the Mid Atlantic yeah, Ridge looking north. Is there a sample in Jar 6? And the entire Mid Atlantic Ridge. No. That's Jar number one. Oh, move the rightward thing? from your position, about 20 kilometers. That's what we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at that, that fracture zone I'm where not sure. the Mid Atlantic Ridge moves. I just I see to something. The east. Yeah. yeah. I know they just the camera, so you can see a lot more than we used at to. A depth of okay. about so I think that's just a jellyfish that was through. You're and looking through your jar six into a one. Of about uh, by the way, Copilot, that is a swimmer. So if we can level, attempt so to avoid uh, hopefully about another going past that, that would go. be um, preferred. Been can you confirm that jar again? Diving jar number on the one. Yeah. As a swimmer. Large You're just looking through six. That's made up of these stacks stay away from of jar pillow one. basalts. These large lobes of basaltic lava that erupted underwater into these large piles. Um, we started the dive Which jars are currently uh, open? with a pretty, an area that was pretty heavily one, sedimented. One, so and three, as we've five. been coming up this slope, we're seeing more of these large pillow lobes that are actually uh, erupted in place here. We don't know the age of this feature. Um, it could be as old as, as maybe a million years, but based off of looking at the condition, I would say maybe uh, you know 100,000 at the oldest. Um, but we're taking some biological and geological samples on the way. That's pretty young for the old Earth. And that one did yeah, that hundred thousand years. Yeah. Well, I just got an email from uh, Dr. Mary Wixton at Texas A&M okay. so University. Two minutes, and, I'm gonna put uh, she's a crustacean right expert. She's not able to be in the chat, but she's watching along, and she says that that hermit crab we were looking at earlier is in the family Parapaguridae, and possibly the species Parapagurus nudus. She says that species lives at the depth we are sampling, and it carries zoanthids instead of sea anemones on its Ooh, shell other here. species in that family will carry sea anemones so uh thank See you really for nice that. in the multi -fame. mary mm -hmm. much appreciated really well tilting up a little bit And so if you're looking on camera one right now, it's interesting to me, you can just see how stark the transition is from one side of this little valley to the other. Um, on, on one side, uh, where it's sloping up 
to your left. Um, it's very heavily sedimented, and on sloping off to the right, uh, it video. tends to be much more uh, rubbly and pillow. Are we looking at midwater or the stuff in the background? Yeah, it's just. Okay. Ready, pilots? I'm going to put another Take 10 meter quick. move. You ready? Yeah. Yeah, I copy, copy that. Pretty sure Sirius is stable now. Bridge, this is RV Nav. Got another move if you're ready. Range one zero meters, bearing two one zero yeah, degrees, speed zero decimal two knots, please. Good copy, Bridge. Thank you. All right, lined up at two one zero. I'm gonna try not to haul in if I can. Okay. Contact at about 25 meters right now. ROV, with our current rate, what do you think the chances is of us making our next waypoint right on the kind of that first crest? Yeah, I was actually going to just calculate that now. Uh, give me a second, and oh, yeah. I will get back with an estimation. No worries. Thank you very much. Yep. And so one of the reasons I'm, I'm interested in trying to make the top of this, uh, this kind of this bathymetric high is that we see a lot of these really large in-place pillow basalts, which means this entire mound is, is part of a volcanic structure. Now, that's a little disingenuous because the entire Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a large volcanic structure. The top kilometer or two are formed by these pillow eruptions. But unlike some of the areas that we've been diving earlier, where we've been on the tops of these normal faults and we see a lot of these pillows uh, dissected and rubbly and fragmented in place. Uh, lately on this dive, we've been seeing a lot of really well-defined in-place pillows, which means this structure that we're in probably hasn't undergone a lot of post-depositional uh, deformation. These pillows haven't been erupted and then fractured or heavily sheared. They've been erupted here in place. And so if we get to the top of this feature, and this entire feature is indicative of a large volcano that was erupted here and placed here, at the top of it, we should see maybe some uh, younger volcanic products. We should see some younger pillows, more intact pillows. And looking at the bathymetry, it actually looks like there might be okay, pilots, three or four little looks individual like pit craters that to get the waypoint to we're about this 130 meters away, or at least uh, Sirius is. Okay. Uh, stand by one. I think we can jump up to 20 meter moves. Go ahead, Bridge. Good copy, thank you. Yeah, I think I'd be good with that too, pilot. Uh, stand by one, pilots, I was potentially mistaken. Video swapping out. Good copy, video. So pilots, for us to get to waypoint two and then to waypoint three, we need to maintain a decimal one, two, five, which I think is doable. Yeah. Uh, going at decimal two moves, I might bump them up to 15 if you feel comfortable. Yeah. We can always bring them back down. I'd um, go ahead. But uh, I, I'd say we just keep keep rolling. I, f I think I've, I feel comfortable at decimal two, 15s. Copy that. Same here. Hey, watch the lead. This is Nav. Yep, go ahead. I, I don't know if you overheard me. Yep. Um, yeah, it looks like we have to maintain a decimal 125 uh, average to get all the way to waypoint 3. Okay, waypoint 3 is that's the. Um, I, uh, Someone took over the, the Flader Mouse scene that I was looking at on MV2 proc. Um, so just to be clear. Um, yeah, so. Uh, that's waypoint, the first on the hill. Uh, so, waypoint two is the first on the hill. Yep. Waypoint three is the local high of this yep. feature in the south. Yeah, so I yeah I didn't expect to make waypoint three, so don't even worry about that. You know, that was just kind of a, another point to draw in case we got to waypoint two and we needed a direction. Copy. Um, uh, if we're only trying to get to waypoint two, that gives us a little bit more time. But, we, but, at, but at the same time, don't. 
Yeah, don't necessarily take it completely out of the... Yeah. Okay. It, it'd be nice to see some of that elevation. It's just not a, it's not mission critical in my sense. Good copy. Yeah. We only need to maintain a decimal zero 05 to get to waypoint 2 by the end of the dive where we've okay. extended it. And um, um, We'll keep moving as if we're going to waypoint 3. Perfect. Worst case scenario, we find something cool, stop, sit, look at it, sample it, and we know we have time to make it to waypoint 2. Perfect. And, and I'm sure, I know Scott wants to sample another octocoral, so that'll, depending on the what, where, and when, I'm sure that'll take some time, and I'll probably want to try and grab another rock or two. So. Copy that. We'll uh, keep scooting unless you guys ask us to stop. Nope. Sounds perfect. Thank you. Sounds good. Sirius looks like it's moving based on the sonar. Okay. So what kind of, what delay was that? When did that last move get made? Yeah. Uh, last move was completed at 17.28. 28. So about so. five minutes uh, total. Okay. So roughly... Uh, I'd say, yeah, six minutes. Um, I will keep eight-minute moves, uh, but I'll bump up to 15 meters. That sounds good. Sorry. Yeah. Copy. And so, again, we're just looking at kind of a stack of these um, pillows that have kind of started to break up their exterior surface and kind of uh, fall down as, as talus is strange. I as see that rubble. vivid purple thing in the manips, and I do not see it in the main. Uh. Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. Okay, I'm starting to go to the right. Okay. I see you've fallen in love with the sea cucumbers. Yeah, oh. those those. Oh, sorry about that. Purple power eaters. Yep. These are these little black sponges on the left, on the rock face. The, these blue things? Yeah. 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 They're yeah. actually transparent. What yeah. you're seeing is there's sediment on the rock around them. Mm -hmm. And so where the sponges are, you're seeing more through to the mm -hmm. rock. But they're transparent. They're throwing me off. I keep yep. thinking that there might be little inclusions oh, in the rock surface. He's on a bamboo coral. Oh. And the bamboo coral is still alive because I can see the polyps there. Huh. Okay. I would be a paper right there if this thing was feeding on the bamboo coral, and it's not. So, Chris, it's not. I'm telling you. I'm writing that paper. Yeah. Actually, I do think I see maybe an apicophron worm there. That could be feeding on it. So what is the main diet of those, sea, those uh, cucumbers, sea cucumbers? Uh, sediments. Just sediments. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The okay. only one that I know that does not feed on sediments are the uh, solid sea cucumbers. Which have right, modified. The, actually, move. I should say the only one. Uh, in the deep sea, two, yeah. one, they've zero. modified Sounds their great. oral protea that they use for picking up the sediment. We have another and it move when you're up, ready. And it's more like a series Range of tentacles one that we five see on the fan worms and the corals two, and so on. One, zero, and so they're three, suspension speed okay. zero, okay. Now there are two knots, other please. sea cucumbers who will burrow into the soft sediment and stick their head end up and extend their podia into the water. So they're kind of like Good suspension copy, features also, you. but they're not as highly modified. Right, they're very recognizable yeah, as this. Uh, but the solids sometimes are hard to recognize. You'd think you're looking at an anemone maybe yeah. from a distance. If you okay. looked at it closely and you picked it up, you'd know this is not an anemone. Kicking up that sediment, aren't I? The prop wash. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Mike uh, Vecchione just remind me. I completely forgot. There's another highly specialized. Uh, sea cucumber called Pelagiothuria, and 
as the name suggests, it's pelagic, very unusual thing. It spends all of its life in the water column, and so that would also be a suspension feeder. And uh, Mike, maybe you can uh, help me. I suspect that produces a fair amount of mucus, so it binds up some of the stuff that's uh, floating around with it. We saw a lot of those in the uh, Central Pacific look at the on uh, some of our cruises during Capstone. They're just fascinating animals. Looking down and now up. There we are. Don't have too much of a view on it, but might be blocked by that pile of rocks in front of you. Yeah. As you come up, you'll get a little better view there. So I finally found some of the text that I was searching yeah. for uh, earlier, Ashton, to follow up on our discussion of silica in um, glass sponges. And so this is from a paper that was looking at some of the chemistry and engineering behind um, the spicules. And it says, the combination of spongin protein with silicon dioxide extracted from seawater by silicatine protein. So there's a genetic component to this that produces a protein that grabs that silica presents a natural so nanocomposite material of unique minutes, optical right? and mechanical minutes. properties. Yeah, I believe so, pilot. Mechanically, it combines the elasticity of the protein move. with the so flexibility and durability of silica. So we see the it, light so propagation inside spicules of glass until, uh, sponges is of substantial interest for developing novel elements again? for photonics applications. I agree with that. The yeah. glass sponge spicules have remarkable light guiding properties. Hmm. So I remember from looking at that paper, which is, you know, it's not a biology paper, it's well beyond uh, my understanding, but is that uh, for industrial uses and fiber optics, mm -hmm. they found that these were much more transparent and could be better translate uh, light. And so they were wondering, you know, how do these sponges, how do the sponge cells deposit uh, that amorphous silica to produce such a, a great fiber optic cable, basically? Yeah, and so, you know, while all of these, these pillow flows are, are silica dominant, you know, these we classify um, igneous rocks based off their, their silica content. You know, basalts that we're looking at now are typically less than 52, 53% silica. You can imagine most of the silica is bound up in the rock. It's not mobile, right? So it's not necessarily getting into the water column. So, you know, most of the silica that enters the ocean on an annual basis is, is actually terrigenous. It's, it's from fluvial input from rivers and streams from uh, eroded sediments uh, on continental land. And there's another beautiful example on the left of one of those cross sections of those pillow lavas where the lava has been evacuated out to feed another break. Sure. And then, but it's only been evacuated out a little bit initially, and it's had enough time to skim over and form a top cooling surface. And then another breakout happened, and it drained down a little bit more. And then another breakout happened, and it drained out a little bit more. And then, you know, that one plate, two plate, and then that third gap, and it's solid all the way down. And that means that breakout of that next little pillow never happened. It stopped. And so sure. all that magma had an opportunity to solidify in that pillow tube. I'm really glad okay. we saw this one because I, when I earlier saw this sort of uh, texture, I hadn't thought about the way you're describing it, and I thought it was being from the bottom up. And now I totally get that it's mm -hmm. forming from the top down mm -hmm. as you get each uh, tube within a tube within a tube mm -hmm. and a little bit of shrinkage yep. as it's cooling and so on. Yeah, very cool. I also find very cool that sponge that's draped over the yeah, uppermost nice ledge the there. Out. Yeah. Yeah, now, okay. now the subaerially, the upper inside surface of those are, 
they're very smooth yeah. um, on a larger scale, but then um, they're also very, uh, they've got overlaying on that smoothness is actually this, this really, really sharp prickly rugosity. And so it's, it's smooth because of that interior glassy texture. Um, and then prickly because it's got, got all these little drips of, of lava. Now that's uh, sub aerially, but, but on submarine, it looks like there's a bunch of little, uh, yeah, there's a rough sorry, surface that gives down. all those little microorganisms okay. little anchor points. You, it, this close-up is uh, fantastic. As you can see, there's all these little sponges. We just saw that little red, pink amphipod sitting yeah, there. Yeah, get closer um, and put a toe down. We can get nice, stable. Uh, I mean, if you're, if we're here anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. we got plenty of time to wait. Okay. Um, okay. We we do lots of zooms here, mm -hmm. and we see lots Come of great stuff, but we don't always zoom really tightly degrees. on the bottom and on the Perfect. rock if we don't otherwise see something, you know, macro that we're interested in. And yet, it's covered in life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's all over the place. And it just takes a matter of seeing it at a fine enough scale. Um, so that's kind of remarkable, just how many sponges are actually okay. on that Set. rock. No, it's kind of a little uh, sponge apartment building. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. You can go in video. Multi-level. Yep. That top one, I guess, has the best view. In the penthouse, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's got a balcony right on the edge. Rooftop access. Protected from the detritus mm -hmm. dropping down above. You could maybe try pulling in the uh, starboard lower or fog lights to get some more light. I'm thinking Copy to that. the uh, left of the sponge, there's those couple of uh, tube-like things oh, that are, wow. one looks like an S. Mm -hmm. I guess those are worms. Look at all the stuff in there hanging from your ceiling. Oh, there's an old cup coral. Fogs Look at that. 50% if we so need more. So that dark structure upper Just right hold of the sponge the is a cup coral that's been okay. long dead and has been encrusted. You can see now it's all black, but you see those uh, plates that are subdividing the wide uh, diameter. Uh, those are the septa of the cup coral. That's how I could recognize that it's not just part of the rock. Okay. What else we got in there? I'm not sure. You know, a lot of this hanging stuff, I don't know if these are little mud sticks that are built by amphipods or I these are down a little bit or? Um, foraminiferal okay. single-celled organisms that are making these things. And you, you asked this earlier, you know, that rock we got up from okay. Moeteria was covered in this sort mm -hmm. of stuff. So we preserved it. So I hope that somebody will be able to identify it and that I'll stumble across. There's a little have. worm going for a walk on the right-hand side. Right hand side over here. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, so that's a polychaete worm. Uh, polychaete the is the worm. major group the of um, and the no on the wall okay. in the back out of focus Take upper right. Out. Long light. Long tube. There you yeah. go. Now you got it. It's got kind of a reddish. Uh, I'll call it a neck <laughs> because it seems to have a long tubular head after that. You can see all the uh, paddle-like okay, limbs called the parapodia. Okay. There, it's using them to sort of crawl along the surface, and it has these um, short, too late, <laughs> tentacle-like <laughs> structures that it uses to sense the substrate, looking for its prey. This one looks pretty mobile. Now, I, I know you already have an appreciation for the rocks and the geology, but I'm going to say something that I hope makes yeah, it appreciated even more. Okay. Because okay. we were talking well, about the, the yeah, infauna and the epifauna and how we don't have an opportunity to study the infauna because we, yeah, we can't really observe it. Um, but I would argue that Jeremy, maybe features like this, like this evacuated so pillow basalt with this beautiful cross-section, give us a little Thanks. glimpse into kind of those infauna right, that well, hide in the rock crevices and give us an opportunity to look inside and see those organisms that are not necessarily prone on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell me I'm wrong. Well, dead. it's just that uh, essentially they're already. on the outside Thank of the rock, but they're tucked on the underside yeah. of it. So I agree with that. Two, that. There are a whole series of organisms that can literally be in this rock. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So not necessarily ones that bore into the rock yeah. or live in the sediment, but the ones that spend most of their life maybe hiding yeah, nice. in the rock. So absolutely, in the cracks and the crevices yeah. that we wouldn't otherwise get Good to copy see. Bridge. So Thank you. I, too, appreciate your little pillow empathy. Everybody loves a pillow. Okay, to bring pogs down. Yeah. This one back For there kind of reminds me of the hungry, hungry caterpillar. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, it, you know, it would have been amazing to, to see that actually form because it would have been this large bulbous structure yeah, that would have formation. moved forward That's a couple cool. inches and then cooled and then another bulbous head would have broken out of that foot, that, that toe, and moved forward a little bit more and then moved forward a little bit more. So actually kind of moving like if you, if you imagined... 
a caterpillar, but that caterpillar moved, and then every time that caterpillar stopped, another caterpillar like another caterpillar exploded out of that <laughs> caterpillar's head and then moved forward a little bit. And so a series of escalating and cascading exploding caterpillars is very are similar. Are they ever happen. smaller caterpillars? Or are they, they so big they're no, just causing the person to burst open? Sometimes they're small and sometimes I think we saw a little pillow toe, yeah. right? Just a little thumb that came out of a larger feature. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hmm. I've been thinking how to describe this because yeah, you know, I've had to draw it and it makes a lot more sense when you draw it, but maybe the exploding caterpillar analogy is the one I'll, I'll work I, with. I, I understood it perfectly yeah. before, but oh, now the, I'm going to have geology nightmares of caterpillars throwing up new caterpillars, the throwing sand. up new caterpillars. Well, I think that's only fair because I'm going to have nightmares of deep sea spiders. So, exactly. Yeah. Well, we'll hear each other screaming yeah. through the bulkhead. Yeah. Caterpillar spiders. Pillow lava. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like it's something on the lens. Uh, pilot, as you get up to the pillow that's coming into um, the frame, yeah. getting to center now, there's a stick standing straight up. Okay. I think this is now maybe the third or fourth time we've seen this. I think it's just this best of pluma um, carnivorous sponge, and they're just so tall, um, really erect, really straight. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about silica, so this is another one. Um, the main axis of this sponge is formed of silica fibers. Is this something that you'd like to zoom on? Yeah, let's uh, please yeah. do that, and then we can verify it's what it is. And what we should yeah. see uh, are small filaments coming off of either side. I can already see some of those filaments. Okay. So it's not going to have polyps, mm -hmm. all right? Okay. It's not a coral. Yeah. This is just a really odd sponge. We tend to think of sponges as these globular... Uh, sort of soft things that hold a lot of water, but this is a whole different uh, family of sponges that have adapted okay. a new lifestyle. They no longer funnel the water through their bodies. All right, I'm kind of instead forward snag and back things too, which will on their hook the like a little bit. spicules. That's indeed what it is. So, all right, let me center up on it, and I'll go down slowly. Okay. So one of the things we can look for is if we see um, swellings, especially if they're discolored swellings along the stock, that would be evidence of where the cells have encapsulated some zooplankton prey. I'm not seeing any at this level. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I actually was adjusting my Z-bias. Go ahead, Bridge. I'll be able to fix that this time. Good copy. Thank you. And those filaments oh, that stick out the fast, side of the sponge, it? which are also silica, I imagine, are just okay. to increase Good. the surface area over which it snags its prey. Okay. Yeah, I don't see much. I think I saw one item on that sponge. So maybe I don't know what the frequency is with which they eat. Thanks. I like that shot. That was nice, Brian. Or yeah, I was how actually. Often they have to. Eat. I was going to ask you that earlier. That's a interesting question because you were talking about. I was as soon as you talked about catching its it's catching something and then enveloping in its cells. It made me immediately okay, think, well, we can get how big of a thing shot. can it envelop I and then back how way long can it go in between Probably meals? Yeah. yeah so focus. the temperature down here is 3.38 degrees Celsius. So it's really right. cold. Looking down. And what that does in part is it affects biology by affecting the physiology, the rate of reactions of enzymatic reactions. So everything here in the deep sea, that's good pilot. Here, let's do everything goes pretty slowly. Metabolism is pretty slow. So you don't down. necessarily need constant source well, actually, of food in float. order to survive. We'll go in one more time. This thing, you know, it builds the silica s skeleton and then it's well, a very passive here. collector mm -hmm. of prey. And so when something swims into it, okay, if it's if it's stuck now we can move our cells and we can digest Should it be and stationary, feed. However the answer is still to your question swing. about how yeah, big, yeah. I imagine, is it's got to be small enough that it can't just pull itself loose mm -hmm. from the Velcro. So that's an interesting comment you made about, uh, you know, it builds its skeleton first and then after that it's pretty uh, low needs. Sure. Yep. And so I guess um, for a lot of the sponges and the corals and things like that we're looking at, would you say most of their energy needs are front-loaded early on in their development when they're building that, that skeleton structure initially? or Yeah, not entirely because yeah. 
they don't have all that much energy packed into them as a larva. Mm -hmm. So they have to start feeding pretty early in life. Yeah. And so okay. all um, right. You'd have to it's not like, a bit. well, let's grow the skeleton for 20 years and then we'll start feeding. Oh, no. Right. I mean, uh, does it need to feed more when it's younger? I see. Yeah. Yeah. So many of the corals that I'm familiar with are always growing both in diameter mm -hmm. and apically at the tips. So I think they're always getting larger. They're yeah. always adding on to their mass. So in that case, I suspect okay, they wouldn't increase moving, their uh, consumption. I don't know about these sponges, but they're Copy pretty tall. Yeah. Um, sure there are a few corals that they seem to hit this growth limit. Let's say it's one meter, you know, mm -hmm. and then I guess they're not growing anymore. The exception to some of the things I'm saying is when it's time to reproduce. And so then you may have to either yeah. ramp up your energy <laughs> consumption or delay the time at which you can produce your gametes okay, until you have accumulated sufficient energy that you can di that. divert the energy from the off. maintenance of your tissue into the production really of sperm and eggs. sponge all you could, huh? Sure did. All right, so I'm going to... Sirio's caught up to me a little bit there, uh, watch lead, so I'm just going to push forward a little bit unless there's something that you want me to stop and take a look at. I think I think we're good. Just uh, proceed under your own guidance. Okay. Go ahead, sir, everyone. Tether's good. I'll uh, decrease delta as you push out. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, accidental firing of two on? of them, so they're I noted not. that they're okay. both taken at the same place. So we only have one left. We'll do that in a deep scattering layer. And so I'm always a little, I'm always a little dumbfounded and humbled um, when I go on a dive like this, and you have this conception of what you expect to see. So a couple of days ago, we were diving on the axial volcanic ridge that forms the center of the active portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, and I was expecting to see fairly young, fresh pillow basalts, really great pillow structures, some breakout structures, um, and it was almost completely sedimented over. Um, and it should have been some of the youngest areas we've dove on, you know, maybe just 10, 20,000 years. Now, here we're in an area where if, if the one interpretation of this being a transform fault is true, this area might be four or 500,000 years old. If it's an active center, then it's probably could be just as old as that portion of the AVR. So anywhere from 20,000 to a couple hundred thousand years old. Um, and it's more or less barren of sediment on these upper portions, on these upper slopes. Um, very great exposure. So it, it just goes to show you, you never really know what you're going to find. And it's dependent on so many things. It's dependent on the age of the crust, uh, the amount of primary production in the water column above you, the steepness of the slopes and the ability of that sediment to settle on you, ocean bottom currents, it's, a, it's local currents, it's, it's a range of confounding factors. Hey, pilots, it looks like direction to uh, waypoint two is going to be roughly a two, four, five. Do you mind if I adjust the moves in that direction? Sure. Copy that. And uh, we're making pretty good time. I'm going to drop them back down to 10 meter moves just in case we want to stop quick to look at a coral or take a sample. Copy that. Sounds good now. All right. I'm going to call one in now. Okay. Bridge, this is RV Nav. We have a move if you're ready. Range one zero meters, bearing two, four, five degrees, speed zero, decimal two knots, please. Good copy. Thank you. Ship move is underway. Copy now. 10 meters. 
camera's back down to 55 degrees, Andy. Um, whenever you're, you're comfortable, we'll line up uh, with that ship move. Okay. Serious. Yeah, you can go ahead and rotate. Might put you out of view if I do the full two. Every now five. and then, I'm seeing one of these uh, sea cucumbers like flipping by. Mm. <laughs> well, you There's quite you a lot can of go them. Go ahead. I'll, uh, They're surprisingly small. I'll move, I'll move over, or just put me to the edge. Yeah, yeah. Copy that. That's what I was thinking. All right. Sirius is looking two two five. I'll get on the other side of this stuff. Go ahead, Bridge. Good copy, thank you. ROV, just to confirm, we've got about, what, 45 minutes of bottom time? Like well, actually, spin. we have 48 minutes left on the bottom. Okay. 48. Thank you. And we are roughly 100 meters away from waypoint two, making good time. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, are we undergoing a move, finishing a move, or I might want to take a sample up here somewhere if we have an opportunity. Sure. Yeah. We can go ahead and do that. All right. You see that pillow right in front of you that's fragmented on the lower third of the screen? Yes. Yep. And there's a kind of a, another one of those little keystone uh, blocks right in the middle of it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. If we could try and grab that keystone or kind of dig around in there and see if we can get a... A uh, nice in. this one or? Uh, no the the one that's just left of the lasers it's um, kind of like a tall pentagon just to the left the left lasers on it now uh, I yeah see. all right I, I can try and move it I mean I can't really get my fingers aren't small enough to get in there no no it, it you know it, it should be you know if you kind of um, put a finger in there and kind of either drag it up or out um, it, it should be completely unattached and some of that stuff should break out and around but give it your best go and if it okay. doesn't seem doable we can always move on to another one would you like a little okay. more light pilot uh sure there you go and i'll get the hydraulics spun up for you okay thank you hydraulics are ready pilot okay i'm gonna back up a tiny bit um so you've used both rock boxes. Do you want a bio yeah, box you, for this uh, one? Oh, no, I'll, I'll put them. I can toss five rocks in the same box. Yeah. yeah. Sure thing. Yeah. I think they're they're distinct enough. There's space. Yeah. If, and that's the, you want it. No, and that's why that's why I like to take photos with my phone, too. And that yeah. way I'll just do a quick comparison. There you are. Sure. Yeah. And I'll follow as you move. Okay. What do you want to call this one? Um, 
uh, pillow rind two. Okay. But we'll wait till we get it up because it might be kind of pillow rind fragment two. Okay. Depending on how much of that inner surface is connected. Like a pro. And it right between your skids there. Okay. Yeah, it's sitting right down there. Mm -hmm. That so may be the biggest one. Yeah, so that's another, you know, beautiful in-place sample. We've got no doubt where it came from. It's got that nice uh, exterior surface on it. Oh, I thought I might get it. No. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to wait a yeah. moment. That was yeah, worth yeah. a shot. <laughs> it's like one of those crane machines, except you're blindfolded. <laughs> Could blow the suction sampler. Yeah, I thought if we did that, it'd probably spin up a bunch of stuff. We can try real slow. Can vacuum through jar six. Yeah, inhale, jar six. Stand by. This is why I hate We're sticking my hand in the right carburetor. Now. Yeah. You never know what's down there. Uh, Someone's going to turn it on. Where? I have that same fear, except mine's Maybe a little bit use? more because I do my own oh, home electrical. Oh, well, I'm way off then. <laughs> Would you still make, like Don't me to try to suction it? No. He learned everything off of oh, YouTube. Let's just wait a moment. Copy. Can we zoom in on Mini Zeus? Right there, right there. Yeah. Come wide with Mini Zeus, please. It's not as big as I first thought. Thanks, video. I'm just throwing dirt around doing this. I always want to imagine that manipulator hand can rotate at like 100 RPMs and just bring. Okay. So I'm indexed. So we got to back up a little bit and then you could bring the starboard box inboard. Copy that. Let me know when you're ready for a starboard box. Okay. Yeah, let me get a little bit more altitude. Copy that. Nice job pulling that out of there. Thank you. All right, you can go ahead. Copy that, wing inboard. Let me get a Full nice inboard. photo of it too. Okay. Um, yeah, that way I can just make sure I can identify. Okay. This, this one's got more worms than the other one. There you go.
Thank you, thank you. And then if we could also, sure. um, once it's secured, get a nice photo of that outcrop it came from. This is going starboard. Yep. Starboard, oh, not bio box. Starboard, oh, starboard rock box. Thank you. Okay. And that was what sample number? 10. 10. Okay. Uh, nine, nine, pardon me, nine. nine. Okay, when you're ready, co pilot. Or is that inboard all That's the way? full inboard, yes. Okay. Arvin, does that agree with your numbering? That's number nine. Thank you. Nine. We had two water samples. We had to give them each a different number. There's two different bottles, so I give them different numbers. You have to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what we've been doing for, uh, like when we have two things on one that have two different labels. We just like same thing. Take a photo, change the label. Same thing. Same. That would be the same. Thank as you. Here. Duplicate the clipping. Yep. Yeah. In fact, okay, Caitlin, in, in the video, Talk you can that. see both of them close at the same time so and craft secured yeah I don't know how they're going to treat it box full outboard could Did be and we wanted to get a yes. shot of the some nice retrieval site here. yeah some nice glamour shots of a broken rock with a big hole in the middle of it spinning down hydraulics a testament to the skill of the front row all y'all HP secure Okay, you can go in. If you'd like a top-down view with the mini Zeus, you're welcome to take that as well, pilot. All right, now video. Thank you. Yeah, that would be a nice one. What are you seeing here, Ash? When you look in the hole, uh, I see. Well, it's it's a good example. Layers, like you told me. Yeah, and it's a good example of you know this the the types sure. of outcrops that are nice to sample. You can imagine that if this pillow didn't have a breakout somewhere else where it evacuated all of that lava, it would have just been a solid giant rock and right. we wouldn't have been able to sample it. Um, and so the fact that it's this, this exterior shell where it's the magma has been evacuated there. out makes it really, really nice to sample. Um, yeah, you saw how how nicely that came out. No, I don't smell it. Yep. And if we could get one with the, with the lasers too. Thank you, thank you. And that, that, you know, the other thing that I always love is that that beautiful texture on the outside. So that that crackliness, um, we see that that's very indicative of, of pillow basalts. But we also get that uh, in more silicic systems. So Oops, sorry. Uh, volcanoes on land that have a higher silica content. Going back to that silica okay. con uh, uh, conversation we were having. Basalt, 52 or 53 percent or less Seriously silica. Nice uh, when we start talking okay. about more Good silicic shaping. systems of lavas that are uh, more rich in silica, and we right. start getting into the end Let's member uh, of those, what we call rhyolites. Those are really silica rich. Let's keep going. And the then. more silica that there is in the I lava, the the higher the viscosity, right? So the, the uh, tougher it is. More and, syrupy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so we get to this point where the lava doesn't flow really easily Good like you. the Back basalt Got that nice we're used to, there. and it actually okay. fragments. Push so forward. those more gotcha. silicic systems are much um, more explosive. They're able to resist that magmatic, uh, magmatic static pressure okay. until it fragments explosively. Now that, that texture we had on the outside of that pillow basalt is also a texture we get on some of those silicic systems. Uh, we call it actually, uh, we call it bread crust because it looks like the surface of a freshly baked loaf of bread that's kind of uh, crackled on the exterior. I think geologists like to just create analogies to food. Now you're making me miss my fresh baked bread. Yeah. You know, you could probably create a pretty awesome sourdough starter from 
maybe <laughs> something that you find yeah. at the bottom Scrape of the ocean. Off the rock. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It'd be unique. All right, looks like there's something kind of dead ahead. I think 245 might be taking us kind of away from interesting stuff, at least in the near term. Copy that. I defer to your discretion. Yeah, I, I don't want to have a situation like we did yesterday where most of the last 35 minutes was in blue water when we could have just stayed where we were. Oh, there's going to be something so awesome at the top. <laughs> I heard that it was this unique sponge and coral garden. Yeah. And and you know the most amazing thing about it? Unseen ever we before. Be hard pressed to reach I heard that two. We might it's a check throne. It nav. Something yeah, sitting I mean, up there I just throwing down pillows. Hitting oh, there you go. the exact point, I think, isn't really important. I think it's getting... Yeah, up the hill. Yeah. Yeah, copy that. At least I assume. Guess yeah, I no. Right. Yep. You well. said it right. 100% right. right. Yeah. I'm kind of just to curious to get to the ridge okay. crest at the top. Yeah, let's maybe do yeah. another move at 207. 10 meters. That works for me. Yeah, that's kind of what we were doing before the two tents. Hey, Bridge. This is RV now. Yeah, you guys ready for a move? That's 10 meters, 10 meters, bearing oh, 207 degrees. A, uh, or Tina saw Speed Tina decimal 2 knots. It's a good copy, Bridge. Everyone's got their own, own style. Some people sound a little bit more robotic. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. There's another example on the bottom left of the screen where you can see those striations in the pillow yeah, basalt. So you can actually tell which direction that pillow pilot. flow was okay. moving and being down. extruded out oh, yeah, um, by 17. the direction yeah, of the striations. It wasn't low enough. Oh, I see. Yep. We should have a little more room now. Okay. Yeah, I guess we'll have to wait around five minutes, six minutes, we were mm -hmm. saying. Six minutes, well, yeah. We may want to extend that move when it's done, too. I'm pretty far uh, away. Yeah, yeah, it's flat bottom right here. Uh, pilot, are you waiting right now for? Yeah. yeah can you zoom in then on the uh, sure. stick on the left? Yes, of I center? see it. Thank you. And then after that, we'll zoom in on the sediment right in front of it. Okay. Thanks. You bring a deep sea biologist to the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and all he does <laughs> is look at sticks. <laughs> look at stuff on the ridge. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, that's going to be a, a panatula, which is new for the day. But on the rock, I think. Yeah, At first well, I thought I can't it was another really sponge, but now I think closer, it's a bamboo but, ball. Um, I wanted to get a, a stable. All right, yeah, you can go in. Oh, that's interesting. I think it's a bamboo coral skeleton, but they're not polyps. They're all barnacles at mm. the top, and then there are several... Uh, ophiroids going down. Yeah, I think so. Uh, that's enough, pilot. I'd actually l like to look below the rock now okay. on the sediment, and you'll see there's a soft feather-like thing in the sediment. There it is. Yeah. So this is a classic sea pen, probably the one for which okay. sea pens were named, the Panatulacea. I think this is the genus Panatula. So you can see it's very much like a feather. It's got that central axis with these sort of fleshy lobes sticking out, and then sticks into the sediment with the fleshy peduncle. So one thing I haven't yet said during this expedition that's another cool thing about Go ahead, Ridge. Um, our understanding Perfectly, of the biology of the sea pens okay, is that should. that main well, structure you're wait, seeing yeah. with the whole yeah. axis going up and Ooh, those fleshy lobes coming up, that's one giant polyp. We call it Did the primary it? polyp. Mm -hmm. And it's the primary polyp that has a or? straight axial rod uh, inside yeah, of it. As well, since and then it's a all of the feeding transit. polyps are yeah, arising essentially from its series of arms. Yeah, Nav, I think hmm. we'll so uh, that's add cool. 10 more meters to that same move if we could. Bridge, this is RV Nav. Thanks. Nice. 
Yeah, I'd like a move same as last. 10 Washington meters, agrees, bearing that 207 peninsula. degrees, speed decimal 2. I can also see some uh, okay. lower down some of the uh, probably eggs. There's clusters of white spots category. where those fleshy lobes are leaving that central axis. And those would be uh, gametes that are being formed on the basis of uh, what we call mesenteries. These are um, folded sheets of tissue on the inside that subdivide the digestive space. Now, it, it's interesting to me that the okay, arms maybe. clearly start small, yeah, thank you. get big in the middle of the body, and then get small again. Yep. But it's not clear to me. The direction I'm facing is about why. 200 pilot. Okay. Right. Or it's not clear to me. Maybe because that part is actually older, the tip is younger, yeah. and it's putting out new arms. Okay. That makes it, sense, but then the, you know, it, like almost if it was, if it was. Why isn't it like. Yeah, it, like the fact that it's bimodal almost, yeah, you know. You know. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that. Yeah. And so th those are those beautiful striations I was talking about when these uh, it, pillow basalts are forming and we kind of have one pillow head being er uh, erupted out of the next um, and it's being stretched out along that fracture surface. So if you looked at this and you wanted to know which way this pillow was actually moving, it's along those direction of striations. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Turn to keep you in view a little bit, pilot. Okay. Hey, Bridge. Move complete. Copy that. I think I'm finally starting to move from the first ship move there. Okay. So um, here's a question for you that's going to sound flippant, but it's not. It's meant for you to explain. If the rim is so important, why didn't we just settle down on the rim? Oh, the, the rim is not important, but, you know, you know, we had kind of this conversation the other day in terms of, you know, the, the idea of planning a dive for biology versus geology. And, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate having you here for is giving me that perspective of and what that um, a biological a dive could look like. There's so here. much biological diversity and abundance in a small area. But geologically, one of the things Still that's really important there. is situational awareness. And so, you know, you can imagine if we're looking at the macro structure yeah, of this volcano, the, focusing uh, on, you know, a 50 meter area is really difficult to get a, if, uh, an idea of the entire setting. It's, it's almost like being given a satellite image of this ship and then being put a r in a room in the ship and being told you can't leave the room and trying to figure out what ship you're in, right? You need to get out and wander around. Um, and so seeing this entire uh, edifice from the base it's to like the very top kind of gives us an idea. You know, if we got to here and it was nothing but yeah. um, to be. rubble and we got to the top and we saw nothing but rubble, that's a good idea that it's a faulted surface. Right. The fact that we're seeing all these pillow basalts is really cool. The fact that if we get to the top and maybe we see a transition of pillows What's going on both ends, then maybe that means that there was an erupt event yeah, near that like ramp. Yeah, meters away from that contour. I could also see that if we came down onto the top and it was, you know, thickly sedimented and all we're seeing is, oh, look, it's just a flat abyssal plain. Yeah. Abyssal, in quotes, air quotes. That wouldn't have told you much either. Yeah, it doesn't uh, agree with the parasite, does it? And then, of course, you know, one of the things that's important is, is you know, getting that idea, even if we got to the top and we saw so nothing but heavily off, sedimented we 50 meters uh, to go with to no contour. exposure of pillow basalts, was it off this morning that forms a piece of the geological puzzle after we do, you know, post-cruise analyses. If we get those rocks back and we date them and we go, oh, I, hey, wait I a minute, these rocks are only... 
5,000 years old. Than me. Yesterday, no. Why is that entire area yesterday. so heavily yeah. sedimented? What does that say yeah, about the primary I, production above it? It must have been yeah. really heavy in order to sediment this area in that short amount of time. Especially when we go back to that generalization of 10 meters of calcareous sediment per million years. Um, Similar if we go to the top left and it's and that move. not very sedimented at all, which I don't okay. think it will be. It'll be sedimented to some extent. Compilot. And those rocks yeah. date to half a million years old. Then we know that we're in an area of active currents because those sediments have to be swept off here. That's uh, yeah, about 207, 208 okay. direction of the move. Well, we got some time, and there's not much in reach, so maybe I'll sit down and we'll take a look at this. Uh, we got about 25 minutes left on bottom. Okay. Copy. And how long ago did that second move complete, or has it completed yet? Second move completed at 1817, so okay. over four minutes ago. Okay. So you should have you know, two minutes left to swing. All right. Sonars look pretty clear, though. I could pop yeah. them if you wanted. Uh, yeah, I think what so. What direction were you thinking for that next one? Um, what distance? Well, let's let's do uh, let's say maybe two oh five. Void Sirius current heading. Okay. And uh, let's do a twenty meter, maybe oh. thirty meter. Is it twenty? Just started. Okay. I like that. Minute. Bridge is already now. In video? Yes, uh, I have science yeah, like wood. <laughs> Thank you. Range okay. two zero meters. So we're looking at two another zero five degrees. Pretty sure this is glass spot here. Too. Really big rim on the top of this uh, tube slash vase. It's a good copy, Bridge. And I. I guess it's still alive, you know. It's got some uh, dirty bits on there, some discolored bits. Um, you can really see the lattice work of the <laughs> silica skeleton under there. Uh, but there's enough white in there that's okay. telling me that there's still live tissue. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Beneath all the dirty yeah, bits. Yeah, it's unfortunately I can't get too slow on this. Some mucus. You know, there's all this stuff that's floating by in the water, right? Yeah. And it gets hung up on the spicules. Yeah, and kind the of mucus that's being go, produced by various organisms. There's a cool little snail. I can see its um, proboscis sticking out. Uh, not the proboscis, excuse me. The um, That's a glowing bill of health. Uh, what do I call that? Mantle tube. One. I guess Siphon. it's still alive. <laughs> can we uh, tilt back up just a little bit? Kay. There's a small snail there, right there. Sure. Thank you. We're just looking at this watch lead while we're waiting for Sirius yep, to catch up. Yep, I understand. Up. You can see there's a transparent tube extending from the top moving to the left. A little bit hard to see, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And this tells me that this is a fairly evolutionarily advanced snail. It's a predator. And that tube draws water into uh, this mantle cavity space where the gill is housed. And just before the gill, there's a sensory structure that is basically like our nose, and so it can sniff out chemicals in the water. So the predatory forms have modified that mantle cavity out into the siphon, and it's very muscular and going to move around. So it's basically, you know, sniffing its environment and deciding what direction it wants to go. That's great, pilot. Um, right. As we uh, move over the sponge, if okay. we could just try to look down on the top of it, I want to see if it's open or closed. Sure. Thank you. All right, yeah. Why the video and all Alan fly Collins over. agrees this is definitely a, an alive sponge. You can zoom in past the skids. Looks like the ship has moved 12 meters so far of the 20 meter move. And you got about 18 minutes left on bottom. 
Copy now, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yep. Whatever you need. Oh, okay. It's uh, it's open. I just meant did it have a hollow space? Oh, uh, okay. Was it closed up? So that's good. We can uh, look around here, see what else we can see. Okay. You have a little bit of room now, pilot. Okay. There's another one of the benthicodon jellies. We've seen several okay. of those today, and we even managed to collect one. Yeah, we don't need to go after that. We've got okay. really good video from earlier in the day. We have a collection. So I'd rather use the limited time left to see what else Understood. we haven't imaged yet. Okay, how long ago was it since that last move completed? It's like uh, a, it's still sort of a globe okay. sponge it's that's tumbled off of a rock moves, there. So be ready for it. Uh, 18 meters, yep. 2 meters. Looks like a geodia a sponge. So the other moves were taken two to three minutes. Uh, this total move should be about four to five. Here's another one of your pillows with a good example of the smaller Go ahead, pillow Rich. coming out of the larger pillow. Move, good Blue. eye. Thank you. We've just completed You're going to be general. recognizing pillow breakouts like I am. Like no one. I'm going to uh, be I've recognizing octocorals. This has yes, been fantastic. I've learned a lot today. And I realize I've misinterpreted a lot about how right, I view and think about these overall meter, structures, right? these yeah. pillow mounds. Yeah. E2 is teed up and ready to move. And was that point two? Yeah, decimal two. Yep. So I should be at the start of feeling that move with Sirius, I think. Thereabouts. So I'm seeing a couple of whips ahead. Maybe we can go towards those uh, once you have the tether. Uh, right of center. Oh, yep, I see him. Yeah, I think that's still a little too far away for now. No problem. In Paris, there's this really neat sort of uh, art installation of kind of like a giant sea serpent um, that comes out of a building and into the sidewalk and out of another side of a sidewalk mm -hmm. and then back into the side of the building and water runs through it periodically. There's big patches of it that um, have like, you know, sort of a plastic window. Coolest thing. I mean, I mean it's huge, yeah. you know. Uh, but it reminds me of some of these pillows, the way they're disappearing into the sediments and then coming back out in other places. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's one of the reasons, you know, some people... Um, you know, don't really like the idea or the terminology, you know, the scientific jargon that's entered a, of pillow, because when these were first kind of described, they were thought to be much more individual features and not necessarily these large, long, low bait structures that we see. Um, and so that's why, you know, I tend to use kind of pillow lobe or elongate pillow, um, because they can form these kind of individual smaller features, but only when there's a, a real a change in the bathymetry when they can erupt from a vent and then fall off some type of precipice and become detached. Now what's interesting to me is, you know, we've probably done, what, 200 meters in, in elevation change um, since we started this dive, something around there. Um, and, and I think it was a little bit more <coughs> biologically rich at the bottom. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, All right, that's better. It was steeper down there as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, maybe not right when we landed, but mm -hmm. it was steep, and I don't know how the currents are interacting yeah. with the slope down there. And clearly this slope is much more gentle. Mm -hmm. Maybe that has something to do with it. Uh, but I agree. It was almost like somewhere in the... Okay, so where are we right at the beginning, But no. first third that yeah. we saw yeah. our maximum. The booth ended at 26, so plus 6. Okay, so another two, two minutes or so yeah. until it's complete. Two minutes, yep. Until serious. Now that looks like a complete, right? Yeah. Octocoral. Yeah. Yeah, yep, that's, that's very good. It was Ooh, fish. Pr produced. Oh, you see a fish? 
Well, there's some some of your pillow toes. Yeah. We could probably get another move in if you're. Oh, there's the time. fish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what range? Of I didn't see that fish. I was gonna say that Same. is mostly another dead, 20. but actually I take it back. It's Sounds mostly good. alive. Yeah, like you can go in video. Left, can do it. This looks like it might be that grenadier mm -hmm. that uh, Ken Sulak wrote about earlier. Yeah, that so. he said he yeah, couldn't thanks. quite place. That might be our last move. And he gave uh, us a couple of ideas. Over, yeah. One was a possible uh, genus Gorifernoides. All right. That's and the other, um, I don't remember now. It's going to take too long to try to find it, but was a genus that I'd never heard of before. Try and keep them in. So, yeah, let's see if we can get good image. Oh, that's perfect focus. Beautiful. You can see all the pits on the other side of the head. Very nice. Okay. Thank you for that. Oh, he just opened his mouth there. We saw him yawn. Let's, uh, if you could, go back to the coral. I'm okay. just concerned about the amount of time left. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Huh. Six-armed sea star there on the side of that rock. The little one. Right here. Yeah. Do you want to look? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, no, not there. Not there. It's in the Ooh. distance at the top. Oh, okay. That's, uh, that's an Ophium museum. That's uh, something we know really okay. well. But, yeah, this is, uh, this is different. Nice, Brian. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Good view. So that's definitely the first one of those we've seen today, maybe on the expedition. Everybody kind of thinks of sea stars as having five legs. So that's not necessarily always the case, and the sun stars have lots of them. All right, thank you. So let's okay. get that close up on that coral, please. Uh, we'll go start in the top, I guess. The last couple. <laughs> Okay, when you're ready. Okay, let's see if this is a living bamboo coral or if it's been taken over by something else. And I can see that it is a living bamboo coral. Yeah, so uh, what's your situation? You think you can clip the top of this? Do you think you have enough time? Or is the ship uh, move already yeah. in place that you can't? I think, uh, So if, yeah, if could, that's the case, give me one one thing. If you can get a tighter zoom Kay. just before we... All right, that's perfect. You can see the sclerites there. We've got the focus. Count to five. Okay, did you copy that, Nav? Beautiful. Oh, an easy stop. And now just Copy. have a look down at the base. Bridges are every now. Okay. And I want to see there's a yeah, branch coming off. Stop. I just need to see where the node because I'm certainly not going to ask you to you. collect yeah. it down Good there. Call. Thanks, Bridge. Here you can see that brittle star has probably scraped off the yeah. tissue. Mm -hmm. And all the polyps below are kind of sad. Do we have All but one. Oh, okay. There we go. There's a node. John, there's a branch. Bring the ship back a little bit. Yep. So I can see it's at the node, but if we I can just we zoom in okay. on that branch point, let me know. See a little solitary okay. hydroid hanging down from that uh, little branch. And there you can see it's kind of a go golden ahead, in color. Mm -hmm. I'll stop. And this is kind of common for How when these uh, bamboo corals are uh, relatively young. Yeah. Just there. Good yeah. Guess. Well played. Yeah, I think we should be fine. Okay. Understood. I'll let you know otherwise. There we go. Perfect, Brian. Yeah. Nice. All right, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a good view. So uh, whatever's easiest for you to snip off the top, uh, six or seven inches. Okay. That's good for All me. Right, yeah, I think I want to get So a we've been seeing this really so frequently today, um, ever since we got down on yep, the bottom. Got plenty of tether. It's uh, kind okay. of a sparse brancher. I can do five meters And back. so I this is going to be a collection yeah, that allows like us to, to sure. say exactly what is this thing. That's but surviving here greater than 3,000 meters. But yep. those are lower branches that have died off. Bridges are yep. now. Yep. Yep. Um, like the one coming place, towards, the two coming towards us still have polyps, yeah, but the two going over there look like they've been entirely degrees. stripped. Speed decimal two. And that could be for a host of reasons. Um, 
There are several asteroid sea stars that mm -hmm. will feed on this. There are apocophron mollusks that will feed on it. Those are the only two things that I have seen at this depth that I know for certain could do that. Mm -hmm. um, if we were on like that shallower uh, dive yesterday, the, the Oreo fish apparently nips at some of these polyps. I've never actually seen them nipping at a, at a bamboo coral, mm -hmm. but um, it is possible. Yeah, five but the reason we yeah. want to see the branch is because you see how long that is. It's unreasonable to take a clipping yeah. and try to stuff it all in the box. Um, but we can take a small piece, all right, know that the, it's a nodal uh, branch. Or, uh, we've got really good craft, imagery. Um, yeah, and so we'll have enough for morphology. We'll have enough for genetics. We'll use the imagery to say how it's branching. Uh, that's all really good. Hydraulics ramped up Now, this might be a naive okay. question, but if, if it was by for bio boxes. nutrient okay. deprived, would you expect it to die off as single branches or like would it shed branches or would it just kind of slowly spot die throughout the organism? That is such a good question. Uh, I have no data for that Very from stable. deep sea coral. Mm. Um, I wonder if somebody has done that with uh, shallow with water coral. Here, I, I don't actually know. I probably should know. <laughs> but uh, I don't. That's um, okay. I don't hold it against you. Thank you. Yeah. It's much oh. appreciated. So one thing I know is there are other species. No. Mm -hmm. Metallogorgia is one that we saw yesterday that definitely shed branches. Mm -hmm. However, the top video. they always shed the branches. And I think okay. it's independent of the nutritional state. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's, it's interesting to ask, well, why are you doing that? Yeah. You know, why, is it a response? why don't you have yeah. more polyps that yeah. all of them are feeding? You have yeah. more opportunity. I'll stop by, thanks. Uh, but that's the way they grow. Is that... A that looks pretty stable. good. Yeah. And that will clip really easily. There we go. And we have, uh, do we have a port open? There should be one port open at least, right? Come on. And I think we can get the drawers out. Yep, stand by. Port. What side are you going to go for? Uh, I think we're a little bit too, too close. Mm, yeah, we might be on the toe on the rock there. All right, I'm gonna back up. Roger that. Holding steady. I'm gonna go ahead and get the box prepped. Yeah, port inner is vacant, according to my sheet. Finally have a box that's not the uh, starboard router. Yeah. <laughs> have you guys been end of the shift up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Andy keeps getting stuck with that one. He's stuck with the, the armpit box. All yeah. right, you can... Uh, Drawer draw yeah. coming out. Watch these after the sample. Uh, that will conclude the dive. That's full out, pilot. Okay. Would you pull the mini Zeus we'll a little do. bit closer? Absolutely. So, just to confirm, the port inner is open. Is that true? Port yeah. inner is open. Port Correct. Inner. Okay. There it goes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we've here. seen so much of that today. This is so deep that it's unusual to find bamboo corals, A, uh, branched this deep and in this abundance. So that was a really valuable collection. So I thank both the pilots and my geology co-lead. No thanking me necessary. Oh, yeah. Nice job. Thank you. Looks good. Nice job. Got 30 seconds left, so that's probably time to start packing up the lights and uh, saying goodbye to the bottom of the ocean. GPU off. I heard there's some really cool features about a kilometer away. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> that's a good one. Got a healthy delta right now. Okay. 20 meters. Okay, watch All leads. Right. This yeah, I'd say when you're ready. our dive for the day. I'll We're going to base you and come up. Get into token uh, Come no, on. No, please stop. Copy that, yeah. Thank you. Oh, so Thank you very much, you guys. That. Stand by. And, uh, Pilot, just uh, for awareness, yeah. um, we are not taking a Niskan here on the bottom. We've used four, um, but we will take one at the deep scattering layer, and we'll get back to you on where that'll be, but it won't be up till about 500 meters.
Copy that, watch Lee. Thank you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, on shore, this ends the um, bottom part of the dive today. If you enjoy the water column, there's going to be a good uh, hour Lights and 50 minutes or so climbing through the copy. Uh, three right, point one five like kilometers of water that we're under right now. To starboard, uh, all the way around. It's been a pretty interesting dive. You want to oh. briefly summarize? Look at that big, giant, beautiful pillow. Yeah, you right. already knew that was going to come. Some yeah. So, so uh, we yeah. are yeah. on the Kirchhoff fracture zone uh, on the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and this is a fracture zone that segments the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and it it moves it about twenty kilometers eastward. If you were looking from the north. Um, and so we started our dive at about uh, 33, 40 meters below sea level, and we've come up about 200 meters, starting at the base of this deep pillow volcano and then transiting upwards. We came up to the top of a small little hill within the first 40 meters of elevation, and then we, uh, as we were coming up, we started to see some basaltic talus that had fallen from down slope, lots of calcareous sediment, and then as we came up that slope, okay. we started to see lots of these more fresh and right, in-place pillow basalts. And along the way, a, quite a diversity of biological and, uh, Why don't you go ahead and just line up with yeah, the Yeah, I, I was actually surprised by how many we there. saw. Yeah, that's right. And Copy more that. than that, the size of them. Um, what we talked about, what was the expectations for the dive when we were getting to the bottom? I said, well, we're certainly going to see a lower abundance because we're farther from the source of the food, which is the upper water. And usually, organisms at this depth tend to be quite small, again, because they're food limited. So seeing all these large branching bamboo corals and whip and sponges was uh, nice frankly a bit of a surprise yeah. to me. A lot of them were not in great condition. Uh, they seemed to be a lot of uh, exposed dead skeleton, yeah. but some parts of the skeleton hanging on. Although there were lots of fouling organisms living Looking on down. them. Um, hydroids. Uh, we didn't see any zoanthids, but especially lots of hydroids. Right. Uh, we saw a number of brittle stars Still and so on. So, uh, every dive is a surprise. Every dive gives us another piece of the puzzle. We'll try to and put it all together. Did we see those carnivorous sponges anywhere else? We saw we saw at least four, maybe five of them during the day. Right, if right, you mean, have we seen them anywhere else oh, during yeah, the expedition? Right yeah, okay. on previous dives right. in this expedition. So we saw two a little bit yesterday more. that we actually collected, yep. but that were maybe five to six yeah. centimeters in length. Oh, okay. Never seen anything. Like that. that yeah. Well, I shouldn't say never yeah, seen anything. I've never out. seen the best of pluma, these yeah. stick like ones. Bridges every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just letting you know we're off bottom. Like uh, uh, so thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks to all down. the scientists on shore okay. who provided us like. information. And well, the uh, right above me. for can, uh, those of you who will be land. participating in our dive planning call for tomorrow, uh, we need just a couple of minutes to get set up in here, get the mapping lead in, get our expedition coordinator involved, and for um, Ashton and I to take a bio break. See you soon. I've got a tight view on you as well. Okay. A bio break for Scott, a geo break for Ashton. Hey. hey. This is Chris Ma. If you want to come up at all. Yeah, let's go up. Coming up. Hello? Hey, Chris, how's it going? Tether. Looks okay. good right now. Good. Um, I just saw that six raid sea star that you guys passed, or just uh, canned up from? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, we're so off the bottom, but by all means, tell us about it. Oh, you're, you're done already? Uh, yeah, oh, we're in the water lying. column, but that's okay. <laughs> we can use the audio, so go for okay. it. Okay. Ah, so it's too all late right, to collect. let's keep doing that. Yeah. Let's get it 30 meters away. Copy that. Yeah, unfortunately, we just finished our dive two minutes ago. Yeah, that was kind of the last hurrah. <laughs> go! Okay, well, um... It's uh, pedicelastrid. They're um, probably in the genus Hydrasteria. Um, right. Those are uh, this, not very common. I mean, I they're known front. from collections, yeah. but um, back on I mean, I think it. There's one of two possibilities as to which one it might be, but um, having one for DNA would be great. But uh, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've. They come up occasionally. They're not that rare, but it would have been nice to have collected one. Do they always have those six arms? It being new or what? Do they always have six arms? Yes, that particular species.